Dedication, Preface, and Introduction of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls, or the War on the White Slave Trade, a complete and detailed account of the shameless traffic in young girls, the methods by which the procurers and panders lure innocent young girls away from home and sell them to keepers of dives, the magnitude of the organization and its workings, how to combat this hideous monster, how to save your girl, how to save your boy, what you can do to help wipe out this curse of humanity, a book designed to awaken the sleeping and protect the innocent, by Ernest A. Bell. For God's sake, do something. General Booth. Dedicated to the army of loyal workers who, in the name of God and humanity, have enlisted in this holy war for the safety and purity of womanhood. Preface. That glory may dwell in our land is the motive of the writers of this book. With a true patriotism that rejoices not in the iniquities we expose, that blushes crimson with humiliation over the crimes we record, that glows hot with indignation against the criminals we denounce. We have pursued the painful necessary task of telling the truth to the American people concerning evils that have made us real with horror. For the protection of the innocent, for the safeguarding of the weak, for the warning of the tempted and the alarm of the wicked, the truth must be told, the truth that makes us free. Therefore we have used plain words, not coarse or vulgar, but chaste and true. Lawyers of the highest standing have introduced the legal language with which the statutes provide penalties for crimes against the honor and safety of women and girls. Physicians who are professors in medical colleges among the foremost in the world, men in reputation for their skill and beloved for their devotion to the people's welfare, have told here in medical terminology the intolerable consequences to guilty and innocent of the odious business of making commerce of girls and promoting the debauchery of young men. We are sure the time has come when millions will thank these lawyers and physicians for breaking the seal of secrecy and giving the people their birthright, the truth. It is told that after Dante had written his Inferno, the women of Florence would turn pale and whisper to each other as he passed, There goes the man who has been in hell. Some of us have gone to the abyss and have seen things which are not lawful for a man to utter. Such as could fitly be told and must be told, we have been telling for years past, knowing that the truth must prevail. Stronger than the dark the light, stronger than the wrong the right. To our great joy, the magazine having the largest circulation in the world, Woman's World, with more than two million subscribers, took up the appeal for the safety of American and alien women and girls in September of last year. This magazine has already printed, or caused to be printed and circulated fully, 50 million pages, and it is enlisted for the war, war on the most shameful crime of debauchery and exploiting the youth of both sexes. This is a critical time for our nation. We must now decide whether to stamp out the white slave traffic and its attendant vices, or to go the broad way that has led both ancient and modern nations to destruction. Today we fashion destiny, our web of fate we spin. Today for all hereafter, choose we holiness or sin. Today from lofty Jerusalem or Ebal's cloudy crown, we call the dews of blessing or the bolts of cursing down. Concerning the effect of vice upon the destiny of nations, the Encyclopedia Britannica, volume 32, page 32, says truly, quote, Though it may coexist with national vigor, its extravagant development is one of the signs of a rotten and decaying civilization, a phase which has always marked the decadence of great nations, unquote. But though we thus speak, we are confident that this is truly the land of the free, free, glad, safe womanhood, and the home of the brave, men brave enough to protect our girls and to deal with the white slave traders and all their sort as they deserve. 
Introduction by Edwin W. Sims, United States District Attorney, Chicago. I am firmly convinced that when the people of this nation understand and fully appreciate the unmistakable villainy of the white slave traffic, they will rise in their might and put a stop to it. The growth of this trade in white women, as it has been officially designated by the Paris Conference, was so insidious that it reached the proportions of an international problem almost before the people of the civilized nations of the world learned of its existence. The traffic increased rapidly, owing largely to the fact that it was tremendously profitable to those depraved mortals who indulged in it, and because the people generally, until very recently, were ignorant of the fact that it was becoming so extensive. And even at this time, when a great deal has been said by the pulpit and the press about the horrors of the traffic, the public idea of just what is meant by the white slave traffic is confused and indefinite. It is my hope and belief that this work, edited by the scholarly and devoted Ernest A. Bell, whose life of toil for the wayward and the fallen has endeared him to all who know of him and his work, will do much to make the nature, scope, and perils of this infamous trade better understood. The characteristic which distinguishes the white slave traffic from immorality in general is that the women who are the victims of the traffic are forced unwillingly to live an immoral life. The term white slave includes only those women and girls who are actually slaves, those women who are owned and held as property in chattels, whose lives are lives of involuntary servitude. The white slave trade may be said to be the business of securing white women and of selling them or exploiting them for immoral purposes. It includes those women and girls who, if given a fair chance, would in all probability have been good wives and mothers and useful citizens. Only a little time ago there were many thousands of our best citizens who were unable to bring themselves to believe that an international traffic in white women really existed. The statement seemed too sensational for their acceptance. If any readers remain who are still unconvinced that such an international traffic is a fact, let them consider the following, quoted from the annual report for 1908 of Honorable Oscar S. Strauss, the Secretary of Commerce and Labor. Quote, An international project of arrangement for the suppression of the white slave traffic was on July 25, 1902, adopted for submission to the respective governments by the delegates of the various powers represented at the Paris Conference, which arrangement was confirmed by formal agreement signed at Paris May 18, 1904, by the governments of Germany, Belgium, Denmark, Spain, France, Great Britain, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Russia, Sweden, Norway, and the Swiss Federal Council. This arrangement, after submission to the Senate, was proclaimed by President Roosevelt June 15, 1908, and is printed in full in the report of the Commissioner General of Immigration. The purpose of the arrangement is set forth in the preamble, which states that the several governments, being desirous to assure to women who have attained their majority and are subjected to deception or constraint, as well as minor women and girls, an efficacious protection against the criminal traffic known under the name of trade in white women, traite de blanche, have resolved to conclude an arrangement with a view to concert proper measures to attain this purpose. It is, of course, inconceivable that the distinguished representatives of these great governments would have entertained for consideration any subject not of vital and international importance. There is still another point upon which I feel moved to place all possible emphasis, the hideous depravity and the fiendish cunning of the criminals who engage in this most abhorrent and revolting of all criminal pursuits. Kipling said in one of his poems, describing the doings of lawless people in the camps of one of the northern countries, that there is never a law of God or man runs north of 49. That and more, too, might be said of the districts where the white slaver grows rich from his traffic in girls. The men and women who engage in this traffic are more unspeakably low and vile than any other class of criminals. The burglar and hold-up man are high-minded gentlemen by comparison. There is no more depraved class of people in the world than those human vultures who fatten on the shame of innocent young girls. 
Many of these white slave traders are recruited from the scum of the criminal classes of Europe. And in this lies the revolting side of the situation. On the one hand, the victims, pure, innocent, unsuspecting, trusting young girls, not a few of them mere children. On the other hand, the white slave trader, low, vile, depraved, and cunning, organically a criminal. In the prosecutions which I have officially conducted against this class of criminals, the fact has developed that when caught, they generally are willing to arrange to pay heavy fines. These offers have, of course, been refused, and we have taken the position that we will in no case accept merely a fine. In all these cases already tried, we have asked the court to impose jail sentences, and we expect to continue that policy. Men and women who make a living and fatten off the shame, the disgrace, and the ruin of the innocent young girls are a menace to the community to whom no quarter should be given. The rule in my office with reference to this class of cases is to show no quarter, to extend no consideration of any kind. We are requiring heavy bail and asking for imprisonment in the penitentiary in case of conviction. And I may add that no criminal convictions secured as the result of my efforts have yielded me a personal satisfaction to be compared with that afforded by the conviction of those engaged in the white slave trade. One word more. I hope soon to see the time when the laws of the land will as carefully protect the daughters of the United States from the destroying hand of the white slave trader as the international treaty agreements now protect the girl who is brought in from foreign shores. Respectfully, Edwin W. Sims. End of Introduction Chapter 1 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Cleo Milla Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls, or War on the White Slave Trade, by Ernest A. Bell Chapter 1 History of the White Slave Trade By the white slave trade is meant commerce in white women and girls for wicked purposes. Most of its history cannot be written for two reasons. That these crimes are kept secret as far as possible and that they are so revolting that their details cannot be published and ought not to be read anywhere outside of the bottomless pit. Crimes against womanhood are as old as sin. From the day that the serpent beguiled Eve by his craftiness until now, there have been few days or nights when some daughter of Eve has not been deceived or forced into an evil life by some serpent or other. Babylon In ancient Babylon the dishonoring of girlhood was a part of the temple service, as it is to this day in many temples of India. In the opinion of the German historical scholar Dr. Grau, the temples of India probably derived the hideous custom from Babylon, which the Book of Revelation calls the mother of the harlots and of the abominations of the earth. No wonder that Babylon was denounced by prophets and apostles or that her crimes of slavery, cruelty, dishonesty, and debauchery brought perpetual ruin upon the wicked city and nation. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. Up the valley of the Euphrates from Babylon, and westward among the Canaanites and Phoenicians, the horrible alliance of religion and last extended, until it reached Asia Minor and Greece. Greece. At Corinth, a great commercial city and seaport, business shrewdness was linked with sensuality and profanation, and the great temple of Venus was built, where one thousand priestesses were required to lead the life of religious infamy to make money for the despicable masters. There were constant importations of new girls from Lesbos, 
and the other Grecian isles. Then, as now the devices of the white slave trader were assiduously employed to keep up and increase the number of profitable European and Asiatic girls. It is pastime as well as business to these traffickers to drug, to make drunken, to deceive, to ensnare, or to debauch by force the innocent, the confiding, the thoughtless, the weak. Whether for the ancient temple of Venus at Corinth, or for the dance of shame in the white slave market of Chicago or Paris, beautiful victims who will earn much money for their masters and captors must be hunted and trapped. At Athens, the lawgiver Solon established houses of shame by statute and filled them with slave girls for whom there was no possible escape. But whoever, man or woman, caused the freeborn Athenian girl to enter one of the houses incurred the penalty of death. It might be well if freeborn American girls were as thoroughly protected. An Athenian forfeited his citizenship on opening a house of shame. American citizenship in our large cities allows the white slave traders an astounding amount of political influence. Rome. In Rome, immoral women were enrolled by the police in a public register, and this public record of their evil life always remained to bar their way to repentance and respectability. Modern European cities on the continent follow this hurtful custom, and it has been introduced without authority of law in some American cities. Many bakers, barbers, and keepers of taverns, baths and drugstores were also traders in women. These depraved traffickers were regarded with the greatest loathing by the Roman people. The white slave traders of ancient Rome probably differed little from the Italian traders to be found in so many parts of the world today, notably New York and Chicago. The poet Milton tells how his love of purity kept him in his youth from the evils practiced at Bordellos, presumably an Italian resort in London. Persons desiring to know the traders boasting over a young and a beautiful girl who had come into his devilish power will find it described in the old English play, commonly attributed to Shakespeare, called Pericles, Prince of Tyre. An exceedingly bad example was set by some of the Roman emperors. Augustus, even in his old age, sent out men to bring him women and girls. The beautiful Malonia stabbed herself rather than yield to the emperor Tiberius. The emperor Marcus Aurelius Antoninus who was very virtuous and religious and wise, according to Roman ideals, persecuted Christians to the extent of legally condemning Christian girls to the houses of infamy. Young women were seized and required to sacrifice to idols. Upon refusing, they were dragged through the streets and given to a white slaver. Some beautiful legends have been preserved which tell of miraculous deliverance of Christian girls from this most satanic cruelty. St. Agnes, the story runs, was seized and stripped, but immediately her hair grew quickly and covered her like a garment. Dragged to a den of shame, she appeared transfigured, a wonderful light shining from her body, and no one dared to harm her. At length, one bold ruffian came near her, but was struck dead at her feet by a thunderbolt. The emperor Diocletian renewed these terrible persecutions. The church's only retaliation was the rescue of depraved women. Mary, an Egyptian, was a conspicuous penitent who sailed for Jerusalem 
and spent her remaining years virtuously in the Holy Land. The Christian Emperor Theodosius II, who died in the year 450, laid heavy penalties on traffickers in women. Justinian, who came to the throne in 527, punished procurers with death. He was merciful toward erring women, but was unsparing toward every one who exploited them for gain. France The Latin writers conspicuously Tacitus represent the Germans, Franks, and Gauls as very virtuous and very severe in their punishment of offenders. The earliest known legislation in the northern kingdoms is in the Capitularies of Charlemagne, who was crowned Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire by the Pope in St. Peter's at Rome on Christmas Day in the year 800. Early in his reign in his northern dominions, Charlemagne enacted that all who kept houses of shame or lent their aid to vice were to be scourged. He would spare neither bad women nor vile men. But succeeding kings of France, very many of them, were themselves models not of virtue and kingliness, but of dishonor and debauch. Many of the clergy also were very immoral, and the whole nation became corrupt. Louis the Ninth made the first earnest effort to check the evil. He issued an extreme edict in 1254 that all immoral women and all keepers and procurers should be at once exiled from France. After a reaction, Louis renewed his efforts to exculpate the iniquity and his son Philip continued to inflict severe penalties. During the 13th and 14th centuries, several notorious procurers were burned alive at Paris. In the 16th century, in cities of the south of France, sometimes a woman of this detestable class was thrust into an iron cage and thrown into the river. When almost dead from drawing, she was drawn out, and after a little, the punishment was repeated. Many of the women who were burned as witches were really condemned because they were procuresses or otherwise idiotically immoral. The rise of chivalry greatly increased the safety of good women and diminished immorality among men. A higher moral tone was imparted to society everywhere. Faithful preachers cried out against the traffic in shame, the snaring of young girls in the immodesty and immorality which were found in convents and even in churches. In the reign of Louis XI, about 1475, Father Maillard, a bold preacher of the time, excoriated the whole company of traffickers and girls, especially procuresses and citizens who let their property for houses of shame. The procuresses, he said, ought to be burned at the stake, and for women who corrupted the clergy, he had no mercy but invoked the wrath of God upon them. Louis XI was himself extremely immoral, like so many of the kings of France. Catherine de Mendices, who became Queen of France when her husband Henry II ascended the throne in 1547, exercised a baneful influence during the three reigns. Her court of two hundred ladies introduced from Italy worse vices than had before been known in France. She did, however, try to diminish prostitution in Paris. An ordinance of 1635 condemned all men engaged in what we now call the white slave trade to the galleys for life. Louis XV, at fifteen years of age, married Maria, daughter of Stanislas, the dethroned king of Poland. The whole life of Louis was one of the idle sensuality. 
When he was old, he established a seraglio of fifteen-year-old girls, the most beautiful that could be bought or kidnapped. On this hiring, he spent a hundred million francs, or twenty million dollars. It was he who, when warned of the impending ruin of his nation, said, After me, the deluge. He died, detested by all, in 1774. Paris, the modern Babylon. Paris, the capital of sad kings and the scene of sad debauchery, became the source and headquarters of the worldwide white slave trade of the present time. With the spread of legitimate commerce to every part of the world, the long experienced traders in women sought a worldwide market for girls. There is not a civilized country which has not been exploited by the traders alike as a hunted ground for victims and as a market in which to sell them. All Europe, North America, Panama, South America, Egypt, and other parts of Africa, India, China, and Japan are the fields of operation of these atrocious men and serpentine women. By no means all the traffickers are friends. Many are Jews, many are Italians and Sicilians, some are Austrians, Germans, English, Americans, Greeks. But it is Paris that has made vice a fine art, and has made the white slave trade a widespread, systematized commercial enterprise. It is as true as it is lamentable that the beautiful city of the banks of the Seine, the center of fashion and art, gained the shameful reputation of being the capital of the white slave trade, and deserved it by merit raised to that bad eminence. In recent years, the French government and people have felt keenly the reproach of this condition and have been foremost in efforts to suppress the abominable commerce. White Slavers in India In 1893, during my missionary service in India, a clique of white slave traders was discovered in Calcutta. They were found to be trafficking not only in European girls whom they could lure to India, but also in little native girls as young as nine years. There was great indignation in the capital and throughout India when these criminals were exposed and arrested. The laws of India were at that time inadequate to punish them, but an old statute was found under which the Viceroy could report undesirable aliens. So these wretches, too abominable to be endured in Withendom, were shipped back to Europe. Those were the first white slave traders of whom I, a young missionary, had ever heard. Last year in Chicago, a French trader told me that he had been in India and I could not but wonder whether he had been deported from Calcutta or Bombay and made welcome in Chicago. The United States government soon afterward put him out of his wicked business. Reverend Dr. Homer C. Stanz, formerly of Calcutta, now of New York, told me of a frightened European girl who nervously rang his doorbell in Calcutta late at night. She had been deceived into going to India by false promises made to her by the hunters of girls. Learning their real purpose just in time, she fled from them, and inquiring the way to a missionary, she was directed to Dr. and Mrs. Tanz, with whom she was safe and thankful a million times. How many hundreds of innocent American and European girls have been led away to Withan and Mohammedan lands on false promises of good positions as teachers, governesses, or even as missionaries, only the open books of the Day of Judgment will disclose. 
End of chapter 1. Chapter 2 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 2 The Suppression of the White Slave Traffic by William Alexander Coote. Let me first of all greet you as co-workers in a cause which is very dear to the heart of God and which is really Christianity in practice. How literally true it is that in this special form of social and humanitarian work we are seeking to save that which is lost. If this work is to be successfully done, if we are to find that which has been lost, then we must have a wholehearted devotion to the search and a close and intimate cooperation amongst the searchers. We may belong to different political and social camps. We may even be as far apart as the Poles in our religious sympathies and convictions. But within sound of the divine call to this labor, in the presence of so gigantic an evil, we must unite. We dare not act as isolated units, however enthusiastic or clever we may be. We must close up our ranks and not only join hands, but also hearts, and in the strength of God, with a strong inspiration from the Holy One, go forth to meet this Apollyon of evil, and in the name of humanity, and better still, in the name of God, give battle until the foe is vanquished, yea, eternally routed, the honor of womanhood vindicated, and the chains of lust loosened from the minds and hearts of humanity." Whatever the results, be it ours to remember that in this conflict we are waging a holy crusade against the vice of men who would, in their own selfish, vicious interest, besmirch the purity of the womanhood of the world. Let us also remember that in this war, if needs be, we must not shrink from the use of those carnal weapons by means of which men are brought to judgment in this world and made to pay some penalty for the deeds which have wrought so much evil in the lives of young women. But never let us forget that such weapons, however necessary, are not the weapons. If the victory is to be effective and final, then the weapons of this warfare must be obtained from the armory of God, with the use of which weapons there is also promise that if the battle is waged in his name and for his sake, victory, triumphant, eternal, glorious victory is assured. What is this white slave traffic with the condemnation of which the world is today ringing? Is it some new form of vice with the introduction of which the world is staggered, or is it the old and modern dress? No, it is neither. It is simply the old vice in the old form doing the same old terrible work of enslavement of pure young womanhood for the gratification of the debased and degraded passions of men. Lust knows no mercy, yea, it finds some degree of satisfaction in the cruelty inflicted on the victims of its unholy greed. This traffic in the virtue of woman is now well known. Its methods are the same, but its results with a growing civilization are more painful and destructive to its victims. It has no geographical boundaries, but in every clime, this hideous monster of vice seeks its victims with a relentless and inhuman ferocity. As one surveys the results of this evil in every land, one is led to cry, How long, O Lord, how long before men's inhumanity to women shall cease and the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Father? Permit me, as a matter of historical interest, to call your attention to the simple origin of this new crusade for the suppression of the white slave traffic, which had its birth, under circumstances of great interest to all workers, in the year 1898. As the Secretary of the National Vigilance Association, it had for years been my duty to search for missing young women, sometimes at home and sometimes abroad. In my journeys abroad, 
prior to 1898, I had in some instances found the missing girl under circumstances of a most painful character. It was the old story, the promise of a good situation or the promise of a suitable marriage were the means invariably used to entrap and ensnare them. Once in the hands of the traffickers, they were hurried away from country to country until the highest bidders obtained the virtue, honor, and the life of the victims of these inhuman traffickers. In my various journeys, these ghastly facts were over and over again brought to my knowledge. Their truth I was unfortunately frequently able to verify, so that from personal observation and knowledge, I knew this state of things to exist, yea, to be ever on the increase. I knew that just as the honest merchant deals with his merchandise in the course of trade, sending certain goods to certain markets of the world, so this hideous trade was under the control of a syndicate of men and women who bought and sold the virtue of women, in the same manner as the merchant sells his wares to the highest bidder. Here was indeed a revelation, so far as I personally was concerned. For a long time I had known of the existence of this traffic, but I had no idea of its widespread character. I had not dreamt of the scientific and businesslike manner in which it was conducted. Here indeed was the explanation of the disappearance of hundreds, yea, thousands of girls so often reported as missing from their homes, and for whose return mothers waited year after year in vain. The revelation enveloped me as a dark cloud. In vain I tried to disperse it. Surely there was some way of combating this gigantic evil. Here indeed was the Philistine giant of evil. The people were indifferent. The laws were impotent. There was no public opinion on the subject. True, some of my journeys to different countries had resulted in the homecoming of some who had been falsely beguiled into the way of evil, but this was as nothing compared to that which appeared to be impregnable to the forces of righteousness. The darkness of the picture obsessed me. It clung with an octopus-like grip to my soul. I truly found trouble and sorrow, intensified by the consciousness of perfect helplessness to grapple with such a vast area of evil. It was worldwide, and whatever the remedy, it would have to be universal in its application. This experience seemed to bring me to the very porch of hell. Could nothing be done to cope with this state of things? Could earth, with all its multifarious efforts of prevention and rescue, find no solution of this fearful problem? Would no one be found able to fence the top of this tarpian rock, over the precipice of which the virtue of womanhood was being constantly flung? Was this feature of lust never to be quenched, or must it forever be fed with the priceless gem in the crown of true womanhood? Was there no means of stopping the unholy demand, as that alone would cause the supply to cease? These were some of the questions which came again and again to my mind as I pondered this mighty question. As I thus mused, a sweet and holy vision came to me. I was not asleep, neither was I fully awake so far as this world was concerned. The heart and soul were in the throes of a new birth. I know not whether it was a vision, a dream, or a divine message. I heard no voice, I saw no form, but clear, emphatic, and distinct came the solution of the problem. It was as follows. Quote, if I could go to every capital of Europe, if I could interest the leading people and government of each country, if I could induce the courts of Europe to take up this matter, if I could then induce the governments to meet in conference and decide to deal with it from an international point of view, surely the evil would not only be checked, but to a large extent would be eradicated. End quote. How, without any qualifications, I tramped through Europe, went to Egypt, America, and South Africa, is a story which is told in detail elsewhere. But suffice it to say that every little point of the dream or vision was carried out, with the result that today there are established in every capital of Europe, in North and South America, in Egypt, and in South Africa, 
large and influential national committees cooperating with their respective governments with the object of completely removing this hideous crime from the face of the earth. In our propaganda in Europe, it was not only necessary to point out the nature of the disease we were attacking, but also the remedy we proposed. Having carefully studied the methods of the members of these syndicates of evil, we knew exactly the kind of organization needed to counteract their wicked designs. Part of the program submitted to the people of Europe was the necessity of inducing their respective governments to hold an official conference to mutually decide upon certain measures for the better protection of young women traveling or accepting situations in any part of the world. This official conference was organized chiefly through the National Vigilance Association, and the European powers and others were officially invited by the government of France to take part. In July 1902, in response to an invitation from the French government, 16 countries were represented by 36 delegates who met at the Foreign Office in Paris to consider what measures would be adopted to effectually break up these syndicates of evil. After five days' deliberation, the outcome of their labors was the drafting of an international agreement, which, in our opinion, if adopted by all civilized countries, would so fully protect young women that the moral risks attendant upon their traveling in any part of the world, either for business or recreative purposes, would be greatly reduced, if not altogether done away with. The soil being already prepared, the decisions arrived at by the official conference found ready acceptance by the national committees of Europe. The subsequent working of this agreement has fully demonstrated its value and effectiveness in the suppression of the white slave traffic. I purpose referring to three of the clauses in the agreement, which I feel is a woman's charter of moral liberty, and as it has been accepted by all the countries of Europe and by North and South America, the moral interests of young women ought to be fully protected from the Machiavellian efforts of the white slave traders. Article 2 of the International Agreement is as follows, quote, each of the governments undertakes to have a watch kept, especially at railway stations, ports of embarkation, and en route for persons in charge of women and girls destined for an immoral life. With this object, instructions shall be given to the officials and other qualified persons to obtain, within legal limits, all information likely to lead to the detection of criminal traffic. The arrival of persons who clearly appear to be the principals, accomplices in, or victims of such traffic shall be notified when it occurs, either to the authorities of the place of destination, or to the diplomatic or consular agents interested, or to any other competent authorities. End quote. We had, by our investigations, discovered that the chief places of danger were the ports of embarkation or debarkation and the railway stations of the various countries. Here it was that the strange young woman would be spoken to in her own language by apparently a sympathetic lady who would offer her every assistance, even to providing her with a lodging, which the new arrival in a strange country would be only too ready to accept. We knew this. We had become familiar with the fact that the railway stations at home and abroad were the hunting grounds of men and women engaged in the white slave traffic. It was on these facts and this evidence that Article 2 was agreed upon by the delegates at the official conference. We are all familiar with the fact that all laws, however good, are comparatively useless unless they are breathed into by the national life of the country where they exist. Their use is in proportion to the energizing power of the people interested in their administration. This article, too, was formulated in response to the desire of the people, and when it was granted, was welcomed by them with warmth and enthusiasm which augured well for its future successful administration. We are glad to be able to assert that the high hopes to which it gave birth amongst the people of Europe have been more than realized. Immediately on the ratification of the agreement, the National Vigilance Association, by deputation, 
pointed out to the British government that the duties involved in carrying out this article were hardly such as could be entrusted to policemen, not even to men, who if they were placed at the ports or railway stations of the United Kingdom would not be likely to win the confidence of foreign young women coming to England. This apart altogether from the fact that the persons stationed at the ports and railway stations would require to know several languages, as well as to be possessed of much common sense and discretion. To undertake this work, this association offered to engage a large number of lady workers, possessing a knowledge of European languages, if the government would authorize them to do so. This was agreed to, and the National Vigilance Association commenced a work which they carried on for the last five years, during which time their workers have met at the railway stations in London and at several of the most important English ports, 16,000 young women, 80% of whom have been of foreign nationality and quite 40% of whom would have been in moral peril had it not been for the assistance rendered by the workers on their arrival in England. Thus, Article 2 has done much more than establish a clear and definite method of protection for young travelers. It has roused the heart of Europe and drawn the attention of the people to the need of being in attendance at the railway stations to assist young women and to protect them from the men and women who frequent those places for the purpose of decoying them from the path of virtue. The society Les Amis de la Jeune Fille in its early days, realized the danger to young girls traveling, and thus early commenced to safeguard them against it. Much was done, but nothing commensurate with the great need that existed. When the governments agreed to Article Two of the Protocol, every national committee in Europe felt such a sense of their responsibility that many of them, as we in England, placed workers at the railway stations of their respective countries. But perhaps the most remarkable development in connection with Article Two was the spontaneous and marvelous manner in which the Roman Catholic Church aroused itself and provided a number of ladies as station workers throughout Europe to look after and care for the moral welfare of Catholic girls. The Baroness de Montenach, residing at Freiburg, Switzerland, who had attended the first Congress for the Suppression of the White Slave Traffic held in London in 1899, saw the opportunity which Article II offered and at once appealed to the women of the Catholic Church, who responded with so much enthusiasm that today they have one of the finest and most carefully planned international Catholic associations for railway station work. We know it from personal observation and can speak in the most unqualified manner of the devotion of the Catholic ladies throughout Europe who give their time and money for the protection primarily of Catholic girls, though they are always ready to assist girls of other creeds. Thus, by means of Article II of the International Agreement, we now have Europe covered with a network of agencies which protect young girls from moral trouble in a most efficient and striking manner. The organization we have in Europe is threefold and so complete that so far as Europe is concerned, it is well nigh impossible for a young girl to fall into moral trouble if she will but avail herself of the help which is ready at all times and in all places. We have three active and efficient organizations at work, Les Amis de la Jeune Fille primarily, but not exclusively for the care of Protestant girls, the International Catholic Association for befriending young girls primarily but not exclusively for the protection of Catholic girls, and the ladies connected with the National Committees for the Suppression of the White Slave Traffic who work at the railway stations on behalf of girls of all creeds and all nationalities. The more we understand the practical side of the railway station work, the more strongly are we convinced that in it we have the work which, properly organized, enthusiastically and efficiently carried on, will relieve society of the need of much of the philanthropic effort which comes into operation when moral trouble has overtaken the unfortunate young girl. I have left myself very little room to do more than simply quote 
two of the other articles of that remarkable international agreement to which I have referred. Article 3 says, quote, The governments undertake, when the case arises, and within legal limits to have the declarations taken of women or girls of foreign nationality who are prostitutes, in order to establish their identity and civil status, and to discover who has caused them to leave their country. The information obtained shall be communicated to the authorities of the country of origin of the said women or girls, with a view to their eventual repatriation. The governments undertake, within legal limits, and as far as can be done, to entrust temporarily, and with a view to their eventual repatriation, the victims of a criminal traffic when destitute to public or private charitable institutions, or to private individuals offering the necessary security, end quote. This clause, when properly worked by the various philanthropic agencies in connection with the authorities, will be the means not only of rescuing many who have been flung into the way of shadows, but of bringing to justice the men and women responsible for their moral ruin. I have only to point to a recent act in America, passed by Congress more than 12 months since, based upon this very article to show how great will be its preventive character if put into operation by any country. The American Act, to which I refer, states that any young girl of foreign origin who is found to be leading a life of prostitution within three years of her landing in America shall be arrested, and if she has been induced to lead the life by another person, he or she, on proof, shall be liable to arrest, and on conviction, to very severe penalties, in the shape of imprisonment and fine, and if of foreign origin, to deportation. We watched the beneficent operation of this act in the United States and rejoiced to see how conspicuously successful it was in dealing with the traffic. We had even, through the International Bureau, called the attention of the national committees in Europe to the effective way in which the act was dealing with the traffickers in America and urged them to get a similar one passed in their own country when, to our intense disappointment, the judges of the Supreme Court in America discovered a flaw in one of its chief clauses and, I am told that in consequence, hundreds of men and women who had been convicted as traffickers were immediately let loose upon society to again engage in this lawless traffic. What a call to this Congress to be up and doing. You must not rest, you dare not hesitate, until you have renewed that law, and if needs be, strengthened it so as to deal effectively with these inhuman monsters. This is the one thing for you to be doing until it is done. Rouse the public to a sense of the gravity of the situation. Give your legislators no rest until they have amended the law in the direction indicated. In London, the operation of this clause has been demonstrated by the improved condition of our streets. The open parade of flaunting vice has been much modified, and the foreign element of evil has found it far more difficult to carry on its ramifications than formerly. There will be no difference of opinion amongst us as to the usefulness of Article 6 in the protection of young girls, which is as follows, quote, The contracting governments undertake, within legal limits, to exercise supervision, as far as possible, over the offices or agencies engaged in finding employment for women or girls abroad, end quote. It is common knowledge that the Servants' Registry Office has, like the railway station, been too ready a means in the hands of the unscrupulous traders in vice. An application for a servant, governess, or a companion to a lady offering good wages and a comfortable home in a foreign country has always met with a ready response, and by such methods these traders have been able to command the flower of girlhood. How many scores of young women have by these means been inveigled into a foreign land to find themselves hopelessly enslaved into a life which is worse than a living death? The nature of this evil was well known to those who took part in the official conference, and they set themselves to work 
to prevent these registry offices being the means, even innocently, of acting as agents for the traffickers in vice. That their efforts were effective is proved in those countries where Article 6 has been put into operation. We can bear testimony to its efficient working in many places in England. Where it is in operation, the registry office proprietors are compelled to ascertain the bona fide character of the situations abroad offered to young women, and in this way it has foiled and de accustomed to use these agencies to decoy young girls to their moral ruin. I have only been able to refer to a few of the many plans for the better moral protection of young women provided by the work for the suppression of the white slave traffic, but sufficient has been adduced to show how many new weapons have been forged in this direction by the international agreement for the use of individuals as well as of nations. It is a woman's charter which for the first time in the history of the world regards the moral well-being of a young woman as a national asset of great value to the country in which she lives. But the agreement can only be of real value in those countries where the people have sufficient interest in the welfare of their young women to organize themselves to assist their governments in its working. Let me close this paper with a strong appeal, a loud call to the men and women of America with like passions and sympathies with their English brethren across the Atlantic. We have much in common. Our hearts, as well as our language, are the same. We are influential and actuated by the same religious impulses. Let us then, as one people, join hands across the sea in this holy enterprise and sweep from the world this awful blight upon young womanhood. Remember, it is not a crime peculiar or common to men of one nationality. All nations, more or less, have taken part be it ours at this Congress to inaugurate a worldwide crusade in the name of God and of our common humanity against this crime. Remember, the forces of righteousness and purity are stronger than the forces of impurity. We may receive checks when engaged in the conflict, but about the ultimate victory there is no shadow of doubt. Let us in strong faith look up onto the hills from whence cometh our help, and the battle, however prolonged, is won. Let the old and the new world link themselves together under one banner and one leadership, spread the light of truth on this question, and scatter the men who delight in evil and the darkness by which their deeds are surrounded. I appeal especially to the women of America to rise in the dignity of womanhood and demand the suppression of the white slave traffic in America, yea, in the whole world, and thus give to young women those rights and that protection which should be their common heritage. Let me close by quoting Lowell's words, which on many occasions have proved a trumpet call to some forgotten duty. Quote, Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide, in the strife of truth with falsehood, for the good or evil side, some great cause, God's new Messiah, offering each the bloom or blight, parts the goats upon the left hand and the sheep upon the right, and the choice goes on forever twixt that darkness and that light. End quote. End chapter 2. Chapter 3 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls, or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 3 The White Slave Trade of Today by Edwin W. Sims, United States District Attorney, Chicago. There are some things so far removed from the lives of normal, decent people as to be simply unbelievable by them. The white slave trade of today is one of these incredible things. The calmest, simplest statements of its facts are almost beyond the comprehension or belief of men and women who are mercifully spared from contact with the dark and hideous secrets of the underworld of the big cities. 
You would hardly credit the statement, for example, that things are being done every day in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and other large cities of this country in the white slave traffic, which would, by contrast, make the Congo slave traders of the old days appear like good Samaritans. Yet this figure is almost a literal truth. The man of the Stone Age who clubbed the woman of his desire into insensibility or submission was little short of a high-minded gentleman when contrasted with the men who fatten upon the white slave traffic in this day of social settlements, of forward movements, of YMCA and Christian Endeavour activities, of airships and wireless telegraphy. Naturally, wisely, every parent who reads this statement will at once raise the question— what excuse is there for the open discussion of such a revolting condition of things in the pages of a published book? What good is there to be served by flaunting so dark and disgusting a subject before the family circle? Only one, and that is a reason and not an excuse. The recent examination of more than two hundred white slaves by the office of the United States District Attorney at Chicago has brought to light the fact that literally thousands of innocent girls from the country districts are every year entrapped into a life of hopeless slavery and degradation because parents in the country do not understand conditions as they exist and how to protect their daughters from the white slave traders who have reduced the art of ruining young girls to a national and international system. I sincerely believe that nine-tenths of the parents of these thousands of girls who are every year snatched from lives of decency and comparative peace and dragged under the slime of an existence in the white slave world have no idea that there is really a trade in the ruin of girls as much as there is a trade in cattle or sheep or other products of the farm. If these parents had known the real conditions, had believed that there is actually a syndicate which does as regular, as steady and persistent a business in the ruination of girls as the great packing-houses do in the sale of meats, it is wholly probable that their daughters would not now be in dens of vice, and almost utterly without hope of release, excepting by the hand of death. Is not this, then, reason enough for a little plain speech to parents? The purpose of all our laws and statutes against crime is the suppression of crime. The protection of the people, of the home, of the individual, is the purpose which inspires the honest and conscientious prosecutor. This is what the law is for, and if this result of protection to individuals and homes can be made more effective and more general by a statement such as this, then I am willing to make it for the public good and the most direct and unadorned statement of facts will, I think, carry its own conviction and make everything like preaching or denunciation superfluous. The evidence obtained from questioning some 250 girls taken in federal raids on Chicago houses of ill repute leads me to believe that not fewer than 15,000 girls have been imported into this country in the last year as white slaves. Of course, this is only a guess, an approximate, it could be nothing else, but my own personal belief is that it is a conservative guess and well within the facts as to numbers. Then please remember that girls imported are certainly but a mere fraction of the number recruited for the army of prostitution from home fields, from the cities, the towns, the villages of our own country. There is no possible escape from this conclusion. Another significant fact brought out by the examination of these girls is that practically everyone who admitted having parents living begged that her real name be withheld from the public because of the sorrow and shame it would bring to her parents. One said, quote, My mother thinks I'm studying in a stenographic school. Another stated, My parents in the country think I have a good position in a department store, as I did have for a time, and I've sent them a little money from time to time. I don't care what happens so long as they don't know the truth about me. In a word, the one concern of nearly all those examined who have homes in this country was that their parents, and in particular their mothers, might discover, through the prosecution of the white slavers, that they were leading lives of shame instead of working at the honourable callings which they had left their homes and come to the city to pursue. There are, to put it mildly, hundreds, yes, thousands, of trusting mothers in the smaller cities the towns, villages, and farming communities of the United States, who believe that their daughters are getting on fine in the city and too busy to come home for a visit or to write much, while the fact is that these daughters have been swept into the gulf of white slavery, the worst doom that can befall a woman. 
the mother who has allowed her girl to go to the big city and work should find out what kind of life that girl is living and find out from some other source than the girl herself. No matter how good and fine a girl she has been at home and how complete the confidence she has always inspired, find out how she's living, what kind of associations she's keeping. Take nothing for granted. You owe it to yourself and to her, and it is not disloyalty to go beyond her own words for evidence that the wolves of the city have not dragged her from safe paths. It is instead the highest form of loyalty to her. Again, there is another particular, a remarkable and impressive sameness in the stories related by these wretched girls. In the narratives of nearly all of them is a passage describing how some man of their acquaintance had offered to help them to a good position in the city, to look after them and to take an interest in them. After listening to this confession from one girl after another, hour after hour, until you've heard it repeated perhaps fifty times, you feel like saying to every mother in the country, do not trust any man who pretends to take an interest in your girl, if that interest involves her leaving her own roof. Keep her with you. She's far safer in the country than in the big city. But if go to the city she must, then go with her yourself. If that is impossible, place her with some woman who's your friend, not hers. No girl can safely go to a great city to make her own way who's not under the eye of a trustworthy woman who knows the ways and dangers of city life. Above all, distrust the protection, the good offices of any man who is not a family friend, known to be clean and honourable, and above all suspicion. Of course, all the examinations to which I have referred have been conducted for the specific purpose of finding girls who have been brought into this country from other lands in defiance of the federal statute, passed by Congress February twentieth, 1907. This act declares that any person who shall keep, maintain, support, or harbor any alien woman for immoral purposes within three years after her arrival in this country shall be guilty of a misdemeanor and shall be liable to a fine of five thousand dollars and imprisonment for five years at the discretion of the court. When the Department of Justice at Washington decided that this law was being violated, the United States District Attorney at Chicago was instructed to take such action as was necessary to apprehend the violators of the act and convict them. One of the first steps required was the raiding of the various dives and houses of ill fame and the arrest of the girl inmates, as well as the arrest of the keepers and the procurers of the white slaves. While the federal prosecution is officially concerned only with those cases involving the importation of girls from other countries, there being no authority under the present national statutes for the federal government to prosecute those concerned in securing white slaves who are natives of this country, it was inevitable that the examination of scores of these inmates captured in raids upon the dives should bring to officers and agents of the Department of Justice an immense fund of information regarding the methods of the white slave traders in recruiting for their traffic from home fields. Whether these hunters of the innocent ply their awful calling at home or abroad, their methods are much the same, with the exception that the foreign girl is more hopelessly at their mercy. Let me take the case of a little Italian peasant girl who helped her father till the soil in the vineyards and fields near Naples. Like most of the others taken in the raids, she stoutly maintained that she'd been in this country more than three years, and that she was in a life of shame from choice, and not through the criminal act of any person. When she was brought into what the sensational newspapers would call the sweat-box, it was clear that she was in a state of abject terror. Soon, however, Assistant to United States District Attorney Parkin, having charge of the examination, convinced her that he and his associates were her friends and protectors, and that their purpose was to punish those who had profited by her ruin, and to send her back to her little Italian home with all her expenses paid, that she was under the protection of the United States and was as safe as if the King of Italy would take her under his royal care, and pledge his word that her enemies should not have revenge upon her. Then she broke down, and with pitiful sobs related her awful narrative— that every word of it was true no one could doubt who saw her as she told it. Briefly, this is her story. A fine lady who wore beautiful clothes came to her where she lived with her parents, made friends with her, told her she was uncommonly pretty, the truth, by the way, and professed a great interest in her. Such flattering attentions from an American lady who wore clothes as fine as those of the Italian nobility 
could have but one effect on the mind of this simple little peasant girl and on her still simpler parents. Their heads were completely turned, and they regarded the American lady with almost adoration. Very shrewdly, the woman did not attempt to bring the little girl back with her, but held out hope that some day a letter might come with money for her passage to America. Once there, she would become the companion of her American friend, and they would have great times together. Of course, in due time, the money came, and the hundred dollars was a most substantial pledge to the parents of the wealth and generosity of the American lady. Unhesitatingly, she was prepared for the voyage, which was to take her to the land of happiness and good fortune. According to the arrangements made by letter, the girl was met at New York by two friends of her benefactress, who attended to her entrance papers and took her in charge. These friends were two of the most brutal of all the white slave traders who are in the traffic. At this time she was about sixteen years old, innocent and rarely attractive for a girl of her class, having the large, handsome eyes, the black hair, and the rich olive skin of a typical Italian. Where these two men took her she did not know, but by the most violent and brutal means they quickly accomplished her ruin. For a week she was subjected to unspeakable treatment and made to feel that her degradation was complete and final. And here let it be said that the breaking of the spirit, the crushing of all hope for any future, save that of shame, is always a part of the initiation of a white slave. Then the girl was shipped on to Chicago, where she was disposed of to the keeper of an Italian dive of the vilest type. On her entrance here she was furnished with gaudy dresses and wearing apparel for which the keeper of the place charged her six hundred dollars. As is the case with all new white slaves, she was not allowed to have any clothing which she could wear upon the street. Her one object in life was to escape from the den in which she was held a prisoner. To pay out seemed the surest way and at length from her wages of shame she was able to cancel the six hundred dollar account. Then she asked for her street clothing at her release, only to be told that she had incurred other expenses to the amount of four hundred dollars. Her Italian blood took fire at this, and she made a dash for liberty, but she was not quick enough, and the hand of the oppressor was upon her. In the wild scene that followed she was slashed with a razor, one gash straight through her right eye one across her cheek and another slitting her ear. Then she was given medical attention and the wounds gradually healed, but her face was horribly mutilated. Her right eye is always open, and to look upon her is to shudder. When the raids began, she was secreted, and arrangements made to ship her to a dive in the mining regions of the West. Fortunately, however, a few hours before she was to start upon her journey, the United States Marshals raided the place and captured herself as well as her keepers. To add to the horror of her situation, she was soon to become a mother. The awful thought on her mind, however, was to escape from assassination at the hands of the murderous gang which oppressed her. One recital of this kind is enough, although instances by the score might be cited which differ only in detail and degree. It is only necessary to say that the legal evidence thus far collected establishes with complete moral certainty these awful facts, that the white slave traffic is a system operated by a syndicate which has its ramifications from the Atlantic seaboard to the Pacific Ocean, with clearing houses or distributing centers in nearly all of the larger cities, that in this ghastly traffic the buying price of a young girl is from fifteen dollars up and that the selling price is from two hundred dollars to six hundred dollars. If the girl is especially attractive, the white slave dealer may be able to sell her for as much as eight hundred or a thousand dollars. That this syndicate did not make less than two hundred thousand dollars last year in this almost unthinkable commerce, that it is a definite organization sending its hunters regularly to scour France, Germany, Hungary, Italy, and Canada for victims, that the man at the head of this unthinkable enterprise is known among his hunters as the Big Chief. Also, the evidence shows that the hirelings of this traffic are stationed at certain ports of entry in Canada, where large numbers of immigrants are landed to do what is known in their parlance as cutting out work. In other words, these watchers for human prey scan the immigrants as they come down the gangplank of a vessel which has just arrived and spot the girls who are unaccompanied by fathers, mothers, brothers, or relatives to protect them. 
The girl who has been spotted as a desirable and unprotected victim is properly approached by a man who speaks her language and is immediately offered employment at good wages, with all expenses to the destination to be paid by the man. Most frequently, laundry work is the bait held out, sometimes housework or employment in a candy shop or factory. The object of the negotiations is to cut out the girl from any of her associates and to get her to go with him. Then the only thing is to accomplish her ruin by the shortest route. If they cannot be cajoled or enticed by promises of an easy time, plenty of money, fine clothes, and the usual stock of allurements, or a fake marriage, then harsher methods are resorted to. In some instances, the hunters really marry the victims. As to the sterner methods, it is of course impossible to speak explicitly beyond the statement that intoxication and drugging are often used as a means to reduce the victims to a state of helplessness, and sheer physical violence is a common thing. When once a white slave is sold and landed in a house or dive, she becomes a prisoner. The raids disclose the fact that in each of these places is a room having but one door, to which the keeper holds the key. In here are locked all the street clothes, shoes, and the ordinary apparel of a woman. The finery which is provided for the girl for house wear is of a nature to make her appearance on the street impossible. Then added to this handicap is the fact that at once the girl is placed in debt to the keeper for a wardrobe of fancy clothes, which are charged to her at preposterous prices. She cannot escape while she is in debt to the keeper, and she is never allowed to get out of debt at least until all desire to leave the life is dead within her. The examination of witnesses has brought out the fact that not many of the women in this class expect to live more than ten years after they enter upon their voluntary or involuntary life of white slavery. Perhaps the average is less than that. Many died painful deaths by disease, many by consumption, but it is hardly beyond the truth to say that suicide is their general expectation. We all come to it sooner or later, one of the witnesses remarked to her companions in the jail the other day, when reading in the newspaper of the suicide of a girl inmate of a notorious house. A volume could be written on this revolting subject, but I have no disposition to add a single word to what will open the eyes of parents to the fact that white slavery is an existing condition, a system of girl hunting that is national and international in its scope, that it literally consumes thousands of girls, clean, innocent girls, every year, that it is operated with a cruelty, a barbarism, that gives a new meaning to the word fiend, that it is an imminent peril to every girl in the country who has a desire to get into the city and taste its excitements and its pleasures. The facts I have stated are for the awakening of parents and guardians of girls. If I were to presume to say anything to the possible victims of this awful scourge of white slavery, it would be this. Those who enter here leave hope behind. The depths of debasement and suffering disclosed by the investigation now in progress would make the flesh of a seasoned man of the world creep with horror and shame. End of section 3 Read by Sandra near Montreal, 2023, where the slave trade continues. Chapter 4 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 4 Menace of the White Slave Trade by Edwin W. Sims, United States District Attorney, Chicago. Right at the outset, let me say in all frankness that I would never, from personal choice, write upon a subject of this character. Its sensationalism is personally repellent to me. On the other hand, no matter how carefully the public prosecutor may preserve the legal viewpoint and the legal temperament, his work may lead him into situations where he feels that he cannot, in common humanity, withhold from the public a knowledge of the things which he knows cannot fail to be of actual protective benefit to many homes, that to withhold the facts and disclosures which have come to him as an officer of the law would be to deprive the innocent and the worthy of a protection which might save many a home from sorrow, disgrace, and ruin. Again, the results of this legal work and of the explanations of the conditions uncovered in my former article 
have brought me a gratifying knowledge of the practical and most effective rescue work being done by Reverend Ernest A. Bell of the Illinois Vigilance Association, of which Reverend M. P. Boyton is the president. These men, and many of the settlement and slum workers of Chicago with whom I have come in contact, are not only specialists in this field, but they are as devoted as they are practical. More perhaps because of the urgent assurances of the Reverend M.P. Boynton, Mr. Bell, and others that giving to the public a statement of actual conditions has been of a great service to them in their hand-to-hand -hand fight than to any other reason, I am moved to make another statement. When the editor of the Women's World urged me to write of the white slave traffic of today, I felt that I had an official knowledge of facts which the fathers and mothers of the country had a right to know in order to prevent the possibility of their daughters falling victims to the most hideous form of human slavery known in the world today. This consideration moved me to put aside my strong personal feelings against appearing in print in connection with a subject so abhorrent. Many results of that article have made me glad that I did so, and those results have also contributed to overcome my antipathy to a further pursuit of that subject. But in following the subject as I now do, I shall again emphasize the fact that I wish to say what seems to be needful in as unsensational a way as possible, and that I also wish to do that from the viewpoint of a public prosecutor who has, in the ordinary discharge of his duties, encountered this appalling situation, and not at all from the standpoint of this sentimentalist. So far as the matter of sensationalism is concerned, that may be disposed of in the simple statement that the naked recital in the most formal and colorless phraseology of the facts already brought to light by the white slave prosecutions are in themselves so sensational that the art of the most brilliant orator or the cunning of the cleverest writer could not add an iota to their sensationalism. And it may as well be said here that it is quite impossible to even hint in public print of the revolting depths of shame disclosed by this investigation. Behind every word that can be said in print on this topic is a word of degradation of which the slightest hint cannot be given. If there are any who are inclined to feel that the term white slave is a little overdrawn, a little exaggerated, let them decide on that point after considering this statement. Among the white slaves captured in raids since the appearance of my first article is a girl who is now about 18 years of age. Her home was in France, and when she was only 14 years old, she was approached by a white slaver who promised her employment in America as a lady's maid or companion. The wage offered was far beyond what she could expect to get in her own country, but far more alluring to her than the money she could earn was the picture of the life which would be hers in free America. Her surroundings would be luxurious. She would be the constant recipient of gifts of dainty clothing from her mistress, and even the hardest work she would be called upon to do would be in itself a pleasure and an excitement. Naturally, she was eager to leave her home and trust herself to one who would provide her with so enriching a future. Her friends of her own age seasoned their farewells to her with envy of her rare good fortune. On arriving in Chicago, she was taken to the house of ill fame to which she had been sold by the procurer. There, this child of 14 was quickly and unceremoniously broken in to the hideous life of depravity for which she had been entrapped. The white slaver who sold her was able to drive a most profitable bargain, for she was rated as uncommonly attractive. In fact, he made her life of shame a perpetual source of income, and when, not long ago, he was captured and indicted for the transportation of other girls, this girl was used as the agency of providing him with $2,000 for his defense. But let us look for a moment at the mentionable facts of this child's daily routine of life and see if such an existence justifies the use of the term slavery. After she had furnished a night of servitude to the brutal passions of vile frequenters of the place, she was then compelled each night to pull off her tawdry costume, array herself in the garb of a scrub woman, and on her hands and knees scrub the house from top to bottom. No weariness, no exhaustion ever excused her from this drudgery, which was a full day's work for a strong woman. After her cleaning was done, she was allowed to go to her chamber and sleep, locked in a room to prevent her possible escape until the orgies of the next day, or 
rather night, began. She was allowed no liberties, no freedom, and in the two and a half years of her slavery in this house, she was not even given one dollar to spend for her own comfort or pleasure. The legal evidence shows that during this period of slavery, she earned for those who owned her not less than $8,000 and probably $10,000. If this is not slavery, I have no definition for it. Let me make it entirely clear that the white slave is an actual prisoner. She is under the most constant surveillance, both by the keeper to whom she is let and by the procurer who owns her. Not until she has lost all possible desire to escape is she given any liberty. Many, very many letters have been received from parents who read the first article on this subject. A considerable number of them are from ministers of the gospel, from officers and members of law and order leagues, women's clubs, and kindred organizations. But there is a pathetic reminder which does not come from the public-spirited servants of the common good. These letters from the fathers and mothers whose fears and suspicions were aroused by the warning that the girl who had left her home in the country, gone up to the city and does not come home to visit, needs to be looked up. Before me, as I write, is a letter from a father who is a tragedy in a page. He begins the note by saying that the warning has aroused him to inquire after his little girl. There is a pathetic pride in his admission that she was considered an uncommonly pretty girl when she left her home to take a position in Chicago. Her letters, he states, have been more and more infrequent, but that she does occasionally write home and sometimes encloses a small amount of money. From the tone of the father's note, it is evident that, while he is a trifle anxious, he asks that his daughter be looked up rather to confirm his feelings of confidence that she is all right than otherwise. A glance at the address where she is to be found left no possible question as to the fate which had overtaken his daughter of a country home. So far as a knowledge of this girl's mode of life is concerned, no investigation was necessary, the location named being in the center of Chicago's red light district. While the case was a sad one, there appeared to be no violation of the federal laws the girl having come from a neighboring state. A federal prosecution against those detaining her was therefore impossible. However, the case was placed in the hands of Mr. Bell of the Illinois Vigilance Association. Through his efforts, she was rescued and shortly thereafter returned to her mother and brothers and sisters who had supposed that she was holding a respectable but poorly paid position. They, however, welcomed a very different person from the pretty girl who went out from that home to make her way in the big city. She was pitifully wasted by the life which she had led, and her constitution is so broken down that she cannot reasonably expect many years of life, even under the tenderest care. What is still worse, the fact cannot be denied that her moral fiber is shattered and the work of reclamation must be more than physical. The white slaves who have been taken in the course of the present prosecution have, generally, been very grateful for the liberation and glad to return to their homes. It has been necessary, for their own protection as well as for other reasons, to commit some of these unfortunates to various prisons pending the trial of the cases in which they are to appear as witnesses, and practically every one of them gives unmistakable evidence that imprisonment is a welcome liberation by comparison with a life of white slavery. Now, as to the practical means which parents should use to prevent this unspeakable fate from overtaking their daughters, they cannot do it by assuming that their daughter's all right and that she will be taking care of herself in the big city. In a large measure, it seems impossible to arouse parents, especially those in the country, to a realization that there is in every big city a class of men and women who live by trapping girls into a life of degradation and who are as inhumanely cunning in their awful craft as they are in other instincts, that these beasts of the human jungle are as unbelievably desperate as they are unbelievably cruel, and that their warfare upon virtue is as persistent, as calculating, and as unceasing as was the warfare of the wolf upon the unprotected lamb of the pioneer folk in the early days of the western frontier. I cannot escape the conclusion that the country girl is in greater danger from the white slavers than the city girl. The perusal of the testimony of many white slaves enforces this conclusion. 
That is because they are less sophisticated, more trusting, and more open to the allurements of those who are waiting to prey upon them. It is a fact which parents of girls in the country should remember that the white slavers are busy on the trains coming into the city and make it to a point to cut out an attractive girl whenever they can. This cutting out process, I use the technical term, consists of making the girl's acquaintance, gaining her confidence, and on one pretext or another, inducing her to leave the train before the main depot is reached. This is done because of the various protective and law and order organizations have watchers at the main railroad stations who are trained to the work of spotting and quickly detect a girl in the hands of one of these human beasts of prey. Generally, these watchers are women and wear the badges of their organizations. But suppose the girl from the country does not chance to fall in with the white slaver on the train, that she reaches the city in safety, becomes located in a position, or perhaps in the stenographic school or business college which she has come to attend, and secures a room in a boarding house. No human being, it seems to me, is quite so lonely as the young girl from the country when she first comes to the city and starts in the struggle of life there without acquaintances. All her instincts are social. And she is, for the time being, almost desolately alone in a wilderness of strange human beings. She must have someone to talk to. It is the law of youth, as well as the law of her sex, to crave constant companionship. And the consequences? She is sentimentally in a condition to prepare her for the slaughter, to make her an easy prey to the wiles of the white slave wolf. The girl reared in the city does not have this peculiar and insidious handicap to contend with. She has been, from the time she could first toddle along the sidewalk, educated in wholesome suspicion, taught that she must not talk with strangers or take candy from them, that she must withdraw herself from all the advances, and in large measure, regard all save her own people with distrust. As she grows older, she comes to know that certain parts of the city are more dangerous and more wicked than others that her comings and goings must always be in safe and familiar company, that her acquaintanceships and her friendships must be scrutinized by her natural protectors, and that, altogether, there is a definite but undefined danger in the very atmosphere of the city for the girl or the young woman which demands a constant and protective alertness. The training is almost wholly absent in the case of the country girl. She is not educated in suspicion until the protective instinct acts almost unconsciously, her intercourse with the world is almost comparatively free and unrestrained. She is so unlearned in the moral and social geography of the city that she is quite as likely, if left to her own devices, to select her boarding house in an undesirable as in a safe and desirable part of the city. And, in a word, when she comes into the city, her innocence, her trusting faith in humanity in general, her ignorance of the underworld and her loneliness and perhaps homesickness conspire to make her ready and an easy victim of the white slaver. In view of what I've learned in the course of the recent investigation and prosecution of the white slave traffic, I can say in all sincerity that if I lived in the country and had a young daughter, I would go any length of hardship and privation myself rather than allow her to go into the city to work or to study Unless that studying were to be done in the very best type of an educational institution where the girl students were always under the closest protection, the best and the surest way for parents of girls in the country to protect them from the clutches of the white slaver is to keep them in the country. But if circumstances should seem to compel a change from the country to the city, then the only safe way is to go with them into the city. But even this last has its disadvantages from the fact that in the case the parents would themselves be unfamiliar with the usages and the pitfalls of metropolitan life and would not be able to protect their daughters as carefully as if they had spent their lives in the city. One thing should be made very clear to the girl who comes up to the city, and that is that the ordinary ice cream parlor is very likely to be a spider's web for her entanglement. This is perhaps especially true of those ice cream saloons and fruit stores kept by foreigners. Scores of cases are on record where young girls have taken their first step toward white slavery in places of this character, and it is hardly too much to say that a week does not pass in Chicago without the publication in some daily paper of the details of a police court case in which the ice cream parlor of this type is the scene of a regrettable tragedy. The only safe rule is to keep away from places of this kind, whether in a big city like Chicago or in a large country town. 
I believe that there are good grounds for the suspicion that the ice cream parlor kept by the foreigner in the large country town is often a recruiting station and a feeder for the white slave traffic. It is certain that this is the case in the big city, and many evidences point to the conclusion that there is a kind of Freemasonry among these foreign proprietors or refreshment parlors, which would make it entirely natural and convenient for the proprietor of a city establishment of this kind, who is entangled in the white slave trade, to establish relations with a man in the same business and of the same nationality in the country town. I do not mean to be intimate by this that all the ice cream and fruit saloons having foreign-born proprietors are connected with the white slave traffic, but some of them are, and this fact is sufficient to cause all careful and thoughtful parents of young girls to see that they do not frequent these places. In this article, it is of course impossible to more than hint at the protective measures which conscientious parents of girls should employ in order to make the way safe for their daughters. There can be no doubt that Judge Lindsay of Denver, Judge Mack of Chicago, and Mr. Edward W. Bach of the Ladies' Home Journal are right in insisting upon greater frankness between parents and children, and that every child should have a sex education at home instead of being compelled to pick it up from the contaminating sources on the street and at school. And I may add that the world owes a debt to these men who have handled this delicate and difficult problem in a practical as well as a powerful manner. And I feel impelled to add that, in face of the horrifying disclosures brought to me in the form of legal evidence, every boy and girl of high school age should be taught something of the awful physical as well as the moral consequences which lurk behind allurements of the life in which the white slave is the central figure. These things cannot be presented in the public prints, but the father who keeps close to his boy and the mother who is a companion to her daughter may reveal these things in the home in a way which may save almost untold suffering. And to such parents I would say that the investigations of the United States District Attorney's Office in Chicago have brought together, as legal evidence, a mass of facts as to sanitary conditions in the districts where the white slaves are kept, which are horrifying and scarcely capable of exaggeration. End of chapter 4 Read by Wayne Robinson on 4-29-2023Chapter 5 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Winifred Asman. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls, or War on the White Slave Trade, by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 5 A White Slave Clearing House. A White Slave's Own Story The most conspicuous work of United States Attorney Sims against the white slave traders in Chicago was the arrest and indictment of a notorious French trader and his wife, Alphonse and Eva Defour. The federal grand jury voted five indictments against each of them. They spent six weeks or so in Cook County Jail, when they gained their liberty on bonds of $26,500, which they immediately forfeited and fled to Paris in August 1908. My missionary duties took me occasionally to the clearing house of the Dufours, and we have often held gospel meetings in front of their resort. In this place were about twenty girls whom the agents of this wicked couple had snared in different parts of Europe and America. One girl was from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who had been deceived into entering the house and then held there without her street clothes. She managed to send word out and secured her release. The Dufour woman was arraigned in court but was not punished seriously for this very common crime. A very young, black-eyed, black-haired Spanish girl was among the inmates and my thoughts inevitably went to some broken-hearted mother in sunny Spain whose daughter had been hunted for Chicago's white slave market. These murderous traffickers drink the heart's blood of weeping mothers while they eat the flesh of their daughters by living and fattening themselves on the destruction of the girls. Disease and debauch quickly blast the beauty of these lovely victims. Many of them are dead in two or three years. 
Cannibals seem almost merciful in comparison with the white slavers who murdered the girls by inches. It is a dark mystery that twentieth century civilization allows these atrocities, even under the flag of the free. In this glittering den, with its walls and ceiling of mirrors, was a sweet Russian girl, perhaps sixteen years old, whose fate made my heart bleed. She was of the best Russian type, blonde of medium height, peach-blossom complexion, roundish mouth, and of exceedingly gentle and loving disposition. Some father, perhaps a nobleman, perhaps dead and unable longer to protect the delight of his eyes, comes inevitably to my thoughts as I write. Oh, the pity of it all and the shame! How can any father of girls escape the nightmare of what might befall his own daughters if his own power to protect them should fail? I went to Baron Schlippenbach, who was then the consul of the mighty Tsar in Chicago, but I never learned that he was able to accomplish anything for this dear Russian girl. The Tsar is only the little father, as the Russian people call him. May the great father in heaven help his deeply wronged daughters in a way that shall break in pieces their oppressors. The den of the Defours had an income of $102,720 in the year 1907 and $41,000 in the first five months of 1908. One white slave was made to earn for them in May 1908 the sum of $723. These figures were taken from their own account books, which were seized by the United States government after the Dufours fled to Paris. This terrible place was both a receiving and a distributing station, and also a wide-open immoral resort patronized by thousands of young men, who are the ultimate white slavers, as they pay the expenses of the white slave trade. From this central clearing house, girls were shipped to Denver, San Francisco, and every place where the Dufours had correspondence. All this was revealed by their own documents after the United States had driven this tiger and tigress back to Paris. Soon after we had initiated the public agitation against the white slave horror in Chicago, I received three letters from a victim of the French traders. Such parts of the letters as can be made public are here given. These letters have supplied both information and inspiration to the workers who first brought this infamous traffic to public notice in Chicago. A White Slave's Own Story I want you to know everything I have witnessed in my three years of slavery. I was first sold in the Custom House place by a young man working for Mr. Blank, traveling the city in little towns or wherever he could find girls. Here we were, always from fifteen to eighteen girls, most of us very young. The man who bought me made us work like real slaves and then never gave us our money even if it was shamefully earned. His place was always full of so-called detectives, and if someone came to claim some one of us, quick she was slipped to some other town. Pictures of foreign girls would arrive by mail, and if one was pretty enough, they would wire to Paris and say, send parcel at once. They arrived by different ports, New York, Boston, Quebec, San Francisco, and those poor unfortunates are all claimed by someone pretending to be an aunt or father or husband. Letters are received by the resort keepers from all the states, and I believe from all the prisons of the world. If anyone could read all of those men's mail, I think one would learn horrible things. Also, we never can receive our mail direct, for the keeper opens the letters, and if they are indifferent, they are closed and given to us, but if they are any way wrong in his eyes, we never see them. If we escape and insist on not returning, they will send someone after us to propose that we leave for Denver, San Francisco, China, or Panama. Most of those men who make their living off those girls are old thieves and gamblers, and most of them have served terms in prison. There are very few girls who would tell, for those bad men surely would kill them if they found out who gave them away. If one girl is a good money-maker, they make her take one of those men to support. They say, if she does not do this, she is not respected by their class of people. They take all those poor girls' money every night, and they send them back to work the next day penniless. 
If they should not make enough for them, they are beaten and sometimes killed. When those runners bring us to those houses, they keep us sometimes weeks to teach us what to say in case the police or someone would try to rescue us, and with the threat to kill us if ever we would tell. Someone ought to do his duty and make war on those horrid men. They simply take girls for their slaves in all the country. For even if we are weak, someone with courage ought to help us not to be persuaded by those men. I am certainly glad that all the men are not bad, that someone takes our part. You can be sure that most of the girls are happy that someone came to make us strong. Have courage. God is with you and many of the slaves. It is well known that some of these brutal traffickers were legally hanged in California for murdering the women on whose earnings they were living. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls » or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell Chapter Six the true story of estelle ramon of kentucky by principal d f sutherland redwater texas she is one to be pitied and not slandered she was as pure as the air which she breathed in her humble home among the blue hills of the winding cumberland she was light of heart and gay of wing as eden's garden bird john and amanda ramon after they were married bought a little farm and settled down near the battlefield of mill springs john was one of these great big good-looking honest and hard-working men from the mountains his wife amanda ramon was a refined and well-educated kentucky woman and a woman who loved to be with the society folks she loved to wear fine dresses and spent more in this way than her husband could really afford and this caused him to have to work very hard early and late he went to clearing and improving his little farm and everybody was talking about what a noble fellow young john ramon was and how well he seemed to be getting along his wife did not seem to be satisfied to live in the hills. She wanted John to sell out and move to Somerset. Two years passed away on the little farm, and Estelle Ramon was born. John promised Amanda, when Estelle grew old enough to attend school, that he would sell out and move to town. Years passed on, and John Ramon continued to work hard and by hard work and good management he began to prosper he built a new house and bought a stella piano his wife still wanted to move to town but john didn't want to go he told his wife that he had nothing in town and no work there to do that they were beginning to get along fairly well and the best thing for them to do was to let well enough alone and that he wanted her to release him from his promise to move to town which by the entreaties of estelle she reluctantly did john was happy in his home life with his wife and a little girl who had now reached the age of fifteen years she had from the time she could toddle around been constantly with her father in the fields making the hay gathering the crops seeing after the stock you would find estelle and her father always together after supper she would climb upon her father's knee and he would always tell her some little story to please her she would ride the horse to the pasture and john would carry her back in his big strong arms 
She was essentially a papa's girl, and her father almost idolized his child. When she was old enough, she attended the country school close by and was known as the brightest pupil in the school. She learned music from her mother, and it was her chief delight to sing and play in the evenings for her parents. She was loved by everybody in the neighborhood, young and old. At an early age, she joined the church and she could always be found in her place in the church and in the Sunday school, first as a pupil of the Sunday school, and later on as a teacher of a class of little boys and girls. It was said that in after years, every boy and girl in her class became model Christians. One day, a messenger was sent in haste from the schoolhouse to John Ramon's home to tell him to come at once, that Estelle had become violently ill while playing on the school playground. John Ramon turned white and came near fainting, strong man as he was, when this saddest of all news reached him. In a few moments he had hitched up the horses to a carriage, and he and his wife were going as fast as the horses could take them to their child, whom they found in a dangerous condition. She was carried in the arms of her father to the carriage and driven home. In a short time the doctor reached the Ramon home and was by the bedside of Estelle she had been stricken down with typhoid fever john ramon with his life almost gone out of him waited for the doctor's report from the sick room when he came out he asked him what were the chances for his child to get well the doctor told him that she had a severe case of typhoid fever and the chances of recovery were against her but with close attention and nursing, she had a chance to get well. John Ramon said, Doctor, I am willing to take that chance. Day after day and night after night, John Ramon sat by the bedside of his child as she lingered between life and death. The doctor would come and shake his head and say, She is no better. For eight days and nights, John Ramon had eaten scarcely anything and slept not a wink. On the evening of the eighth day, the doctor came as usual. He told John Ramon that this night would determine whether his child would die or get well, that there would be a change before daylight for better or for worse. After giving John Ramon directions and telling him to wake him up if he saw any change in the child, the doctor lay down to get a much-needed rest and some sleep. The clock ticked off the hours and no change came. The clock struck one, two, three. John Ramon had never, during all the long and weary night hours, taken his eyes off his child there he sat in great trouble and sorrow watching her the clock struck three and estelle opened her eyes looked at john ramon and said is this you papa he knew that she was better he rushed into the room where the doctor was sleeping and awoke him the doctor not knowing whether the change was for better or worse, hastened into the sick room and felt of Estelle's pulse and said, John Ramon, your child is better. The crisis is past. She will get well. The joy of John Ramon and his wife could hardly be restrained. The doctor told them that they must be quiet or they might excite her and make her worse. The crisis had passed, and Estelle improved rapidly, and was soon able to sit up and ride out with her parents. John and Amanda Ramon were filled with joy, and a great weight seemed to be lifted from the whole neighborhood on account of the recovery of Estelle, 
for she was dearly loved by all who knew her on an adjoining farm to john ramon lived a neighbor by the name of david scott as true a man as ever lived among the hills of the cumberland river david scott had one son william scott as noble a lad as ever lived he was honest true and like estelle was loved by all william was just two years older than estelle and together they had played from early childhood during estelle's sickness no one unless her parents seemed more anxious about her than did william scott never a day or night passed but that william scott called at the ramon home to inquire about estelle during the whole time of her illness after she got well and took her place in the church and the sunday school william scott was there too he thought that there was none like her and she thought a great deal of him one day about three months after estelle had recovered mrs ramon said to her husband john have you noticed that william scott is showing too much attention to estelle i don't like it and we must stop it or the first thing we know he will be coming here to pay his attentions to her another thing i believe that estelle thinks a good deal of him well suppose she does said john ramon is not william a good boy and a good companion for estelle or anybody else yes i know that he is a good boy but if we continue to let estelle associate with him as she has been doing the first thing we know he will be thinking of marrying her and i could not bear the thought of having william scott for a son-in-law i don't suppose there is any danger of our having to lose estelle soon but when she is old enough to marry i would rather she would marry william scott than anybody that i know what estelle marry bill scott i would rather see her dead and buried well amanda what objections can you find to william scott i have no particular objection to him but he is not good enough for estelle i want her to marry a man who knows how to take her into society i want her to marry a professional gentleman and not a greenhorn like william scott well amanda i don't care so much about estelle going into what some people please to call society but i want her to marry a true man who can and will make her life happy i have no fault to find with william scott i know that he is thinking a good deal of estelle and that she thinks quite well of him and if they should want to get married some time i am not going to interfere you may not interfere but i tell you now that estelle shall never marry william scott estelle came in from school and this ended the conversation estelle and william had told each other from childhood that when they got old enough they were going to get married on sunday before the conversation between john and amanda ramon william scott had reminded estelle of their long-ago agreement and estelle had told him that they would carry out this agreement some day when they were older estelle one day told william that her father liked him but that her mother hated him and that it would be best that he quit coming to her home it was on this occasion that william and estelle plighted each other their love and he told her that nothing but death could ever separate him from her and that he would if necessary give his life for her in after years they both well remembered these words john ramon continued to work hard and to prosper one day when he was coming home from town he told his wife and estelle that rafting logs down the river was dangerous 
and that if anything should happen to him he wanted to leave them a living and for this reason he had his life insured today while in town for five thousand dollars heavy rains were falling up the cumberland and john ramon was working hard he and his hired hands to get the log raft ready to go down the river and carry his logs to nashville when the river got high enough one evening john learned that a head rise was coming down the cumberland and he and all hands were making ready to cut the raft loose and carry it to the sawmills in nashville as he had been doing year after year late on this evening john ramon kissed his wife and estelle good-bye he lingered longer than was his custom and said that somehow he felt uneasy as if something was going to happen at dark he reached the river and at ten o'clock they heard the head rise coming the raft was cut loose and the rise struck it and carried it out into the middle of the river the rushing waters bore down so heavily on the craft that it broke and went to pieces in the middle of the rushing waters john ramon became entangled among some of the logs and could not loose himself he called for help but no help could reach him in the darkness of the night and the fury of the waters his voice rang out above the noise of the waters and he cried out the last words he ever spoke on earth william i'm gone promise me that you will take care of estelle the voice of william scott rang out i swear to you that i will do it john ramon went down others of the crew escaped on logs i shall not undertake to describe the great sorrow in the ramon home when three days later the body of john ramon was found and brought home for burial who can tell the heaviness which bore down upon the heart of estelle he was buried and week after week estelle would carry flowers and place them upon his grave a year now has passed and estelle is seventeen one of the most lovable and beautiful girls in southern kentucky the death of her father had mellowed her life she was a woman in ways if a child in years william scott had watched her faithfully as he had promised her father in the hour of his death mrs ramon yet determined more than ever that estelle should never marry william scott she had her heart set on some professional man for estelle's husband who knew how to make her a belle of society she was the only counsellor of her daughter and in every way did she endeavor to cause her to break with young scott she often pictured to her the grand life she might live with some educated gentleman in the highest society that her beauty and training could and would make her admired by everybody and that she should not throw her chances away upon bill scott she would never allow scott to call upon estelle and managed to keep estelle for the most part out of his company one day a well-dressed and handsome young man came into the ramon neighborhood he gave it out that he was an artist from cincinnati ohio and had come to make some sketches of the beautiful scenery along the cumberland he was polite and gentlemanly in his manners a good conversationalist and entertaining this artist as he was thought to be was introduced into the ramon home and soon became a great favorite of mrs ramon and he did not fail to show every courtesy and attention to the fair estelle 
This artist soon found out that his success depended not upon the girl, but upon her mother. He had been telling Mrs. Ramona the beauty and the accomplishments of her daughter and how she would shine in society if ever given an opportunity. He did not fail to impress upon her his own importance in society connections. This suited Mrs. Ramon exactly, and she determined to marry Estelle to the artist. He declared to the mother his great and undying love for her daughter, and how it would be the delight of his life to give her the chance in the world to which her beauty so justly entitled her. Little by little did the mother her child's only adviser succeeded in winning her over to her way of thinking the artist had declared his love to estelle herself she hesitated and thought of young scott whose heart she knew was breaking her mother persisted and the artist used his blandishments and soon it was given out that Estelle Ramon would be married to the Cincinnati artist. When this reached the ears of William Scott, he was nearly prostrated by the terrible blow. He wrote Estelle a letter in which he told her of the promise that he had made to her dying father and that he was going to keep that promise he warned her against marrying this strange young man of whom she knew nothing estelle when she read this letter came near declining to marry the artist her own heart told her that william scott was right but the artist and the mother persisted for fear that estelle would yet refuse to marry the artist the wedding day was set for the following sunday sunday came and estelle as pale as death walked out on the floor and she and the artist were married how happy was the mother how sad were estelle and william scott soon the ramon home and all the property were sold preparatory to taking estelle and her mother to the city the five thousand dollars of insurance and the three thousand dollars which the home and other property were sold for were turned over to the artist to invest in a home in the city mrs ramon was to visit her people for a short while and estelle and the artist were to go on and make ready the home in the city on the morning before estelle left she received a note from william scott saying that if ever she needed his assistance she would get it she and the artist took the train at somerset and estelle ramon was whirled away to her doom she was carried to cincinnati ohio where her husband told her they would spend a week before looking out for a home. She spent the week in a lodging house in the outskirts of the city. At the end of this week, the artist told her that they had better rest up another week before they began looking around. The second week passed away as the first and when he tried to put her off again she grew suspicious and became alarmed for the first time she told him that he must get the home or that he had to take her back to her mother he went out and pretty soon came back with a telegram from he told her a friend of his in cleveland inviting them to visit cleveland and procure a home there reluctantly she went with the artist to cleveland where they were met by someone in a closed carriage and driven to a house which she soon learned was a house of ill fame 
on reaching this place she was carried to a room in a secluded part of the building her husband then informed her where she was and that here she would have to remain that he was done with her and for her to give his regards to her mother if they ever met again that he was much obliged to her for the eight thousand dollars in cash and that he wished her a good time with the madam estelle fainted and this devil turned on his heels walked away and has never been heard of since the madam knew how to treat girls who fainted for she had seen them faint in her house before and she brought estelle back to consciousness who can picture now the horrors which rose up before estelle it cannot be done and i must leave it for the imagination of the reader in vain did estelle beg and plead to be let go useless were her piteous moans for freedom the madam told her that she had bought her and paid for her and that she was going to keep her and that the best thing she could do was to quiet down and submit to her fate willingly and was informed of what she was expected to do and had to do the madam told her that she had often paid as much as one hundred dollars for pretty girls like her but that she only had to pay fifty dollars for her by solemnly promising that she would not let her get away three months she was confined in this prison it is beyond the power of man to describe the darkness the blackness the fearfulness and the horrors of her life now her only hope was the words of william scott she knew that he meant every word he said and would rescue her if possible how could he find her was the question she would ask herself in her despair yet she hoped against hope that in some way or other he would find her three months had passed away and the mother of estelle had heard no tidings of her child she was wild she was frantic she was mad the terrible strain had been more than she could bear she became a maniac and in her ravings she would call for estelle to come back to her she would talk of nothing but estelle amanda ramon had destroyed her own life and the life of her child where is william scott the child playmate the youthful lover of estelle the one who promised to defend her william scott had believed that the artist was a scoundrel the first time he laid eyes on him no sooner had suspicions of foul play been aroused in the neighborhood than young scott took the train for cincinnati there he employed a detective to aid him in his search for estelle after one week of close search in every part of the city the place was found where the artist and estelle boarded during their two weeks stay in cincinnati where they went could not be learned from any source so well had the artist covered up his tracks he advertised for her in the newspapers and secured the services of detectives in several cities he concluded after a search of two months that she had been killed or taken to new york city and perhaps across the ocean to some foreign country his money was by this time all gone he wrote home to his father and told him to see his friends and the friends of estelle and send him money with which to continue the search for he intended to find her if alive the money was raised immediately and sent to william scott he next went to new york 
where he spent day after day and night after night in searching for the lost girl but with a sad heart he had to give it up for not the remotest clue could he get he resolved to go back to cincinnati and see if he could find out anything more about her in the neighborhood where she spent the two weeks he learned nothing new and had almost lost all hope one night while sitting in the lobby of a hotel he overheard a conversation between two gamblers one of them was telling the other about being in cleveland and at a certain place where he met the most beautiful girl that he ever saw he went on to describe her to the other gambler and wound up telling him that she fought like a tiger and showed him the scratches which he said this girl had made on his face with her fingernails the description given by one of these gamblers to the other was that of estelle william scott later said that he could hardly keep from killing this man then and there in the hotel young scott took the first train for cleveland not daring to seek further information from the gambler he was fully convinced that estelle was in a house of ill fame in that city by this time he had learned that it would not do him any good to tell his troubles to the police for some of them would be more likely to help the madam secrete the girl than to help him get her away on reaching cleveland he determined to tell no one of his mission or why he was there he determined to form his own plans and carry them out he felt sure that he and estelle were now in the same city and the thought almost made him wild he knew that if she was in a house of ill fame she was there against her will and was forced to remain there he determined to visit every house of prostitution in the city and find her the third night of his rounds he visited one of these houses and was admitted into the parlor the madam came in and asked him if he wished to see some of the girls he told her that he would not object if she had one real pretty she told him that the girls were all out now except one she called the fighting girl from the country he told her that he didn't guess that she was much of a fighter and that he didn't mind her fighting he could hardly control his feelings he paid the madam five dollars and went upstairs what if she screams when she sees me and gives the whole thing away thought young scott to himself he felt sure that she was estelle and that he was going to meet her now the door was unlocked and he entered she had dozed off into a sleep he locked the door and waited till the hall was clear before waking her he turned on the light looked into her face she was estelle he pulled two revolvers out of his pockets and laid them where they would be handy for he had resolved to take her out of this place this night or die in the attempt the light shone on her face and showed him how pale and troubled she looked he could see the great sorrows of her soul written in her face as she lay there sleeping he bent over her touched her face and whispered it is william scott from mill springs kentucky who has come to take you home for your life don't make any noise she opened her eyes and saw him and knew him and fainted away from joy he bathed her face and soon returning consciousness came to her she realized at once how necessary it was for her to keep quiet they held a whispered conversation as to how to escape he did not want to raise any scene 
for this might lead to his arrest and defeat all his plans of getting away he determined to steal her out of the house quietly and get away he opened the door to see if there was any one in the hall as there was no chance to escape through a window from the room he went out in the hall and carefully locked the door behind him so as to make no noise he then went to a window at the far end of the hall it was open he went back to the room and tied some bed covers and sheets together and they went out again locked the door as before went to this window and tied one end of the sheet and covers to a radiator and threw them out estelle went down and he followed in the alley where they landed it was dark and they were soon out of sight of this building he told her that he was afraid to take her to the depot in the city so they walked on in the darkness till they came to the railroad they took down this road and walked till they reached the next station some miles away reaching it just a few minutes before the southbound train came along here they took the train for cincinnati and for home who could tell of the joy which estelle now felt on being rescued from her prison house from the worst slavery ever known to the world at cincinnati william scott and estelle took the train for somerset and soon reached home great joys oftentimes have great sorrows and such awaited estelle william had not told her about her mother on the trip home he knew that she would learn it soon enough mrs ramon's people thought perhaps if estelle could be found that she might come to her right mind but such was not to be soon after the marriage of estelle and william scott mrs ramon died in an insane asylum End of chapter six Chapter 7 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in January 2023. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell chapter seven our sister of the street by miss florence mabel diedrich note miss diedrich is rescue missionary for the moody church chicago she is devoting her life to the visitation and rescue of sinful women in chicago she is heart and soul in the work and has been wonderfully blessed in her efforts when asked to write for you giving some of the experiences in the work of rescue of our sisters of the street and those who are victims of the white slave traffic i was more than glad of the opportunity of sharing this burden which god has laid so heavily on my heart i will treat of conditions as i have found them in the underworld of chicago what are we doing for our tempted sisters are we going to let the white slave traffic have free and undisputed sway without a word of protest blighting and ruining the homes in this fair land of liberty and freedom are we in illinois the state that sent abraham lincoln forth as leader in the conflict for freedom of the slaves of the south going to let an evil worse yea far worse than that ever was or could be exist and triumph and not rise up in arms against it the question what are we doing for our sisters came up as far back as solomon's time but has an answer been found no it was only when jesus met the woman at the well did a new life open up for our unfortunate sisters i plead with you do not draw away your skirts for fear of contamination remember the master himself allowed a fallen woman to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hairs of her head 
it was a fallen woman who was first to see the omissions and deficiencies of hospitality forgotten by others are not fallen women included within the scope of the master's great commission jesus said another time neither do i condemn thee go and sin no more a woman may fall lower than a man but this is due to her sensitive moral nature with the conviction that she is past redemption doors closed no one loving her people yes her own sex ostracizing her she becomes hopeless desperate reckless can you blame her again let me recall to your mind jesus himself forgave and renewed repentant ones even when a woman had fallen to the depths of sin and degradation he still called her woman not every girl who leads a life of sin and shame is by any means a white slave in the full sense of the word as the white slave traffic exists though truly a slave she is for god is no respecter of persons and the same judgment will be hers unless she hastens home to father's house where room and to spare and warm welcome awaits her not many open doors await her in this world an example of this is found in the case of a young girl in mississippi who ruined went from door to door to find someone who would befriend her some have one excuse some another all said we cannot take you in tired discouraged only one door opened and that the brothel to which she went it is said in one city of half a million people as reported through the press they determined to expel fifteen hundred fallen girls from the city without offering them a place to go when brought before the authorities between sobs and tears these girls said where can we go no homes money nor friends the reply was i cannot tell you but you must leave here many ask who are these girls who go astray having an idea that it is only the ignorant class who are down in sin that is not so and let me undeceive every one on this point though many many of the ignorant class do go astray also satan is claiming our best our very best girls of education refinement advantages and religious training in one of the most notorious and elegant resorts known as the blank in the red light district of chicago there are college girls who have had every advantage only lately as i have done personal work there did i learn that these very girls were at times in such despair as to threaten to commit suicide within a few blocks of moody church was a girl an elocutionist a musician a sweet stately girl of refinement whose home has been in a house of shame for the last five or six years some girls come to me when in these resorts and say i used to sing in moody's church choir others will tell you that they went through every department of the sunday school some were sunday school teachers members of almost every church you will find among them when these facts are considered one cannot help but realize the need for action satan has entered our churches as well as every other place it is only recently that our churches have opened to workers to even speak on this subject but thank god they are gladly beginning to do so since they see danger staring them in the face the time for prudishness false modesty indelicacy is over too long has satan been aided in his onward march in this way a sad incident occurred in one of our west side churches seven or eight boys whom everyone considered pure were found upon investigation to have caused the ruin of thirteen girls one girl in telling me how she had been led astray said she had only been getting three dollars and fifty cents a week seeing an advertisement for experienced workers at five dollars she answered it for two weeks they kept it from her that she was in a house of shame a problem that must be met is the preservation of our american homes let me quote from mr moody quote, intemperance comes as a blight upon one family in seven but the evil of impurity threatens seven times as many families that is all of them 
End quote. There are hundreds of towns and villages where it is impossible to get a drink of liquor of any kind, while on the other hand there is not a single town, hamlet, or community of any size where the evil of impurity does not exist to a greater or lesser degree. There must be cooperation on the part of the state, the home, and the church. What we need is a practical salvation, something more than saying, Be ye saved. The church can do what the state cannot, and vice versa. Not only present, but future generations are in danger. Vice and crime are being flaunted, as it were, and advertised in our very faces. Every man, woman, and child has a place in the battle. It is girls whose ages are from 13 to 22 who are going astray, even as young as nine years, deceived betrayed led away through wiles of abominable men whose business is to traffic in girls since living in chicago many girls i have known gave birth to little ones at the ages of thirteen fourteen and fifteen let me give some figures during the month of May alone, in the two syphilitic wards in Cook County Hospital, 140 men and 32 women passed through. In 22nd Street, Red Light District, by police enumeration a few months ago, there were 1,100 girls living lives of prostitution. Farther south, 1,200, making a total of 2,300 persons. This is appalling, and yet this does not take in the whole city. As many of you know, as far as can be learned, the average buying price of a girl is $15. She may be sold for $200, if specially attractive, anywhere from $400 to $600. The conscience of these girls is by no means dead. Upon giving one my card in the hospital, she said, if i had only known it before many tell me about being a christian and another world but i never could understand it the cry of another sin-sick girl was amid sobs and tears oh it is awful and sin has done it oh christian women mothers give recognition to the fact yes welcome it that a fallen woman can be saved and extend to her sympathy encouragement and love these girls are reached not only through resorts, but in our city prisons, police stations, courts, hospitals, and elsewhere. The rescue homes are doing a noble work, especially Beulah Home, Salvation Army Home, and others. The girls' refuge, where the juvenile court cases are taken, has girls of all ages up to 18 and 19. At present, 140 girls are there under Christian influence. The superintendent of a rescue home recently asked 200 girls who were there how many had been warned as to temptation and danger by their mothers. Not one had. Only in a few instances had they been told to be good while they were gone. Another sad fact, and oh, how hard to admit, is that a girl receives the most discouragement from her own sex, and with this censure and criticism, is it any wonder our sisters do not have any drawing towards Christianity? One word of warning to Christian workers. Many take money from these resorts, going in with the sole object of getting money, by selling papers or taking money when offered them. One night, as I started to talk to a girl, she offered me money, and as I refused, she seemed quite surprised. I told her I was not doing the work for money. I was interested in her soul's welfare only. She said, How is it some of you Christians come in here and take our tainted money? Oh, workers, remember the gospel is without money and without price. Do not forget these girls, down as they are in sin. They are watching our lives, and it is this that counts for most. Especially, let me say, the girls of today are the mothers of tomorrow, and as in the life and influence of mothers rests the making of men and nations, let us, with God's help, save the girls. 
knowing the price of a single soul the burden of my heart is that the minds of our american people may be so stirred and awakened to the existing causes of evils that are engulfing our girls that we will each take our part appoint ourselves as a committee of one to do all we can to stamp out this monstrous soul scourge and hinder and stop its further progress what are the dangers of city life for a country girl after an experience in rescue missionary work for women and girls not only in this city but in new york city and boston there is one conclusion which i am forced to come to and more and more is becoming an undeniable fact it is this that our country girls are in more danger from white slave traders than city girls were i alone in making this statement i should not hesitate for one moment in what i have to say but others agree with me in this among them being united states district attorney sims who has written much on the subject of white slavery one reason for reaching this conclusion comes from the personal hand-to-hand -hand and heart-to-heart -heart touch with these girls themselves the country girl is more open to the enticements of city life being more truthful perfectly innocent and unsuspecting of those whose business it is to seek their prey from girls of this class a girl reared in the country is not taught to suspect every one she meets unless a rare occurrence presents itself and when involuntarily the defense instinct asserts itself while on the other hand the city girl has had it drilled into her as it were from the time she could walk that she must regard people with distrust not speaking to strangers anywhere accepting nothing from any one her own people being the only one she could make confidants of mr sims says quote, there is a definite but undefined danger in the very atmosphere of the city for the girl or young woman which demands a constant and protective alertness while on the other hand life in the rural districts is comparatively free and unrestrained End quote. again he states and through his investigation of the white slave traffic has reached the conclusion that the best and surest way for parents of girls in the country to protect them from the clutches of the white slaver is to keep them in the country while this may be the safest surest easiest course to take it would not be advisable in all cases for many girls have an ambition and aim in life which they are seeking to attain and the city offers advantages for this development which the country does not and we should not seek to put obstacles in her way but to protect her in carrying out her purpose in life but if circumstances should seem to compel a change from country to city the only safe way is for parents to accompany their girls to see them settled though this would have its disadvantages as many parents are just as ignorant as their children regarding the perils of city life a timely warning parents who do not believe in the warnings given on these lines but say as many do wait time enough when they are older then let them find out for themselves experience is the best teacher should remember this ignorance is not innocence and it is but the preface to the book of vice to parents is given the first and greatest opportunity of fortifying their children with the true armor of knowledge and purity more than one girl with whom i have talked in resorts in the red light district when questioned as to how they came there would say oh mother thinks i am working a good position i have said does she not ask you oh no mother never questions me much and in many cases they would say i send money home and think of it that has satisfied mother what is her motive for city life there comes a time in nearly every girl's life when her cry is to go to the city and i think i can speak from personal experience here it may be necessary through force of circumstances or to develop herself along the line of her cherished ambition or a thirst for knowledge if it is to satisfy the desire for mere personal happiness and enjoyment and craving for excitement i say beware for here it is many slip and are lost 
she sees no danger even though some warnings may be given it is hard for her to realize that she herself will be in danger she will tell you that she is able to take care of herself forgetting her surroundings will be vastly different she finally sees the danger when alas too late i found an instance of this in a resort where a dear girl said one night we are the fools it's a broad door to come in but so narrow to get out of here a hidden danger the danger begins the moment a girl leaves the protection of home and mother one of these dangers and one that seems to be well nigh impossible for parents to realize is the fact that there are watchers and agents who may be either men or women at our steamboat landings railroad stations everywhere who seek attractive girls evidently unused to city ways try to make their acquaintance using inducements and deception of every conceivable kind offers of helpfulness showing her every kindness i remember so well one dear girl whom i found in cook county hospital brought there from a brothel sold led away deceived from another town on the promise of work who said to me everyone in chicago deceives you no one told me the truth until i met you you are the first real friend i could trust girls are offered refreshments either to eat or drink many are secured in this way and the girl has realized when too late her refreshing drink was drugged and she is a victim a prisoner and her life ruined hungry for a little companionship after coming to the city homesickness may overtake a girl and even if in some cases warnings have been given she may forget throw off restraint and pour out her heart freely to those of whom she knows nothing but in this unguarded moment the mischief is done one little realizes the longing in a girl's heart who is alone in the big city the following incident brings out this point in a brothel one night i was talking with a girl who was playing with a little pet dog as i continued to talk to her all at once she said looking into the dog's face then in mine this is the only friend i have and if i feel blue and discouraged he will climb into my lap and try to comfort me another danger still and a serious one is our lodging houses of today many of which are houses of shame hidden from the public eye let a girl just coming to the city beware of these for in many many instances i am very sure it is just such an existence no home life coming in tired lonely no one cares about you you may live or die and few would know it so to speak unless you were in a christian home which are only too scarce in the lodging house business though thank god for some unprotected she is here not knowing who lives in the next room to her boarding or rooming rather in one place taking meals in another is a great danger and one which her mother should guard against boarding houses are not much of an improvement though in many cases a little more home life another evil and serious danger and only another of satan's waiting rooms is the entertaining of gentlemen friends in her room true this little room is the only place she has and here is one of the birthplaces to immorality and temptation constantly before her much danger might be avoided if every lodging house had a parlor where a girl could have some home life and entertain her friends occasionally oh may the parents who read this make sure your child has christian influence and surroundings it may cost you extra money to do it but better far to cost you something than to have her life blasted and ruined dangerous amusements without a moment's hesitation i would say after much investigation one curse of our land to-day is five-cent theatres many nights have i worked outside of these and investigated inside and have seen these pictures not possible to describe in words and have seen children mere babies of every age flocking in and out of these theatres many of them with older people or guardians with them many entirely alone more harm is done here in one night than could be undone in years 
ice cream parlors of the city and fruit stores in many cases combined largely run by foreigners are where scores of girls have taken their first step downward mr sims states that he believes the ice cream parlor even in the large country town is often a recruiting station and feeder for the white slave traffic do not get the idea that we mean that all of these are connected with white slavery but some of them are and wise parents should be careful on these points there are restaurants selling wines and liquors where many young girls go as waitresses which hold dangers for any girl also let me say here a word of warning look out for the signs satan is putting up all over our cities like this ladies entrance family entrance which has been the entrance of many a precious girl to the life of sin the amusement parks are now becoming a serious menace to our young people shut up in a small room hot and stifling a girl gladly accepts the chance for an outing all over these places satan has his agents stationed seeking victims advertisements are another temptation in store for the country girl it is in these days the devil's own invention such alluring attractive offers one girl told me she owed it to this that she was a white slave she said she saw an advertisement in the paper for experienced servants for five dollars per week she was only getting three fifty she went and found out to her sorrow after a few days that she was a prisoner in a house of shame a life full of subtle and fierce temptation is the life of a stenographer and oh how many here are led astray by those who should protect them one will say what is a girl to do from all you have said she would not dare to go anywhere one of the most fascinating allurements of city life to many a young girl is the dance hall which is truly the anteroom to hell itself here indeed is the beginning of the white slave traffic in many instances a girl may in her country home have danced a little but here amid the blazing lights gaiety and so-called happiness she enters she is told she is awkward and will become more graceful no harm in it you know the rest had i a daughter or a sister one of the places i would warn her against when going to the city would be some of our large department stores not all thank god but alas too many of them many girls have a great desire and ambition to work in a store in the city unless it were a positive absolute necessity i would never allow her to do it unless i knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that she possessed great strength of character i hesitated in writing this but i felt i must or god would indeed hold me responsible for parents have no idea of the girls who are ruined behind counters when told the small salaries they will receive and the girl says oh i cannot live on that the answer is we will see to that we will provide another way for your support and there is begun the downward career fathers mothers did you ever stop and ask yourself how can these girls dress themselves the way they are required to nowadays in these stores and do it honorably on the salary that many of them receive it will bear investigation a serious cause for the downfall of many girls is the small wages which so-called christians are paying which is barely enough for mere existence one father not long ago after some striking warnings wrote saying that he had been aroused to inquire after his little girl her letters had been more and more infrequent he was a trifle anxious and wished her address looked up at a glance it was known at once where the girl was the location being the center of chicago's red light district when rescued it was a girl with a blighted pitifully wasted life a sad return indeed to the old home once a pretty pure innocent girl i find a majority of girls gone astray are from the country towns villages and hamlets there is need for the small communities to awake it is through the lack of education of the fathers and mothers along these lines particularly in the rural districts that satan has been aided in his onward evil march someone has said no reform will ever be successful till people know the truth 
until then there will be no decrease in vice the closed door of a father's home is the reason why many go deeper down in sin a sad mistake here many parents make refusing forgiveness when your child may have just made one mistake are all parents following the example jesus christ set before us there is a point in the girl's downward career just at the beginning that she may be rescued on the rebound as it were and untold suffering saved her for she is very tender at this time and easily influenced an instance of this and the steps by which the girl travels downward is found in that of a very dear sweet girl brought up in a christian home whom i found recently trouble at home a year and a half ago and she left her father forgave her and corresponded with her the mother would not she worked about a year with a prominent firm then in a department store through illness she lost her position tempted in different ways going to a high-class wine room so called then on the stage as a chorus girl she did not enjoy it suffered all the time finally through god's own way lost this place found her in the hospital weak but able to leave but nowhere to go but the hotel life i took her to friends and a happier girl you would seldom find especially to receive a letter from mother telling her to come home she could scarcely wait and her one cry was to see my mother we were able to have her return to her home in one of the neighboring states rescued just at the danger point not a bad girl but naturally innocent unused to these hard experiences some will say what is a girl to do must she be deprived of all pleasure for from what you have said it is not safe for a girl anywhere i do not wish to hinder any girl from attaining her desire and ambition or having pleasure but i do say with all the force i can command that all these things spoken of yes and many many more all are serious and great dangers which when a girl is just starting out in life ignorant of all this if unguarded against will be her ruin discretion and wisdom must be used and if so there are plenty of places where a girl can find amusement which is pure holy elevating and uplifting most of the danger is hidden and our object is to bring to light these secret lurking places and expose them to the gaze of an alarming public many go through safely in answer to a mother's prayers warnings advice and careful watching of dear ones thus being firmly established in character and morality if one seeks to walk with their whole heart in the straight and narrow way these dangers will be avoided on the street on the street on the street to and fro with weary feet aching heart and aching head homeless lacking daily bread lost to friends and joy and name sold to sorrow sin and shame wet with rain and chilled by storm ruined wretched lone forlorn weak and wan with weary feet still i wander in the street on the street on the street still i walk with weary feet lonely mid the city's din sunk in grief and woe and sin far from peace and far from home no one caring where i roam no kind hand stretched forth to save no bright hope beyond the grave feeble faint with weary feet still i wander on the street end of chapter seven our sister of the street Chapter 8 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in January 2022. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell. 
Chapter 8 More About the Traffic in Shame by Mrs. Ophelia Amig, Superintendent of the Illinois Training School for Girls. One of the most disheartening things in the work of protecting innocent girls and restoring to useful lives those who have been betrayed from the path of right living is the blind incredulity of a very large part of the public. There are hundreds of thousands of women in the homes of this country who know as little of what is going on in the world, so far as the safety of their daughters is concerned, as so many children. They are almost marvelously ignorant of the terrible conditions all about them, and all about their children, too. Of course, their blindness to these awful actualities makes them more comfortable, for the time being, than they could possibly be if awake to the perils which beset the feet of their daughters and the daughters of their friends and neighbors. But there is no permanency to this sort of peace, and thousands of mothers of this class are annually brought to their senses and recalled to earth by discovering that their own daughters have made the fatal misstep and have passed under the brand of the pariah. The awakening of such parents comes too late, generally, to do much good. Not always, but in the majority of cases— Many, many times, after I have related to a casual woman visitor the simple details of a typical case brought here to the state home, the caller has exclaimed, How terrible! I didn't dream that such things were going on in the world. Now, if you had something of great value which needed to be protected day and night, would you select for such a task a blind watchman? or one who was firmly possessed of the idea that there was really no danger, no occasion for watchfulness? Certainly not. There is nothing in the world of such priceless value to a father or a mother as the honor, the purity, the good character of a daughter. No parent will possibly question this statement. And still there are many thousands of parents entrusted by Providence with the safekeeping of this priceless treasure, who are themselves in the position of discharging that great responsibility with closed eyes, with dull ears, and with a childish belief that there is no real peril threatening the safety of their daughters. These parents do not live on earth. Their heads are in the clouds, and their ears are filled with the cry of, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. As one whose daily duty it is to deal with wayward and fallen girls, as one who has had to dig down into the sordid and revolting details of thousands of these sad cases, for I have spent the best part of my life in this line of work, let me say to such mothers, In this day and age of the world no young girl is safe, and all young girls who are not surrounded by the alert, constant, and intelligent protection of those who love them unselfishly, are in imminent and deadly peril. And the more beautiful and attractive they are, the greater is their peril. The first and most vital step for the protection of the girls who walk in this path of pitfalls is to arouse the sleeping watchmen who are, by reason of their parenthood, responsible for the safekeeping of their daughters. This is why the White Slave Articles by Honorable Edwin W. Sims and others, which have been published in the woman's world, have done great good. They have stirred to a sense of alarm thousands of parents who were asleep in a false sense of security. If they accomplish nothing beyond this, they will fully have justified their publication. But it is evident that they will also result in the enactment of much-needed legislation, of laws which will make it easier to convict and punish those who live from this foul traffic in the shame of girls, whose natural protectors are asleep in this false sense of security. Of course, practically every state has some laws against that traffic, but I do not know of any state in which the laws now on the statute books are adequate to deal with the situation as it should be dealt with. One of the things which comfortable and trusting parents seem to find especially hard to believe is the point upon which both the United States District Attorney Sims and his assistant, Mr. Parkin, have placed so much stress, the existence of an active and systematic traffic in girls. There is no safety for the daughter of any parents who are not awake and alive to the actuality of this fact. It is one of the satisfactions of my life 
to reflect that I have been one of the agents in sending a dozen, perhaps more, persons to the penitentiary for participating in this traffic. The dragnets of the inhuman men and women who ply this terrible trade are spread day and night, and are manipulated with a skill and precision which ought to strike terror to the heart of every careless or indifferent parent. The wonder is not that so many are caught in this net, but that they escape. I count the week, uh, I might almost say the day, a happy and fortunate one which does not bring to my attention, as an officer of the state, a deplorable case of this kind. Just to show how tightly and broadly the nets of these fishers for girls are spread, let me tell of an instance which occurred from this institution. This girl, whom I will call Nellie, is a very ordinary-looking girl, and below the average of intelligence, but as tractable and obedient as she is ingenuous. She is wholly without the charm which would naturally attract the eye of the white slave trader. Because of her quietness, her obedience, and her good disposition, she was, in accordance with the rules of the institution, permitted to go into the family of a substantial farmer, out in the west and work as a housemaid a hired girl her wages to be deposited to her credit against the time when she should reach the age of twenty-one and leave the home she had been in her position for some time and was so quiet and satisfactory that one sunday when the family was not going to church the mistress said nelly if you wish to go to church alone you may do so the milk wagon will be along shortly and you can ride on that to the village and here is seventy-five cents you may want to buy your dinner and perhaps some candy when nelly reached town and was on her way past the railroad station to the church the train for chicago came in and the impulse seized her to get aboard go to the city and look up her father whom she had not seen for several months she went to the city and had hardly stepped from the train into the big station when she heard a man's voice saying why hello mary instantly foolishly of course she answered him and replied my name's not mary it's nelly oh you look the very picture he responded of a girl i know well whose name is mary and she's a fine girl too are any of your folks here to meet you no she answered my father's here in the city somewhere but he doesn't know i'm coming i've been working out in the country for a long time and i didn't write him about coming back her answers were so ingenuous and revealing that the man saw that he had an easy and simple victim to deal with therefore his tactics were very direct it's about time to eat he suggested and i guess we're both hungry you go to a restaurant and eat with me and perhaps i can help you find your father quicker than you could do it alone she accepted and in the course of the meal he asked her if she would not like to find a place at which to work i know of a fine place in blank city he added the woman is looking for a good girl just like you yes i'd be pleased to get the place but i haven't any money to pay the fare with was her answer oh that's all right he quickly replied i'll buy your ticket and give you a little money besides for a cab and other expenses the woman told me to do that if i could find her a girl she'll send me back a check for it all after he had bought the ticket and put her aboard the train going to blank city he wrote the name of the woman to whom he was sending her gave her about two dollars extra and then delivered this fatherly advice to her you're just a young girl and it's best for you not to talk to anybody on the train or after you get off don't show this paper to anybody or tell anybody where you're going it isn't any of their business anyway and as soon as you get off the train you'll find plenty of cabs there hand your paper to the first cab driver in the line get in and ride to mrs a s home pay the driver and then walk in believing that she was being furnished a position by a remarkably kind man the poor girl followed his directions implicitly and landed the next day in one of the most notorious houses of shame in the state of illinois outside of chicago how she was found and rescued is a story quite apart from the purpose which has led me to tell of this incident that of indicating how tightly the slave traders have their nets spread for even the most ordinary and unattractive prey they let no girl escape whom they dared to approach 
it may be well and to the point to add however that two other girls who had been in care of the state home were found to be in the same house to which the girl had been lured and they were also recovered almost at the beginning of my experience i received a penciled note which i have kept on my desk as a stimulus to my energies and my watchfulness along the line of checkmating the work of the white slavers it is very brief and terse but what a story it tells here is a copy of it with the substitution of a fictitious name ellen holmes has been sold for fifty dollars to madame blank's house at blank armour avenue the statement was true and the man who sold her and the woman who bought her were both sent to the state penitentiary as a penalty for the transaction another fact which the public finds hard to believe especially the public of mothers is that girls who are lured into the life of shame find it impossible to make their escape and that they are prisoners and slaves in every sense of the word i recall one instance of a girl from a good home who had fallen into the hands of a white slave trader and been sold to a house in the red light district her people were frantic over her disappearance and made every possible effort to locate her but without success several months after the excitement and publicity aroused by her disappearance died away a newsboy who had delivered papers at her home which was in a very good residence district of the city happened to be passing along the cross street of a red light section just on the fringe of it in fact suddenly he heard a tap on the window looked up and saw the anxious face of the lost girl then she disappeared knowing the story of her strange disappearance he hurried straight to her home and told of his experience instantly the father secured officers and the little newsboy led the posse back to the house in the window of which he caught a glimpse of her face they raided the place and rescued the girl the story of the terrible treatment which she had received cannot be told here it is enough to say that she had been held as a captive imprisoned as much as any inmate of a penitentiary is imprisoned and that if the friendly newsboy had not happened to pass as he did the window from which she was looking out she would undoubtedly be there to-day or in some other similar prison of shame through the process of exchange one other matter in this connection needs to come in for clear and decisive emphasis the fact that the runaway marriage is the favorite device of the white slaver for landing victims who could not otherwise be entrapped these alleged summer resorts and excursion centers which are well advertised as gretna greens and as places where the usual legal and official formalities preliminary to respectable marriage are reduced to a minimum are star recruiting stations for the white slave traffic i have never seen this point brought out with any degree of clearness in any article and i earnestly urge all mothers to give this statement the most serious consideration and never to allow a daughter to go to one of these places on an excursion or under any pretext whatever unless accompanied by some older member of the family and even then there is something unwholesome and contaminating in the very atmosphere of such a place do you think i overstate the perils of places of this kind of these gay excursion centers these american gretna greens i hesitate to say how many girls i have had under my care who were enticed into a runaway marriage at these places and then promptly sold into white slavery by the men whom they had married the men who married them for no other purpose than to sell them to the houses of the red light district and live in luxury from the proceeds of their shame let every mother teach her daughter that the man who proposes an elopement a runaway marriage is not to be trusted for an instant and puts himself under suspicion of being that most loathsome of all things in human form a white slave trader End of chapter 8. More about the traffic in shame. Chapter 9 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
fighting the traffic in young girls or war on the white slave trade by ernest a bell chapter nine the traffic in girls by charles nelson crittenton president of the national florence crittenton mission Twenty-six years ago in New York City, when I first began to feel an interest in unfortunate girls and established the first Florentine Crittenton home, now known as the Mother Mission, one of the things which surprised and impressed me most in coming close in touch with the subject was that almost every girl that I met in a house of sin was supporting some man from her ill-gotten earnings. Either the man was her husband, who had driven her on the street in order that he might live in luxury and ease, or else he was her paramour, upon whom, with a woman's self-forgetful devotion, she delighted to shower everything that she could earn. In addition to this form of slavery, I also found that the majority had to pay a certain percentage of their earnings to some individual or organization who had promised them immunity from arrest and to whom they looked for protection. These were well-recognized facts. Every policeman and every judge of the police court knew the true conditions, and no one thought of denying them. Although frequently the poor girls would be kept at their trade by slaps and blows and threats of death, the authorities would contend that they were willing slaves and that they therefore deserved no consideration or sympathy. But when we began to get closer to the hearts of the girls and know their true history, we discovered that the commencement of this form of slavery had been even in a baser form, that before the girls had become so-called willing slaves, they were unwilling slaves. Many of them had fought for their liberty and had submitted only because they had been overcome by superior force. Some of them had been drugged, others kept under lock and key until such time when either their better nature had been drugged into unconsciousness or hardened into a devil-may-care recklessness. Some had had their clothes taken from them, others had been cajoled into quietness by promise of great rewards or by intimidation, which, with this young and inexperienced class, is one of the most potent methods. But when we, who knew, made these statements, people began to think those interested in the welfare of these girls were going too far, that no such conditions existed. They pointed to the fact that it was beyond human possibility. Many times in those early days, when I would talk to my friends and business associates and tell them of the conditions which existed in New York City, although upon ordinary subjects they had the greatest respect for my truthfulness and conservativeness, having known me in business for a good many years, they would look at me with pity for my misguided opinions, while they would mildly express unbelief at my statement to my face. When they got behind my back, they would shake their heads and say, Crittenton has gone crazy. Do you know he even believes now that girls are held in slavery in New York City against their wills for immoral purposes? but I have been familiar with so many cases of this form of slavery that they are too numerous even to recall. I remember well one night being on one of the streets in Lower New York when a girl came down a flight of steps leading from a disreputable house where rooms were rented. At the foot of the steps stood a man waiting to receive her earnings. As she stepped upon the pavement in full light of the gas above the entrance, she handed him the money. He looked at it, and finding it was less than he expected or needed, with a terrible oath he felled her to the ground and said, I will show you how to bring me such a little amount of money as this. You ought to have gotten a great deal more. Among those who came to take shelter at the Florence Crittenton home in those early days were beautiful twins, not sixteen years old, from a country village. We called them Mary and Martha. Both of them had been brought to New York under a promise of marriage and sold into a life of sin. We did all we could to free them from their masters, but it was impossible. They were determined that they would not be robbed of their prey, which was so valuable a financial investment. Time and time again they were hunted down by their masters and lost their positions through the interference of these men. 
in two years one of the girls died from the mistreatment and shame she had endured it is not unusual for me to see the other one in new york whenever i am there still under the bondage of her so-called husband and for her to tell me that it is no use trying to escape long since she has given up all hope and that she expects to die where she is earning money to supply her master with the luxuries of life by selling her poor little body among the many methods used by these fiends in human form to trap girls into houses of sin is courtship and false marriage these men go into the country districts under the guise of commercial men board at the best hotels dress handsomely cultivate the most captivating manners and then look for their prey upon the streets they see a pretty girl and immediately lay plans to become acquainted then the courtship begins there was never a time when the bars were so low with the public dance or even the more exclusive german the skating rink and the moving picture arcades all of which lend themselves to making of intimate and promiscuous acquaintances under questionable surroundings it is easy for a man to come into a community and in a few days meet even the best class of girls to say nothing of the girls who were earning a living and who have no home influence these girls are flattered by the handsome well-dressed stranger paying them marked attention and are quick to accept invitations to the theatre or to walk or to drive with them if the girl is religious he is not above using the cloak of religion expressing fondness for church and prayer meetings and is frequently to be found at such places when the girl's confidence and affection have been won it is a comparatively easy thing to accomplish her ruin by proposing an elopement her scruples and arguments are easily overcome by the skilled deceiver and trusting him implicitly as her accepted lover she unwittingly goes to her doom when they arrive in the city a mock marriage is performed for there are accomplices on every hand and the child wife is taken into a house of sin where she has been told by her pretended husband is an elegant boarding-house can you imagine any greater horror than that of this trusting child wife when she realizes she is a prisoner and a slave in that den of shame and such slavery the blackest that has ever stained human history shut up beyond the reach of friends for no letter she may write finds its way beyond the doors of her prison house should she call a police officer the chances are he is receiving bribes from her keeper and he will not help her to freedom is it strange that soon she eagerly drinks the wine that is constantly offered her and sometimes actually forced down her throat and smokes the cigarette with its benumbing effect of opium and tobacco so that under the influences of these fatal drugs she may forget her awful fate and hasten her early death for surely no hell in the other world can be more dreadful than a house of shame in this world and then good women and good men who see her poor painted face later peering out between the lace curtains of her dread abode or if meeting her on the street draw away from her and say oh i guess she is there because she wants to be this expression is one of the reasons that this condition has existed so long unchanged it is frequently made because of the ignorance of the general public upon the subject but the thought that when one sees a woman in a life of sin she is there because she likes it and wants to be has become so deeply engraved upon the human mind that it is difficult to change it some people are conscientious in thinking this because they are ignorant others know better but in order that they may not feel called upon to take an active part against these conditions try to salve their conscience by saying that a fallen girl cannot be helped nothing can be done for them and so it goes anything to remove the responsibility of bettering conditions from their shoulders but today we are facing a very different condition from that which has existed ever since i have been interested in rescue work and for centuries before 
the international agreement for the abolition of the white slave traffic between the civilized nations of the world which was entered into some ten years ago by all the civilized nations except the united states and which was subscribed to by the united states last june has put an entirely different aspect upon the whole subject the abolition of the white slave traffic is now no longer to be considered as a feverish dream of enthusiastic reformers but its effacement has become a part of the great international agreement between nations of the world and takes its place along with other great international questions which are adjudicated by the same process the recent splendid immigration laws which have been passed by the united states protecting immigrant girls until they have been in this country three years has been the law under which most of the cases of white slave traffic have been prosecuted the records of the federal courts wherever the authorities have taken cognizance are full of the records of cases which have been brought to trial many of the guilty parties have been prosecuted and are now behind prison bars others are awaiting trial and many others have escaped because of the difficulty of getting people to testify against them one of the most dangerous leaders in the traffic has recently forfeited handsome holdings of real estate in chicago which she had put up for her bond and escaped to france although fleeing from the united states into france which is also one of the countries cooperating in the abolition of the white slave trade her passion for the business was so great that when recently arrested in france under a similar charge she was found to have several young women from america in her clutches but as this law protects only immigrant girls all the cases brought have been in the interest of these foreign girls thus far no one has undertaken to prosecute the offenders against american-born girls but when the curtain is drawn back upon the iniquitous system in which they have been the victims a new chamber of horrors will be opened to the public gaze but thank god good will follow as is always the case when the light is turned on already laws have been presented before a number of state legislatures looking to the prosecution of those guilty of this inhuman traffic in native-born girls and it will not be long before every state in the union will have laws under which they can prosecute any man or woman guilty of this crime one of the great troubles in fighting this evil is the prejudice against fallen girls and the fact that because a woman is fallen seems to be just cause to convict her of every other crime in the decalogue thus removing her from the pale of helpful sympathy which is extended to almost every other class of unfortunate beings even convicted murderers and kidnappers are treated with more intelligent sympathy every statement which she makes is at once considered to be untrue so far has this prejudice gone that in the state of missouri in a decision by its supreme court made some years ago it was declared that a woman of immoral life was disbarred from giving testimony in the courts of that state as the fact of her immorality prevented her from being a credible witness it declared at the same time that immorality did not in the same way unfit or debar a man the difficulty of convicting a person under trial for such a crime as this is largely increased because of this attitude of the public mind the evidence must be so overwhelming against the person that all of the quibbles and questions and flaws which is possible for the human mind to make are answerable and even then many will feel the guilty person has been unjustly punished and that if the girl had really wanted to make her escape from her captors she could have done so the prosecuting of any other character of cases where the sex question does not enter is very much easier take the two last cases of kidnapping which have interested the entire public and press of the country as an example of what i mean in the well-known philadelphia case of nineteen o eight in which an unusually bright boy of ten years was the victim it was found that the kidnapper a man had taken the boy with him to lunch at several restaurants had left him alone for hours in a vacant house from the window of which he might at any moment have called to a passer-by and told him of his sad plight had even sat several hours with him in the crowded broad street station in philadelphia 
and yet with all of these opportunities of making his trouble known and escaping from the clutches of the man the boy had taken advantage of none of them but had sat silent and apparently a willing victim in spite of these extenuating circumstances it only took the jury a few moments to convict and send the guilty man to the penitentiary for a long period had the boy been a girl and had she not made any more effort than he did to escape from her captor and had the fact been known that the man had taken advantage of her innocence not only to kidnap her but also rob her of her virtue it would have been absolutely impossible to convict him of kidnapping a recent case prosecuted in baltimore of a similar character with these added features proves the truth of this statement the child being a girl eleven years old the man was given a sentence of twenty-one years only and that upon the ground of the child being under the age of consent even this verdict was considered extreme by many who believed that the child was willing to go with him because she had written a letter to her father and mother in which she had not complained of ill treatment it was proven that the little girl was made to write the letter by the man who took it out and mailed it himself and who forced her to write just what he said had little billy whitlub been a little girl and it was proven that she had sat in a buggy and taken candy and accepted favors and had been perfectly happy as a child might with her captor it would have been a very much more difficult case to prosecute than that when the victim was a boy in one the sex question would almost certainly have been introduced to the further undoing of the punishment for the crime such work as the woman's world is doing as well as the ladies home journal and other well-known magazines in giving publicity to these facts will be of inestimable value in the protection of youth soon it will be impossible for human ingenuity to devise schemes for the undoing of girls that have not already been exposed by the daily papers and magazines thus warning girls and their parents or guardians of the conditions under which they are placed had this information been given to the mothers alone many of them are so ignorant of the present conditions that they would not have seen the necessity of informing their daughters but coming as it does through the avenues of daily reading it reaches the daughter as well as the mother thus giving her the knowledge gleaned at a frightful cost by others to protect her End of chapter 9chapter 10 of fighting the traffic in young girls this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by leslie langston fighting the traffic in young girls or war on the white slave trade by ernest a bell chapter 10 Warfare Against the White Slave Trade by Clifford G. Rowe, Assistant State's Attorney of Cook County, Illinois. There is a problem of slavery today for the people to solve. The question is, how shall warfare against white slavery be waged to blot out this cloud upon civilization expeditiously? Over two years ago, I learned that there was a gigantic slave trade in women and with a handful of people we began to fight the traitors. That a system of slavery, debasing and vile, had grown to enormous proportions before our very doors seemed beyond belief, an impossibility, and even romantic. Most people were skeptical of the existence of a well-defined and organized traffic in girls, and they seemed to think that those advocating the abolition of this nefarious trade were either visionists or fanatics. The struggle against this trade in women was a hard one at first. The ministry, although dazed, were finally aroused to an appreciation of the truth. Having faith in the people, and believing that this republic lauds and honors the chastity and sanctity of women, I believed in bringing this hideous traffic in girls to the public notice, and when our citizens fully realized its importance, they would rise to the occasion and aid in the warfare to exterminate white slavery. The result has been most gratifying, for churches, clubs, 
associations, newspapers, men and women in all walks of life have taken up the cause. Great armies like those of a generation ago cannot uproot this slavery, but the slavery of today must be eliminated by publicity, education, legislation, and law enforcement. That is the reason magazines have brought their readers facts concerning this hideous trade. The results of this heroic work have been wonderful for thousands of letters inquiring about white slavery have been received and associations and clubs have formed to fight white slavery and legislation upon the subject has been introduced in many states. If this great good to our social life could not be brought about by publicity, there would not be any reason for bringing before the people and into the midst of the family circle facts which are so black and revolting. But to know and understand, we must cast aside false modesty, take off our kid gloves and handle this great social problem with our naked hands. The trade in women is domestic and foreign, local and international. The Honorable Edwin W. Sims, United States District Attorney at Chicago and Harry A. Parkin, his assistant, have been waging valiant warfare against the foreign and international trade during the past year. Articles in leading magazines which were written by them have dealt chiefly with that phase of the white slave trade. They have explained also the debt system as a means of keeping the girls in resorts after they are procured and sold. It is with the domestic and local trade I have been mostly concerned. In Chicago alone, there are more than 5,000 women leading a life of shame, and statistics show that the average life of a fallen woman is five years. 1,000 persons must, therefore, be recruited every year in Chicago alone. How many voluntarily go into this life? It is estimated about 40%. This shows us that 60% are led into it by some scheme or entrapped and sold, and at least two-thirds of this number are from our own country, being inveigled from farms, towns, and cities. One may inquire, how is it that girls are procured so easily without the public being aware of what is going on? The answer is that love and ambition are the baits which the procurers flaunt in the faces of their proposed victims. Often it happens that promises of positions on stage in stores and various occupations alluring to young girls cause many to fall, captives in the great net set for them. During the past two years, there have been more than 250 white slave cases tried in Chicago under the Illinois law, resulting in scores of confessions made by the procurers and statements by hundreds of the girls who were procured as to the methods employed by the traders. To show how easily it is done, let me tell you a story of a girl from Elgin, Illinois, who was caught by the love scheme. One day this pretty little German lass was in a Chicago store buying sheet music when a well-dressed, handsome young man, apparently looking at music too, asked her the names of some of the latest popular songs as he wanted to buy them. At first, she turned away and did not heed him, but he was not to be repulsed, and pressing his attentions further upon her, he finally engaged her in conversation. A luncheon at a nearby restaurant in which she joined him was the result, and there he told her how at first sight he had fallen in love with her beauty. After lunch, he suggested a visit to his bachelor apartments, but this she refused. Seeing that this plan was a failure, he asked her to marry him then and there. The silly girl, believing he loved her and enchanted by the picture he had painted of his father's wealth and fine home in New York City, consented, and they were married. After the ceremony, he told her that he was about broke and said that he would take her to a place where she could make enough money in a few days to pay their way to New York, where everything would be lovely, and as they were married, it would be no one's business how she got the money. Immediately, accounts of white slave procurers which she had read came to her mind, and then she realized what she had fallen into. 
Lest she might arouse in him suspicion, she consented to do as he asked, but told him that before going out to the resort, she wanted to buy some clothing and arranged to meet him at a certain downtown corner toward evening. She hurried to the county court, where an escort was given her, and she was brought to the court where I was prosecuting. I armed an officer with a warrant, and he followed the girl to the appointed place of meeting. The young man was there waiting for his victim. The officer stepped up and put him under arrest, and the next day he was tried and convicted. It was then learned that he was a well-known procurer of girls. Thus saved from a life of ruin, the Elgin girl went home heartbroken but wiser for her experience. Recently, she secured in the county court an annulment for the marriage. Inquiry proved that the girl was from a very respectable home and that she had always been a good, honest, industrious girl. Many similar cases have come out in the courts. However, the girls in most instances were not favored by the same good fortune which blessed the little girl from Elgin, and the outcome was much more disastrous. This is an illustration of the ease with which these panderers make use of love as a means of securing girls for immoral houses. The other method used by the traders is one which appeals to the girls' ambitions. Sometimes the procurers have gained the parents' consent to allow their daughters to accompany the supposed theatrical or employment agent, as the case may be to some city, thinking that through the daughter's success, their station in life would be raised. A girl in a country community or, say, factory town is working for four or five dollars each week when one of these procurers, traveling under the guise of an agent, meets her and promises ten to twenty dollars a week for work in the city. She may be perfectly sincere and honest in her intention to better her condition, she may want finer clothes, a wider knowledge of the world, or an education. And so she consents to go with him, and finally, against her will, ends up as an inmate in some immoral place. One of the most recent cases shows how readily girls jump at an opportunity to better their station in life. This case first came before the court the day after Christmas, when Frank Kelly was arrested for carrying a revolver with which he tried to shoot an old man. During the trial, the story developed as follows. A year ago, last summer, 15-year-old Margaret Smith was working about the simple home near Benton Harbor, Michigan. The father, employed by the Pear Marquette Railroad, was away from home a good share of the time. One day, a gramophone agent called at the house, and the family became much interested in one of his musical machines. Shortly afterward, this agent brought with him to the Smith home Frank Kelly and introduced him to Maggie, as she was called by her folks. In a day or two, Margaret was on her way to Chicago with Kelly, who promised her an excellent position in the city. Upon her arrival, Margaret was sold into one of the lowest dives in Chicago, located in South Clark Street and owned by an Italian named Battista Pizza. Here, she learned that her captor was not Frank Kelly, but an Italian, whose real name is Alphonse Citro. For a year, she was kept as a slave in this resort, which was over a saloon, and the entrance was through a back alley. The only visitors were Italians, who came for immoral purposes. Learning last summer that Margaret's father, who had been hunting relentlessly for his daughter, was on the track of her. The girl was taken by Alphonse Citro, alias Kelly, to Gary, Indiana. When the father came to the resort with a policeman, he found that his daughter had gone. She was kept in Gary about two months, then returned to this disreputable place, from which she escaped, finally, the Monday before Christmas. A young barber took pity on her after hearing her sad story and enlisted the sympathy of his parents, who took her to their home. Alphonse Citro, Kelly, looked for her for almost a week and at last saw her going from a store to this home where she was staying. He went to the house and demanded at the point of a revolver that she be given up, as he said, I am losing money every day she is gone. There was a quarrel over the girl, 
during which some people from the outside were attracted to the house by the commotion. Citro, becoming frightened, fled down the street and as he ran threw the revolver with which he tried to shoot the father of the barber during the quarrel over a fence into a coal yard. After running two blocks, he was caught and arrested. Upon these facts, the procurer, Citro alias Kelly, was prosecuted and found guilty under the new pandering law in Illinois and received a sentence of one year's imprisonment and a fine of five hundred dollars. The poor old father and mother, distressed and broken-hearted, were in court during the trial with their arms around each other, sobbing with joy because their little girl had been found. Pizza, the owner of the place, was indicted by the state grand jury but escaped to Italy. This case is only one of the hundreds which might be told to show how the girls leave home upon the promise of securing employment and are in this way procured for places of ill repute. The methods employed to entice young women are quite similar, but as to the particulars each case varies to some extent. After the girls are once within the resort, the stories are about the same. Their street clothes are seized and parlor dresses varying in length are put on them. They are threatened, never allowed to write letters, never permitted the use of the telephone, never trusted outside the house, without the escort of a procurer, until two or three months have elapsed when they are considered hardened to the life and too ashamed to face parents and friends again. If they should ask some visitor to the house to help them, would he care to expose his name to the police, as he would have to, by reporting the matter? Would he want his friends or the folks at home to know he had visited such a place? No, he would let the girl get out the best way she could, even though he might promise to help her. Girls are told of or perhaps have witnessed others who tried to escape, have seen their failure in punishment and thereby cowed into submission. They are always held upon the pretense of being indebted to the house, and this indebtedness has long been the backbone of the white slave system. From the time the girl is first sold into the house, she is constantly in debt. First, for the money the owner gave to the procurer for her, next, for her parlor clothes, then for the money her procurer borrows from the owner, on her as his property, goods and chattel. The bonds of slavery are thus fastened upon those poor mortals by a system of debt and vice that the people of this great country little realize existed until lately. Fighting against this slave trade under the archaic Illinois laws was quite disheartening because it was almost impossible to get more than a fine upon the charge of disorderly conduct. The laws were so full of loopholes that the traders laughed at the idea of being prosecuted. However, in Illinois at least, we have choked the laugh. The features, once wreathed in smiles, began to show the lines of worry and fear, for a new law called the Pandering Act has been passed. This went into force July 1, 1908. The new law is good, but experience has shown where improvement is necessary. Without exception, in cases I have tried, Certain wholesome-minded jurors have said, after concluding the case, that the penalty was too light for the first-time offender. It should be made more severe. Therefore, an effort is now being made to make the first offense punishable by imprisonment in the penitentiary from one to ten years. Then also, there should be a new law covering the bringing a female person of any age into the state or taking her out of the state for immoral purposes. The age limit should be omitted from the present Illinois law, which does not punish those bringing girls over the age of 18 into the state. While other states are sending for copies of the Illinois pandering and other white slave laws, the state legislation will soon be uniform upon this subject the United States government should be alive to the situation also. At present, it only has the immigration laws regulating the importation of immoral women to fall back upon. A federal law under the Interstate and Foreign Commerce Act should be passed at once. 
the federal government has better and more effective machinery for getting at the facts in the foreign and interstate traffic in girls than have the various states. Commerce consists in intercourse and traffic, including in these terms the transportation and transit of persons and property, as well as the purchase, sale, and barter of persons and property, and agreements therefore. A federal law might be enacted as follows. Be it enacted by the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that whoever shall procure, entice, or encourage any female person to leave one of the states of the United States of America to go into any other state in the United States of America for the purpose of prostitution, or to become an inmate of a house of prostitution, or to enter any place where prostitution is practiced or allowed, or shall attempt to procure or entice any female person to leave one of the states of the United States of America to go into any other state for the purpose of prostitution, or to become an inmate of a house of prostitution, or to enter any place where prostitution is practiced or allowed, or shall receive or give or agree to receive or give any money or thing of value for procuring or attempting to procure any female person to leave one of the states of the United States of America, to go into any other state in the United States of America for the purpose of prostitution or to become an inmate of a house of prostitution, or to enter any place where prostitution is practiced or allowed shall in every case be deemed guilty of a felony, and on conviction thereof be imprisoned not more than ten years and pay a fine of not more than ten thousand dollars. Under the recent federal decisions, what can prevent the enactment and enforcement of such a law making the traffic in women illegal? Of course, offenses committed solely within the state could not be reached by the federal government. Other needed legislative regulations concerning the white slave traffic, such as laws against the procuring system and the indebtedness system, have been set forth in other articles in this magazine. However, besides these laws, it will be necessary in each state to create a commission in the various cities other than the police department which shall keep a complete record of all houses of ill fame and their inmates. A public bureau of information should be established by law where parents and friends could easily learn the whereabouts of girls who have not been heard from, and this bureau should have the names of every inmate of a disreputable house. Such a commission should have the power to inquire carefully into the life of every girl. Statements should be made, under oath, and the right to ascertain whether or not these statements were true should be given the commission. Thereby, the infected spots in every part of the country should be covered, and every girl and woman in immoral places should be accounted for. The fact that this has not been done heretofore has greatly aided the slave traders, because their success is accomplished by secrecy. Let us drag the monster, white slavery, from underground and let the light of day show upon it, and then we shall have gone a long way towards extermination of this traffic. That secrecy is maintained as to who the girls are and where they are from is evidenced by one of the many letters I have received, of which the following is a copy. Chicago, Illinois, July 13, 1908. Mr. Clifford G. Rowe. Dear Sir, did you receive a letter from my mother, Mrs. Effie, blank, from Eloise, Michigan? If so, I wish you would come and see me so I can tell you everything. I have not been out of the house for three months. I have not got any clothes to wear on the street because I owe a debt. I wish you could come and see me and I can tell you everything then. I am a white slave for sure. Please excuse pencil. I had to write this and sneak this out. Please see this at once and help me 
and oblige. Viola, blank. With people passing back and forth on the street and in and out of the house every day, it seems astonishing that girls can be kept as slaves. However, the above appeal for help tells the story not alone of the writer, but of thousands of girls whose lives are being crushed, the minds depraved and the bodies diseased by outrageous bondage. It was discovered that Viola had been given a fictitious name. All avenues of communication with the outside world were cut off, and she had lived in constant fear of being beaten if she had let anyone know who she was. At last, through a ruse, she succeeded in getting letters to her mother and myself, which brought about her rescue and the return of the girl to her mother, who was an invalid in Wayne County Hospital at Eloise, Michigan. The owners of the resort where she was held were brought before the bar of justice, and the judge in sentencing them said, The levee resort keepers are murdering the souls of girls and women by binding them with ropes of illegal debt. This practice must be wiped out. The next question which confronts us is what we shall do with the girls after they are liberated from the houses. Some have parents. Some are ashamed to go back home, while others are diseased. Certainly, it seems a pity to turn them out and let them battle against the prejudice of a past life. Homes and institutions for girls are often filled or the doors are barred against fallen women. The solution of the problem is a home for white slaves in every large city in the country. Such a home should be well equipped with a hospital to cure disease contracted in disreputable houses, and then there should be schools in the Institute for training the girls for useful lives, where sewing, cooking, music, art, and other things are taught. In this way, the girls would be fitted to earn honest and wholesome livelihoods when they go out to face the world. Letters are sent me from all parts of the continent asking what can be done to help the white slaves. My answer is, form organizations everywhere to fight this traffic. Through these organizations, educate the girls in rural communities to be careful how they are enticed or persuaded to go to the cities. Demand proper legislation. Write the senators and representatives about it. In all places, see that the laws in regard to disorderly resorts are enforced that the foregoing proposed commission is established to help build homes for training the girls for better lives. What mockery it is to have in our harbor in New York the Statue of Liberty with outstretched arms welcoming the foreign girl to the land of the free. How she must sneer at it and rebuke the country with such an emblematic monument at its very gate when she finds here a slavery whose chains bind the captive more securely than those in the country from which she has come. What a travesty to wrap the flag of America around our girls and extol virtue and purity, freedom and liberty, and then not raise a hand to protect our own girls who are being procured by white slave traders every day. Some ministers have said that the subject is too black to present to their congregations. It is a problem, they said, for the public authorities and slum workers, not a question for the high-minded citizen. It is the hope that the readers of this book, who are church members, will suggest that their pastors aid in the struggle against white slavery, and that through them, people everywhere may be awakened to a realization of its importance. No social problem is too unclean for the people to take hold of. When the cause undermines the fairest heritage in life, our homes. For, after all, the home is the social unit and the very foundation of all government. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 11. 
The Boston Hypocrisy by Clifford G. Rowe, Assistant State's Attorney of Cook County, Illinois. None of us is perfect. However, it is well to strive toward perfection. It is well sometimes to look into the glass and see ourselves as others see us. That is the very thing Boston needs to do at the present time. Like the ostrich that hides her head in the sand and thinks because she cannot see anyone, no one can see her, Boston shuts her eyes to the social evil problem and says there is no such thing here. To learn whether or not the white slave traffic is nationwide, conditions in various parts of the country have been studied. From ocean to ocean, the trail of this monster can be seen. New York, Chicago, and San Francisco, and many other cities, realizing that there is a trade in the bodies and souls of girls, are making determined efforts to blot it out. They acknowledge its presence, and they are fighting it. In New England, it is different. The good people there shun the thought of such a subject. They have not learned that false modesty is a thing of the past, and the time has come when we must know the social evil problem as it is and meet it face to face. In talking with one of the leading workers for the betterment of Boston, the above title was suggested, for he said, The attitude of the people here regarding social evil is plain Boston hypocrisy. The idea is to hide the evil, if it is there. In this beautiful city, there is not a well-defined red-light district, or levy as the houses of ill fame are scattered throughout the city, often side by side with fine private residences. Here and there is a district where perhaps a dozen or more of the disorderly houses are located. An idea of the volume of the vice business in Boston may be estimated from one day in June, when an observer counted 130 men who entered a resort on Corning Street between the hours of 7 and 12 in the evening. A well-defined white slave trade is difficult to discover in a short time in any city. Citizens of Boston have not yet unearthed it. They say it is not there. They tell of an isolated case which happened a long time ago. Boston and other New England cities have all the elements which make a traffic in girls quite certain. By going to the very bottom and getting information from those who know the business from the ground up, who live in it and work in it, some very reliable facts have been gathered. Walking down Washington, Tremont, or Boylston streets in Boston at night, from, say, 8 until 10 o'clock, scores of girls are seen picking up fellows. Some are professionals, while others flirt just to have a good time, probably. In Providence, Rhode Island, where Miss Margaret H. Dennehy has revealed a white slave traffic, conditions are just as bad in regard to girls publicly displaying themselves as in Boston. This is the first symptom of something wrong, which any visitor cannot help but see. Now, let us look about the city a little and see what we can find. In Hayward Place, one half block from Washington Street, the main shopping street of Boston, under the very nose of one of the largest retail stores, are the H and the E, two places such as would only be tolerated in the lowest red-light district of any city. Girls, and many young girls, too, sit at the tables and solicit men. On Beach Street, one half block from Washington Street, is the D, a similar place, owned by a Frenchman. The P G on Sudbury Street is much worse than any of the others. The first three are within two blocks of Boylston and Washington Streets, the principal corner in Boston. One has but to pick up the telephone book and find the numbers there, of at least two hundred houses of ill repute. Chicago, one of the acknowledged centers of vice, does not tolerate that, nor can you find such places in the principal shopping districts of Chicago as those I refer to in the above paragraph. One of the most glaring examples of disorderly places, which the good citizens there overlooked, in the business district is the B House of Prostitution on Bullfinch Street, almost within a stone's throw of the State House and Capitol of Massachusetts. Taking the biography of 100 girls in disreputable houses at random, it was learned that about one-third come to Boston from Canada, mainly Nova Scotia. To one who has made a study of the white slave traffic, the first question, when one finds so many disorderly places, is, where do they get the girls from? 
Why do so many come from one locality? Is the supply equal to the demand? Are there enough persons entering into such a life voluntarily, each year, to keep the places going? The average life of one of these girls is about five years, according to the best statistics. Boston and the other New England cities have the cadet system, meaning men and boys living from the earnings of girls engaged in this unlawful business. Most cadets procure girls, and that is the question for New England to solve. Are the cadets there engaged in the business of trading in girls? It is said that a certain Bobby B., a well-known cadet in Boston, procured about 70 girls to be sent to Panama. A certain Lena D., who was born in Quebec, is known to be procuring girls from Lowell, Massachusetts, and the country districts, for a fast life in Boston. She, perhaps, is the greatest woman trader in human souls in New England. According to her own statement, she trains them to be wise. This woman once worked in Lowell in a shoe factory. The French, Jewish, and Italian procurers are not so much in evidence in New England as in other American cities. The coast cadets there are mainly Canadians. A new way of procuring girls has developed in Boston. Wayward girls, who have offended the law in one way or another, are placed on probation. The cadets go to the court records, find the girls' names who are on probation, and persuade them to run away in order to evade probation and to secure freedom from the probation officers. There are instances where these girls have been sent into houses of bad character at Lowell, Portland, Worcester, the Roadhouse of Quarterville, and other towns. While the white slave trade may not be as well developed in New England as in other parts of the country, to a certain extent it is there, and it is only to awaken the people to a realization of this fact that this article is written. Over two and a half years ago, Chicago was told that there was a white slave traffic, and the people were indignant. It seemed romantic and unbelievable. But Chicago knows it only too well today. Boston must be awakened in the same way. People will say it cannot be true. Indeed, it is hard to find, because secrecy is its success. It keeps hidden in the darkness. Someone in Boston will drag it out into the light, and we stand ready to aid in any way we can. White slavery is a system of making good girls bad, or bad girls worse. It is the modern method of men living from the loathsome earnings of disreputable women. Let me tell you of a 21-year-old girl in Boston. She was born in New York City. Her father is dead, and her mother is an actress. She is pretty and well-educated. This girl, by living a disreputable life, supports a Jewish cadet, who is coarse and vulgar, and who beats her when she fails to bring back to him as much money as he desires. Many of the girls come from or go to Washington. There seems to be a sort of an underground roadway between Boston and Washington, which many of these girls travel. Hundreds of these girls do not live in the disorderly houses, but have their own apartments and are summoned to the houses by telephone. The houses to which they are thus summoned are known as call houses. At these houses, descriptions of the various girls are kept as to height, complexion, etc. In examining the laws of Massachusetts relating to procuring, we find the same flaws which existed in Illinois and the other states before the passage of the pandering laws. In the Revised Laws of Massachusetts, 1902, Volume 2, page 1785, Section 2, the procuring must be fraudulent and deceitful, and the women must be unmarried and of chaste life. If the procurer marries the girl to circumvent the law, he cannot be prosecuted. If the girl makes one mistake in life, she cannot be protected from being procured. In many cities, the evidence in the cases shows that cadets are paid to marry girls by white slave traders so that prosecution may be avoided, and they may thus crawl through one of the many loopholes in moss-covered laws made before pandering became a curse upon civilization. Because a girl is not of chaste life is no reason she wants to become a prostitute. One wrong step and she is no longer chaste, and then we say, according to the law, let her shift for herself. We all make mistakes, so let us be charitable. The words, previous, chaste, life, 
should be erased from the law, and all female persons should be protected from the traitors. There are four ways of combating the white slave evil. Proper laws, regulating the procuring of girls, the enforcement of these laws, education as to this great social evil, and publicity, that is, finding the evil and then making it known. Let New England awaken and look about her, and she will catch the true spirit of this article, which is meant to be one of helpfulness and written only with kindest motives. Embellished with quaint landmarks and historical retreats dear to all the nation, and beautiful in its past, let it not live in this past alone, but be alive to modern ideas and agencies. There is one society, known as the New England Watch and Ward, with headquarters in Boston, which has begun to pierce into the hidden mystery of the traffic in girls. It is managed by able men, and its secretary, J. Frank Chase, is already on the trail of the white slave monster. Through this society, great efforts will be made, no doubt, in the near future, to eliminate whatever exists of this nefarious traffic in Boston. Let us hope the Boston people will meet this problem fearlessly, candidly, and honestly, and when they do, they will have gone a long way toward stamping out the worst evil of the age. End of chapter 11 Read by Nancy Cochran Gergen Gilbert, Arizona, January 25, 2023Chapter 12 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Winifred Asman. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls, or War on the White Slave Trade, by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 12. The Auctioneer of Souls, by Clifford G. Rowe, Assistant State's Attorney of Cook County, Illinois. Hear ye, hear ye, how much will ye give for a human being, body and soul? What is the soul worth? Nothing, cried the auctioneer. I throw that in with the sale of the body. That is the value the white slave traders place upon the soul of a girl when she is auctioned off to the highest bidder for a house of ill repute. For a few paltry dollars to the buyer of girls, not only is the body delivered to be ravished and diseased, but the soul is given over to be tortured and depraved. This is the price fathers and mothers are placing upon their daughter's souls when they think more of the money the daughter can earn by sending her away to work without careful regard as to where she is going or with whom she is going away. That is the price that false modesty, which is nothing more nor less than affected innocence, is placing upon human beings when people shun the thought of white slavery, because it has to do with the darker side of life. Nothing is more beautiful than an innocent girl. Nothing is more hypocritical than affected innocence. Nothing is grander than a pure home. Nothing is more loathsome than the sham glare and tinsel of a house of ill repute. Knowing the human weakness, the white slave trader makes capital out of the carelessness and ambition of the parents and the false modesty of the public, and thereby undermines innocence and steals the purity from the home. Many and various schemes are resorted to by these auctioneers of souls. It is because no set rule for inveigling their captives away from home has been followed that they have succeeded so long in baffling detection. The question of white slavery is economic as well as social. The condition of the working girl, the low salaries paid by employers, the desire for better clothes, and the great increase of the number of girls earning a livelihood contribute their share to the downfall of girls. All of these things are considered by the crafty trader who procures the girl to be auctioned into a life of slavery. Then, too, the confidence of the girl is gained by arousing her ambition or love. This is done by appealing to her vanity, by referring to her ability or her beauty. True it is that some girls go willingly to the block to be auctioned into a disreputable life, only to find later their terrible mistake. 
the system of making bad girls worse is just as vicious as making good girls bad, and all this is white slavery. The most worked method of securing the confidence by appealing to the ambition of the girl is by the stage or theatrical route. It is because so many girls are stage-struck nowadays that this method has been worked most successfully. Perhaps of all the cases that have been tried in nearly the last three years in Chicago, the girls who have been procured by inducements to go upon the stage outnumber all others. The slave trader represents himself as the agent of some theatrical manager, or perhaps as the manager himself. Going to a factory town, for example, he makes it his business to meet some girl who is working there, who he has learned is stage-struck. After the formalities of an introduction, which he secures in one way or another, he leads up to the subject by telling her that he is a theatrical man and is looking for new recruits. The girl is at once interested. She is naturally ambitious. She wants to better her condition in life. She doesn't suspect that a fiend with the heart of a devil is masquerading before her as the agent of some theatrical manager. He explains to her that if she will accompany him, she can make from $15 to $20 a week at the very start, and in a year she will be playing a part, and a year or so later she will possibly be leading lady. The picture is an alluring one to this young girl, for she is now making only perhaps $4, $5, or $6 a week, and the thought of securing such a large salary at the very start almost sweeps her off her feet. She is entranced by the beautiful picture that has been painted, and she goes, perhaps to a stage, from which she will never return. The trader often has the impudence and nerve to interview the parents of the girl and obtain their consent, knowing that he is hiding behind some fictitious name with little possibility of ever being apprehended. This was true in the case of a certain cadet who brought a little girl from Duluth, Minnesota. The girl was 17 years old. The parents gave their consent, thinking that through the girl's life upon the stage their position in life would be raised, and they sent the little girl on to Chicago with this man, bidding her Godspeed. The testimony in this case showed that under compulsion she wrote several letters to her parents, telling of her initial stage success, while the truth was that this man was a procurer and collecting toll upon the loathsome earnings of this girl, who was compelled by him to lead a disreputable life. He was convicted under the law for bringing a girl into the state under the age of 18 for immoral purposes and was sentenced to three years, and the girl was returned to the home of her parents. This only serves as an illustration of how easy it is to appeal to the girl's ambition, yes, even to that of a parent, in this nefarious business of securing girls to be auctioned as white slaves. Cases have been brought to light and facts uncovered, where even disreputable theatrical agents themselves have loaned their services to the white slave system. A case recent enough to be vividly recalled by the people of Illinois is that of two young girls who were working in one of the larger department stores of the city of Chicago. One day, a woman was at the counter where one of these girls was selling goods. The woman complimented the beauty of the girl, at once appealing to her vanity, and asked her how she would like to go upon the stage. The girl, who was Evelyn Kay, was overjoyed at the very thought, for only a few nights before she had been talking with her chum, Ida P., about becoming an actress. The bait that the woman had cast was readily grabbed at. The woman gave Evelyn a card with the address of a certain theatrical agent on it and instructed the girl to call there at a certain time. This she did, accompanied by her friend Ida. Arrangements were made and tickets procured, and the girls were soon on their way to Springfield, Illinois, headed for a disreputable resort, as the evidence in the case afterward showed. Had it not been for the interference of a good Scotch lady into whose house these girls had gone for lodging before making themselves known to their new employers, they would have been cast into a life far different from that which they had anticipated. The Scotch lady, learning their destination and knowing the reputation of the resort to which these girls had been sent, warned them of the danger they were in, and aided in sending them back to Chicago. 
While the case against this theatrical agent was pending, these girls, who were waiting to testify, were taken out of the city and secreted in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where after several weeks' hunt they were finally found and brought back to Chicago, and afterwards testified in the court to the foregoing facts. There are many other instances of girls being brought to the city, or taken from the city, upon the pretext of becoming embryo actresses. In the case of a certain ex-prize fighter, who was arrested during a raid upon one of the strongholds of white slavery, the evidence was brought to light that he, and another young man, procured a consignment of girls in the city of Chicago, presumably to take them out with a southern musical comedy road company. These girls were sent south, in company with a certain Myrtle B., and they ended up in a resort at Beaumont, Texas. Many other cases might be cited to illustrate how easy it is to secure girls to come to the city, or leave the city, under the guise of putting them upon the stage. Let it be understood, however, that in all of the cases tried, nothing has ever been hinted at that would involve any reputable theatrical manager or agency, and the procurers have never been really associated with theatrical managers in any way, but have always falsely paraded under the theatrical mask. Almost all positions alluring to young girls have been used to catch them in the great net these procurers have set for them. We can't blame the girls for being ambitious. We can't blame them for wanting to better their condition in life. And we can't blame them for falling prey to the white slave monster with its tentacles spread throughout the country, ready at every possible chance to clutch them within its grasp. We can only warn them to be more cautious, to investigate carefully before going away from home with people they do not know. Fathers and mothers are too negligent in this regard, and through their laxity and carelessness they have allowed their daughters to be entrapped. They should see to it that the girls, in going to the cities, are surrounded by honest and reputable acquaintances. In one case, they contributed directly to the procuring of their daughters by not writing a letter to them as they had promised. The girls, who had gone to the post office, turning away from the window downcast and disheartened, were approached by a young man who had noted their sad faces. He said to them, You appear to be in trouble. One answered, Yes, we expected a letter from home with some money, but we did not receive it. We have been here only two days and are without funds until we receive this letter. We did not get the positions we expected to get, and until we find work, we have no place to stay. The young man volunteered to find them work. They had fallen into the hands of a procurer ever on the watch and were sold into a disorderly house before they knew it, thinking it was at this place they were to obtain work. When the facts in this case were brought to light, the procurer had fled to New York City. Through funds advanced by one of the leading clubs of Chicago and some big-hearted police officers, the procurer was apprehended, extradited, brought back, tried, and convicted. Through the other well-known method, the procurer, by pretending to be in love with his victim, appeals to her vanity and is often successful. Pretending that it is love at first sight, and showering flattery upon the girls, they succeed in winning confidence and hearts by the easiest method in the world. In the early summer of 1907, Mona M., while working at the ribbon counter of one of the Chicago stores, fell in love with handsome Harry B. on sight. After an acquaintance of three days, she was willing to go away with him to be married. It was the sale of this girl into a disreputable house and her final escape that led to the unearthing of one of the headquarters of the white slave traders, and seven of them were arrested in one night, her procurer receiving the longest sentence of them all. The little Elgin girl mentioned in Chapter 10, on page 142 of this book, was caught by the love method in one day, and the very recent case in which two procurers and the man behind the scenes who had hired them, the white slave dealer, were all convicted, was an example of securing girls through pretended love. This, the first case under the amendment to the Pandering Act in Illinois, was severely fought in court by two of the men. One of the procurers, by the name of Louis B., made a confession, 
telling how the dealer in human souls had hired Jacob J. and himself to go about on the streets and catch girls to be turned over to immoral resorts. The testimony in the case in which they were found guilty will show how successful they were. Two 16-year-old girls, one picked up by a flirtation in one of Chicago's large summer amusement parks, were sold into captivity. This is one of the most appalling cases that has yet come to our notice. These girls were procured upon promises of marriage and a trip to New York, all of which was fine and grand to them. So many and varied are the ways of procuring girls that it is quite impossible to tell all of them. Employment agents have been convicted for sending girls out as house servants to immoral places for the ultimate reason of making them inmates in the house. The procurers have masqueraded as graphophone agents, as the sons of bankers, as detective agents looking for women detectives to work for them, and in a very recent letter received from a lady in Massachusetts, the story is told how she, as a country girl, went to certain photograph studios in Boston and found that this photographer was a procurer. In a letter setting forth very vividly her experiences, she says, There were girls whom he had found nice fellows for, and he would help me to find one and a possible fine marriage. I did not know then that I should have exposed him. She tells of how she eluded this man, and when she saw him on the streets afterwards in Boston, she would hurry into a store or a hallway and hide from him. She says, I found afterwards that was really his business, introducing girls that he met in a business way in different studies and other places. Through information received from letters and many other ways, we are constantly on the lookout for the procurer. One said in a confession, We use any method to get them. Our business is to land them, and we don't care how we do it. If they look easy, we tell them of the fine clothes, the diamonds, and all the money that they can have. If they are hard to get, we use knockout drops. His words express the whole idea of the girl auctioneer, any way to get them for sale. Schools for manicuring, houses for vapor and electric baths, large steamboats running between the city and summer resorts, amusement parks, the nickel theaters, the waiting rooms in the depots and stores are all haunts and procuring places for the white slave trader. A Chicago girl only a short time ago wrote to one of the daily papers of her experiences on a steamboat going out of Chicago and at one of the nearby summer resorts. Girls, look out for the pitfalls. Mothers and fathers, you can't afford to let your young daughters leave home with strangers unless you want to send them to ruin. You are unwittingly thereby aiding the white slave traders and aiding in your daughter's downfall. Train the daughters right at home, watch over them, and protect them, and know where they are going and with whom they are going away. They are worthy of your greatest and kindest consideration. Do not be too anxious to make money or for higher position in the social life at the expense of your daughter. Do not be over ready to cast off the burden of supporting your family by sending your daughter out to earn a livelihood at an early age, lest the price you get be the price of a soul. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 13. The White Slave Trade in New York City by a Special Contributor. There is no longer any doubt in the minds of the well-informed that there exists a great white slave trade in the city of New York. In a recent report by General Bingham, police commissioner, he said, This traffic is found to be of very large dimensions. There seems to be very slight difficulty in getting women into the country. The requirements of the immigration authorities are easily met by various simple subterfuges. The men who own these women are of the lowest class 
and seem to have an organization or at least an understanding which is national or even international in scope. We cannot get these men. If we could, the whole white slave trade would drop and the whole social evil be intensely ameliorated because these men work a regular trust. In commenting on this statement of the police commissioner, Mr. George Kibbe Turner has the following to say in the June number of McClure's magazine. Quote, if the interests of the prostitute are excellently safeguarded under the administration of the law by the magistrate's courts, the business of her political protector, the cadet, is doubly secure. At most, he is only subject to a six months penalty as a common vagrant, but practically speaking, he can never be arrested at all because the only valid evidence against him must come from the woman who supports him, who neither desires nor dares to protest against him. There are thousands of these men in New York City, and their convictions do not reach a score a year. To this might be added that no local authority ever got these men, and that the only successful prosecution of them, and the only one they feared, has been that started by the federal authorities in Chicago and New York during the past two years. The local politician has as yet no influence with federal courts in favor of prostitution. He delivers no important part of the votes that choose the federal authorities. End quote. General Bingham, in an article in Hampton's magazine for September 1909, says that he might have accepted bribes during his first year in office from gamblers, dive keepers, and other criminals amounting to $600,000 or even a million dollars. He thinks that the graft and blackmail of New York City amount perhaps to $100 million a year. He asks the question, who receives the graft? And answers, patrolmen, police captains and inspectors, employees in city offices, city officials, politicians, high and low share in it. But while the uniformed policeman is getting tens or hundreds of dollars for protecting a brothel, drinking, or gambling resort, the city officials and politicians are getting their thousands and hundreds of thousands through graft-yielding contracts and franchises in cash carefully conveyed or in other emoluments rendered them in every case for betraying the public, end quote. In the report of the Commission of Immigration of the State of New York, a commission created by the legislature of New York in 1908, the following statement is to be found regarding the white slave business in this state. Quote, in the state of New York, as in other states and countries of the world, there are organized, ramified, and well-equipped associations to secure girls for the purpose of prostitution. The recruiting of such girls in this country is largely among those who are poor, ignorant, or friendless. The attention of the commission has been called to one organization incorporated under the laws of New York State as a mutual benefit society with alleged purpose, quote, to promote the sentiment of regard and friendship among the members, and to render assistance in case of necessity, end quote. This society is, in reality, an association of gamblers, procurers, and keepers of disorderly houses, organized for the purpose of mutual protection in their business. Some of the cafes, restaurants, and other places conducted by the members are meeting places for those engaged in the business of importation. The organization includes a membership of about 100 residents of New York City and has representatives and correspondents in various cities of the country, notably in Pittsburgh, Chicago, and San Francisco. End quote. The commission has not, in the report, given very much of the detail of the working of this association, but Collier's Weekly, in speaking of the dismissal of General Bingham as police commissioner of New York, says... He has been police commissioner for three and a half years. Under his strong, rough hand, the disorderly houses which flourished so prosperously three years ago, imprisoning helpless immigrant women, have gone out of business. There were 100 of them running at full speed between 23rd and 69th Street and 6th and 9th Avenue. There are scarcely 20 now, and they are only operating for old-time patrons. The stranger inside the city walls 
will not find the easy welcome for his licentiousness which 1906 and 1907 could have given him. The profession of ruining, selling, and renting out girls has been reduced. That organization known as the New York Independent Benevolent Association has had its wings clipped. The gentlemen who run this association have been checked from their vile trade by the strict regime of Bingham. For two years, they have had to turn to honest or semi-honest professions instead of squeezing blood money out of little foreign girls raped by their agents and locked up in their chain of disorderly houses in the old and new tenderloin. They have almost forgotten the dark tragedies hidden just a fathom underground in their burial lot in Washington Cemetery, the poor murdered women, the infants one span long, end quote. While the immigration report in Collier's Weekly enter into little detail concerning the ramifications of this association, it is not because they have no further information regarding it, but because many of the details are so vile they could not be written. It can be said, however, that the 126 members of this association have operated in Newark, New Jersey, Philadelphia, in Pittsburgh, in Chicago, St. Louis, New Orleans, San Francisco, and other cities, that they have plied their trade in South Africa, in Panama, and that different members of the association have made repeated trips to Europe. This society has been in existence since 1896. In every large city in which an expose of the disorderly house element of the white slave traffic has been made, some of the members of that association have been involved. At the present moment, the graft investigation is going on in Chicago. One of the principal men indicted is Mike the Pike, who is well known in Philadelphia and New York. Some years ago, Mike was a prominent member of the organization, but quarreled with the officers and was expelled. Keller and Ullman, sent to prison by the federal authorities in Chicago for trafficking in white slaves, were members of this association at the time of their conviction by the government. Several others indicted, but never brought to trial, were also members. At the time of the great cleaning out of the disorderly elements in Philadelphia, many members of this association were driven out. Some of them went to New York, some to Newark. They plied their business in Newark for two or three years, and when conditions became so bad that the public rose in protest and started a movement to clean out the dens of vice, it was the members of this association who stood together and fought the authorities. However, some of their members were convicted and sent to prison. The chief of police and other officials were accused of having some partnership with these men and of levying graft upon them, much in the same way as the evidence in the present Chicago graft proceedings alleges. The then chief of police in Newark, who is alleged to have been one of the men who received money from these men, went out into one of the lonely byroads outside of the city and committed suicide by shooting himself. It has been said that some of these men were in South Africa, and it is an established fact that many of them went there and opened up houses of prostitution, but were finally expelled from the country by the British government. Some of them went to Panama, not in the Canal Zone, and opened houses there, and some of them at the present time are still doing business there. Collier's Weekly has mentioned the cemetery owned by these men. It is quite a large section of what is known as the Washington Cemetery. Some of the women buried there, all of them foreigners, were murdered. One of them was found, the body covered with bruises and blood, and an iron bar about 18 inches long covered with blood was found near her body. Two others were strangled to death. Another was found in an unconscious condition. A criminal operation had been performed which had not been successful. Several had died as a result of venereal disease. Some of the men died violent deaths. One was stabbed and died of blood poisoning. Another had his neck broken. The ages of the women varied. Some were 22, 23, 24, and 25 years of age. Few of them were more than that. Fifteen babies are buried here, most of them only a few months old. In two cases, coroner's inquests were held. In the cafes frequented by these men and owned by them, 
One hears the vice question in its relation to the whole country discussed. The Chicago graft investigation is being discussed now, and many guesses are made as to whether Mike really got the money or whether somebody put up a job on him. Anyhow, they all feel that Mike has distinguished himself by being so prominently connected with the men higher up. The association, unlike the French syndicate, imports very few women. They prey mostly on the ignorant immigrants who are already in this country in such large numbers. They are successful in securing nearly all the women they need in the large foreign centers here and are thus not under the necessity of paying the passage money of their victims to this country, but they do import some. Many of the members of this association are wealthy men. They own fine houses, automobiles, and some of them are credited with a great deal of political influence. When trouble comes to one of the members, the record of the society is kept straight by passing a resolution expelling the man from the society. At the same time, the association goes ahead and uses its money and influence to help the expelled member. Most of the members of the association come from Russian Poland and Galicia, Austria. Very many of the women in their houses come from the same countries. It is interesting at this point to note that a prominent paper in Warsaw claims that they have discovered a white slave society, which is practically a counterpart of the one in New York, with a difference that the Warsaw Society exports the women, whereas the New York Syndicate imports them. Some of the members of the New York Association are ex-criminals, having been convicted in their own country. Because of the strictness of the police in their native land, they have found it advisable to come to America. They still, however, have connections with men of their own class in those countries. When word comes to New York that a certain city or state is wide open, some members of the syndicate go to these places and open up business. They either take their women along or, after settling in a place, send to some trustworthy member and have their women brought on. Practically the only charge that the local authorities of New York can bring against these men is that of vagrancy, and no magistrate will convict on a charge of vagrancy when the alleged vagrant can show the deeds to property worth 20000 or $30,000. An incident of this kind actually happened in New York three years ago. The French syndicate, as far as is known, is not an incorporated body like the Jewish organization, but that they have an organization is not questioned for a moment by those who have investigated conditions in New York City. The federal authorities have broken up a house which was alleged to be the headquarters of the French Macaro. Most of the women deported by the federal authorities in New York have been French women, and most of the men arrested in this connection were also found to be of French extraction. The report of the police department for 1908 shows that out of 55 applications for warrants for alien prostitutes, 41 were arrested, 30 were ordered deported, and 26 were actually deported. Seven cases are still pending. Four were discharged, and the others left the country or disappeared. Out of 19 warrants for the arrest of the alien men, 11 were arrested, of whom four were sent to prison and ordered deported at the expiration of their sentence. Four were discharged. Two cases are pending, and one escaped. In most cases, the men and women were French. Owing to the vigilance of the federal authorities and cooperation of the police department, the French end of the business received a severe blow in the city of New York. Out of 400 French macaroe known to have women in houses, at least 300 left the city when the federal authorities began to secure convictions against some of their members. However, the decision given in the keller Ullman case by the Supreme Court declaring the law which gave the federal authorities power to imprison these men for harboring and maintaining women unconstitutional, the Frenchmen have taken heart and are coming back in increasing numbers to the city. There are many angles to the white slave business in New York. Many women are enticed into houses of ill fame by promises of marriage and by fake marriages. The cadet took a woman before a crooked notary public and went through a form of marriage, but failed to file the agreement thereof. 
thereby suppressing the evidence of marriage, the purpose being to aid procurers who sometimes marry several girls in their vile purposes of compelling these unfortunates to live lives of shame, to enable them to profit by their villainy. The Commission of Immigration found that this practice had been largely suppressed by the new law requiring a marriage license. These notaries now advise as to the best way the law may be circumvented. As an illustration, one notary agreed to perform a real marriage between an investigator of the commission and a supposed Swedish girl and to draw a contract transferring her property to the husband. The notary then advised the latter as to the best manner in which to make the new wife appear to have committed adultery so that the husband might be able to secure a divorce after having secured the girl's money. That many of these houses in New York City are run under the guise of massage parlors is well known. Many of the women in these houses are French. A paper is published in New York in which the names and addresses of these houses are advertised. Innocent women are lured by advertisements for operators. The publisher of this paper is a notary public and is always willing to advise his advertisers how to carry on their immoral business. One of the difficulties that the federal authorities have in putting a stop to the importation of these women into the country is the fact that very many of the women who have been actually intended for the disorderly houses are manifested to seemingly respectable people. These people, however, have some indirect connection with the business of prostitution. For instance, one man has what seems to be a perfectly legitimate and solid business as a manufacturer of women's clothes. However, his sole business is the supplying of that clothing to the disorderly houses throughout the country. It is said that women have come to work in his factory and have been turned over after many glittering promises have been made to them to some keeper of a disorderly house who made them inmates of his establishment. Some of the women go to work in restaurants where members of the association have some interest, and thus the way is made easy for an introduction to the woman with a subsequent result of finding her way into a disorderly resort. Some of the procurers in New York work through the employment agencies. Since May 1904, the Commissioner of Licenses has revoked 14 licenses of employment agents for sending girls to immoral places, of whom nine furnished immigrants chiefly. Nine other licenses were revoked for immoral conduct, eight furnished immigrants chiefly. The revocation of a license, however, is not an effective remedy since in no case have fines or imprisonment been imposed for this violation of the law. Nine agents whose licenses were revoked for this reason are still acting as employment agents or as runners for other employment agents, investigators for the federal authorities, and also of the State Commission of Immigration found agents in several sections of the city who are willing on payment of an extra fee to send girls to work in disorderly houses. The same thing may be said regarding some of the immigrant homes, which are ostensibly for the purpose of protecting foreign girls on arrival in the city of New York. The federal authorities in the State Commission found homes that sent women to disorderly places. The State Commission found one home that was willing, upon a donation of $5, to send a girl to work in a disorderly house. This donation seems not to have been recorded in the books of the home. Several other homes are at present under investigation by the Commissioner of Immigration at Ellis Island. Since 1901, the Sicilian, or Southern Italian, has played quite a prominent part in the great traffic in women in New York City. At that time, after his triumphant entry into the corrupt politics of the city, it was estimated that Italians controlled from 750 to 1,000 women. Gangs of Italian criminals have grown up in New York City as a great asset of the corrupt political machines. Men like Paul Kelly, Jimmy Kelly, and other Italians masquerading under Irish names play a prominent part in Tammany politics, supplying strong-arm men as repeaters in the elections, whom they recruit from the boxing and other athletic clubs with which they are affiliated. Jimmy Kelly manages one or two high-class pugilists, but around his saloon are to be found many preliminary boxers. 
These men cannot make a living as preliminary boxers and must depend on something else to eke out a livelihood. Through their connection with men like Kelly, they are given the protection necessary to enable them to conduct immoral resorts or to keep women soliciting on the streets without interference from the police. In return for this immunity, they help Kelly deliver the illegal vote necessary to keep the corrupt Tammany machine in power. The Italian, because he is more prone to crimes of violence, pays for his political protection and votes, while the Jew largely pays cash. The Italian, unlike the Jew, very rarely puts women of his own race into the awful life. There are relatively very few Italian prostitutes. The Italian traders seem likely to displace the French as they are kinder to the women and they adapt themselves to the political environment in a way that the French do not understand. We quote again from Mr. George Kibb Turner in McClure's magazine for June 1909, quote, The Jew makes the most alert and intelligent citizen of all the great immigrant races that have populated New York. He was a city dweller before the hairy Anglo-Saxon came out of the woods, and every fall the East Side resolves itself into one great clamorous political debating society. Out of the Bowery and Red Light districts have come the new development in New York politics, the great voting power of the organized criminals. It was a notable development not only for New York, but for the country at large, and no part of it was more noteworthy than the appearance of the Jewish dealer in women, a product of New York politics who has vitiated, more than any other single agency, the moral life of the great cities of America in the past ten years. End quote. It is absolute fact that corrupt Jews are now the backbone of the loathsome traffic in New York and Chicago. The good Jews know this and feel keenly the unspeakable shame of it. The American Hebrew says in an editorial, quote, If Jews are the chief sinners, it is appropriate that Jews should be the chief avengers of the dishonor done to their own people, and in many cases to their own women. We feel confident that unless something is done, and done quickly, a scandal of the most intense character will break forth, and only by prompt action can its worst effects be warded off from the fair name of American Jewry. End quote. Honorable Oscar S. Strauss wrote in his report as Secretary of Commerce and Labor for 1908, quote, It is highly necessary that this diabolical traffic which has attained international proportions, should be dealt with in a manner adequate to compass its suppression. No punishment is too severe to inflict upon the procurers in this vile traffic. End quote. Signed, B.C. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls, or War on the White Slave Trade, by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 14. Barred Windows. How We Took Up the Cause of the White Slaves. This afternoon, August 26, 1909, between half-past two and half-past three o'clock, Mr. Ralph Radnor Earl took photographs of various places in Chicago's principal vice district. Among these were several photographs of barred windows of resorts, positively known to myself and Miss Derrick, who both accompanied the photographer, as disorderly, flagrant, infamous houses. Some of these barred windows on the dens of crime are here reproduced from the photographs. The bars are on the windows of both floors of these buildings. These are the back windows of these dives, and look towards Clark Street, a great Chicago thoroughfare, from which the upper windows are plainly seen. Five years ago, barred windows on a house of sin, which had been turned into a mission, alarmed some of us and gave us almost our first ideas of the fate of the white slaves. The house was a notorious place, the most notorious in Chicago a dozen years ago. The name of the woman who kept it was known, and is still spoken in the circles of the immoral throughout Chicago, and far beyond it. Stories are told of princes of European houses, 
pouring out wine and money like water in this glittering palace of mirrored walls and brilliant lights. The woman died, and the probate court would not allow her estate to use the property for immoral purposes. It was leased for mission and rescue home by Mr. O. H. Richards, founder and superintendent of Beulah Home. Many of the windows were barred, and whatever explanations might be offered, we were never satisfied that they were not barred to keep in girls, who at least, at times, would gladly escape. When we learned that many other houses in the Vice District had windows similarly barred, we were obliged to conclude that girls were constantly detained against their will. To this refuge, which had been a dive, Edith E. fled one morning, having escaped from a resort on Custom House Place. She ran first to a drug store, telephoned to the police to get her street clothes from the dive, and then came to the rescue home. She explained that she had heard the midnight missionaries two nights before, singing in a gospel meeting, which they were holding in front of the den where she was. Throw out the lifeline to danger-fraught men, sinking in anguish where you've never been. So deep an impression was made upon her that she was wretched all the next day, quite unfitted for her old life. Next morning she escaped. She told me that she had been a very wicked girl, that her young husband had committed suicide because of her sin. She never went back to her evil life. Her physical heart was seriously weakened from her addiction to drugs, liquor, and vice. In October 1906, the National Purity Federation, of which Mr. B. S. Steadwell of La Crosse, Wisconsin, is president, held a conference in Chicago at Abraham Lincoln Center. Among the speakers was the late Reverend Sidney C. Kendall, whose whole soul was torn and bleeding over the shame of making commerce of women. He told us of the crimes of the French traders, of their systematized traffic in girls, and of their organization for defense, when any of them is under prosecution in the courts. Mr. Kendall was sick when he was here, and died the next summer. With his latest strength and his dying breath, he antagonized the loathsome white slave trade. He was a member of the National Vigilance Committee, for the suppression of the white slave traffic. Mr. Kendall's most conspicuous work was done in Los Angeles. Some of his spirit remained with a few of us in Chicago, and we could not rest until some effort was made here to rid us of the shame of slavery in the 20th century under the flag of the free. On January 30, 1907, Mr. O. H. Richards told me how he had rescued a girl with the help of the police from a resort after the woman who kept the place had refused to surrender the girl to her mother and stepfather on the claim that the girl owed twenty dollars for clothes. As there were three good witnesses to the illegal detention, the mother, the stepfather, and Mr. Richards, I saw that this was a good case to bring into court. I asked the mother if, for the sake of other mother's girls, she would take the witness stand. She hardly consented, as did her husband, and with strong crying and tears, she gave her testimony when the offending woman was arraigned, January 31, before Judge Newcomer at Harrison Street. She was convicted, fined, and sent up to the Bureau of Identification, Rogues Gallery, to leave her picture and measurements. This broke her pride, and she came down wilted. She immediately abandoned her wicked business, and is a good woman today. Last September... When the midnight workers had some annoyance from dive-keepers, she visited the district at midnight to express her sympathy with the missionaries. She told me, I remember what you said to me in court. You said, I love your soul, but I hate your devilish business. As it was now publicly shown that girls were held in houses against their will, we printed the statute of Illinois against such detention as a leaflet and placed a copy in the hand of every keeper an inmate of disorderly resorts in the Vice District at 22nd Street. Captain Harding posted a copy of the leaflet in the police station. Beneath the statute, we printed a note saying, No white slave need remain in slavery in the state of Abraham Lincoln, who made the black slaves free. For freedom did Christ set us free. Be not entangled again in the yoke of bondage, which is the yoke of sin and evil habit. Pastor Boynton tells in another chapter how Deaconess Hall, himself and I, with police Cullet, 
went from house to house in the great vice district with this leaflet, which proved so powerful. Thereafter, the cause of the white slaves lay heavy on the hearts of a number of men and women, particularly Deaconess Lucy A. Hall, whose insistence that something be done led, ultimately, to the organization of the vigilance work in Chicago. In the autumn of 1907, Mrs. Ida Evans Haynes obtained a copy of a report of the Episcopal Diocese of Massachusetts on social purity and the ravages of the diseases that are the wages of sin. At Mrs. Haynes's request, Rev. Morton Culver Hartzell organized a committee of ministers of various denominations, of which Rev. Dr. Swift of Austin was chairman and Rev. Dr. Kane of Edgewater secretary. Under authority of this committee, a meeting was held at the YMCA lecture room in November 1907, which was addressed by Miss Rose Johnson of Panama. Out of this meeting came the Committee for Suppression of Traffic in Vice, of which Dr. Kane was chairman. This committee employed an investigator and was appalled by the revelation of conditions in Chicago, existing not only in so-called red-light districts, but also in residence districts. The activity of this committee for the suppression of traffic in vice attracted a much larger number of persons who promoted numerous meetings, which culminated in the union meeting of ministers to consider the suppression of the white slave traffic in Chicago and Illinois on February 10, 1908. The purpose of that meeting was to enlist the ministers as the moral leaders of the community in the effort to rid our city of this shame and by holding a public convention to give the newspapers opportunity to tell the facts to the public. Bishop William F. McDowell presided. The devotional service was led by Rev. A. H. Harnley. Prayer was offered by Rev. A. C. Dixon. Addresses were made as follows. Chicago's White Slave Market, the Legal Red Light District, by Rev. Ernest A. Bell. The White Slaves and the Law, by Mr. Clifford G. Rowe. The International White Slave Traffic, by Dr. O. Edward Janey of Baltimore, Chairman of the National Vigilance Committee. The Lost, by Mrs. Raymond Robbins. Judge Fake spoke briefly, and a letter was read from Judge Sadler. At that meeting, it was determined to proceed with the organization of a state association for the suppression of the white slave traffic in Illinois. That same afternoon, February 10, 1908, a largely attended meeting representing ministers' meetings, settlements, clubs, temperance, and other reform organizations set themselves to establish the Illinois Vigilance Association. The publicity given by the conference just mentioned to the testimony of ministers, judges, and prosecutors led the Chicago Tribune to inquire very carefully into the truth of these statements, and, finding them true, that newspaper committed itself in numerous editorials to antagonize the white slave traffic. The same conference helped to enlist Honorable Edwin W. Sims, the United States District Attorney at Chicago, in the prosecution of the traffickers and foreign girls under the Immigration Act of February 20, 1907. Mr. Sims has repeatedly stated in public meetings that we brought to his notice the appalling traffic in alien girls, which he has since done so much to suppress. Much has been done, we rejoice to say. Still, today we photograph the barred windows in Chicago's principal market for girls. Later, on September 3, in an interview with Honorable Leroy T. Stewart, Chief of Police, Mr. Arthur Burridge Farwell and the writer submitted photographs of barred windows to the chief. He examined them carefully and said he saw no need of such bars on houses of infamy. The explanation of dive keepers that the bars were to keep out burglars was not satisfactory. Assistant Chief Schutler, who was present, said, Give it to me. I'll tend to it. He took one of the photographs, and in a few days the bars were all removed. Similar barred windows were found and photographed in Los Angeles during the crusade of the decent people of that city against its white slave market. It's wonderful how carefully these slavers everywhere protect themselves against burglars. We reproduce in this book two flashlight pictures of a dungeon door 
and a steel screen found in Custom House Place, the former white slave market of Chicago. These are taken by permission from Chicago Soul Market by Dr. Jean Turner Zimmerman. She writes concerning these views as follows. In the south wall of the basement of 114 Federal Street, Custom House Place, that congested central red light district of three years ago, now given over to slum and immigrant habitation, is a great steel door about the size and shape of the door of a railway freight car. On the outside, this door opens into a narrow, blind passageway between 114 and 116 Custom House Place, formerly the notorious dive, the. On the inside, this door opened into a large closet, windowless, soundproof, about four by seven feet, and it is alleged that it was through the alley and into the blind passageway that the unwilling victims of white slavers were carried into this little solitary cell. The accompanying photograph, secured by the writer, gives at least a faint idea of this frightful trap against whose pitiless walls have, no doubt, beat the agonized shrieks of more than one innocent girl. For two years we occupied the premises at 114 Custom House Place as a mission. Upon moving into the place we found every window encased in heavy iron bars, while between the bars and the glass of each window was mortised a one-half-inch steel screen. Entrance or exit from the building was as utterly impossible as from a penitentiary, excepting by the front door. Certain policemen, from motives best known to themselves, attempted to prevent Dr. Zimmerman from taking these photographs. Scorning their despicable threats of arrest, she took the pictures with her own hands. End of chapter 14 Read by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona, February 6, 2023Chapter 15 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 15 The Nations and the White Slave Traffic by James Bronson Reynolds, New York. Note Few Americans are better informed than Mr. Reynolds on the subject of commerce in white women and girls, and in Chinese and Japanese women and girls. He has investigated this awful traffic on the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of the United States, in Panama, in China, and Japan. He is a member of the National Vigilance Committee, which cooperates with similar organizations in other nations for the extermination of this shameful traffic. In other important investigations, he's been a special commissioner of President Roosevelt. This chapter is an address delivered by Mr. Reynolds, who came from New York for the purpose, before the Conference for the Suppression of the White Slave Traffic, held by the Illinois Vigilance Association in Chicago, February 8, 1909. The International Treaty On May 18, 1904, a treaty was signed between the leading countries of Europe for the repression of the white slave traffic. This treaty was presented to our government, and after careful consideration its ratification was advised by the Senate and proclaimed by the President June 15, 1908. If I am correctly informed, this is the first treaty relating to social morality consummated between the leading civilized governments of the world. This action is of the highest significance and importance. The provisions of this treaty should be generally known by our people, which is not the case today, and we should carefully consider our obligations as citizens to its proper fulfillment. It should be hailed as a step of progress in this twentieth century, which seems destined to record great improvements in social well-being and in the removal of inequalities of condition. The most important provisions of the treaty, which I will summarize, are contained in the first three articles. Article 1. Each of the contracting governments agrees to establish or designate an authority who will be directed to centralize information concerning the procuration of women and girls for the purpose of their debauchery in a foreign country. That authority shall be empowered to correspond directly with the similar service established in each of the other contracting states. Article 2. 
Each of the governments agrees to exercise supervision of railway stations, ports of embarkation, and of women and girls in transit, in order to procure all possible information leading to the discovery of a criminal traffic, the arrival of persons involved in such traffic as procurers or victims shall be communicated to diplomatic or consular agents. Article 3. The governments agree to inform the authorities of the country of origin of the discovery of such unfortunates, and to retain pending advices, such victims in institutions of public or private charity. Such parties will be returned after proper identification to the country of origin. The execution of the provisions of the treaty in European countries has been entrusted to the National Police Service. In this country, where the police are not a department of the national government, the Bureau of Immigration, which seemed best equipped for the service pledged, has been instructed to carry out, so far as possible, the provisions of the treaty. The extent and power of the evil forces. Even this exceptionally well-informed audience may not be fully aware of the extent and power of the evil forces which Europe and America have, through this treaty, combined to oppose— that the treaty was originally drafted without the assistance of our own government indicates that Europe first realized the necessity of governmental action. The adhesion of our own government to the treaty proves its subsequent recognition of the seriousness of the evil. Briefly stated, the status of the white slave traffic is this. It is a traffic with local, interstate, national, and international ramifications. It has the complete outfit of a large business, large capital, representatives in various countries, well-paid agents, and able, high-salaried lawyers. Its victims are numbered yearly by the thousands. They include not only the peasant girls of European villages, but also the farmers' daughters of our own country. Some are uneducated and wholly ignorant. Others have enjoyed good education. While most of them come from the homes of poverty, occasionally a child of well-to-do parentage is numbered among the victims. The alert agents of the traffic move from place to place, alluring peasant girls and farmers' daughters from their homes, entrapping innocent victims at railway stations and public resorts. Not a few girls who go to the cities to seek their fortunes and fail are caught by these harpies. And remember, I am alluding now not to those who go astray because of incidental misfortunes of circumstance, condition, or blind trust in some unworthy lover, but only to those who are entrapped by the agents of the organized white slave traffic system. The above statements have been abundantly established by the investigations of the National Vigilance Committee within the past two years and have been confirmed by other competent authorities. These conditions have been due not to the wish or the intention of our people, but to our blindness or our ignorance. We forget that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, as one declaiming of political freedom has said. The same price must be paid for every other civic excellence or right. The liberty of women, quite as much as the liberty of man, should be protected, and women's moral freedom, quite as much as man's political freedom, demands for its protection unceasing vigilance. Without going further into general conditions, I wish to present a statement regarding America's relations to the white slave traffic in China and Japan, and to the yellow slave traffic in the Pacific Coast states of our own country. My information regarding China and Japan is based primarily on my own personal observations and inquiries in those countries. My information regarding conditions in California is based upon the report of a special agent of the National Vigilance Committee and upon the reports of missionaries and other workers among the Chinese and Japanese women on our western coast. I shall consider my subject in two divisions. First, white slave traffic in Asia. Second, yellow slave traffic in America. I trust I do not seem to be stretching the application of the subject of my address in the title of the second division. It is the traffic in the bodies and souls of women, and I care not whether they are white, yellow, or black. Applause. Our responsibility is independent of the color of the victims. The white slave traffic in Asia. Our shame in the Orient. The record of white slave traffic in the Orient presents one of the darkest pages in our history. In many Oriental cities, notably in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Yokohama, there exists a quarter made up of houses of ill repute. The most showy and stylishly dressed of their occupants are Americans. Some of them are often conspicuous in expensive equipages on the leading thoroughfares. 
It is so well known a fact in the Orient that these women are Americans that I was told in three cities that the term American girl was synonymous of a prostitute. Such a condition would be deplorable in itself, but in addition it must be understood that just as we Americans derive our chief impression of the Chinese nation from the Chinese quarters in Boston, New York, Chicago, and San Francisco, so the Chinese in their home form their impression of Americans from the American communities in the Orient, in which the daughters of shame are most in evidence. Until recently, Shanghai held first place among Oriental cities of such shameful repute, that this status has been somewhat modified is due chiefly to the courage and persistence of judge wilfley american circuit court judge at shanghai he was severely criticized i believe before a congressional investigating committee last winter for lack of tact and for using roughshod methods a careful investigation by mr root the secretary of state resulted however in judge wilfley's complete vindication and in the highest praise for the service he had rendered in cleansing out the augean stables of american vice in shanghai but in spite of his admirable efforts the reform has not been permanent and will only become so when we manifest that our moral housecleaning is a permanent duty to be kept up at all times of course there are clean and happy american homes in these cities just as there are happy chinese homes in our chinese quarters though few of us are aware of the latter fact as neither our reporters nor our slumming parties discover them but the american dens of vice in the coast cities are the most conspicuous exponents of americanism in china and japan as the chinese opium and gambling dens in our american cities are supposed to be typical of life in china we hasten to assert that in our case the imputation is deplorably incorrect. We might with equal truth recognize the injustice of judging the average Chinaman by impressions formed in a Chinatown slumming party. The Chinese colonies of this country and the European and American colonies in the Orient exhibit the worst side of their respective national character. Thus, through the depravity of a fragment of our people, the nation is misjudged and is believed to make for unrighteousness. This has been the direct result of our indifference to our reputation in the Orient. It is well to remind you that, under the extraterritoriality clause of our treaty with China, all Americans in China are under the protection and control of our consular representatives. The Chinese in this country have no such protection from their home government. The Chinese nation is, therefore, entitled to hold us responsible for the conduct of Americans in China, as we cannot hold the Chinese government responsible for the conduct of its people in our country. When I was in Japan, at the request of the American government, I approached certain Japanese officials to learn if something could not be done to stop the sending of Japanese girls to this country for immoral purposes. I was courteously received, and, after some discussion, was assured that the Japanese government would gladly cooperate to suppress this traffic, and would welcome any suggestions to that end. A high official said to me, quote, we desire to have the Japanese enjoy a good reputation in your country, and therefore we are most anxious that only those Japanese should go to your country who will contribute to the good reputation of our country. End quote. But on leaving this official, he said with some hesitation, quote, Do you think it would be possible on your return to America to suggest to your officials that they might do something to prevent the sending of American girls to our cities? End quote. Let those who hastily declare the Japanese to be wholly depraved because of the Yoshiwara in their cities understand that we have been and still are responsible for an American Yoshiwara in more than one Japanese and Chinese city. Should not this mortifying suggestion of a Japanese official to a Christian nation, the burning disgrace to our country and the dictates of patriotism, of decency and of humanity, arouse us and through us our government? if we realize the necessity of action then there are three things which we can do and should do one provision should be made by law so that the protection of american citizenship impudently flaunted in the orient by the american prostitutes and other outlaws should be withdrawn american citizenship should not be a cloak for the protection and promotion of vice i realize the danger of the possible abuse of such proscription proper safeguards must be maintained so that an arrogant or unprincipled consul may not abuse his power but with proper checks protection sought in the name of american citizenship should bring good character as its credential two 
Direct communication should be established between our government and the governments of Japan and China, assuring these governments that we deplore the presence in their territory of such unworthy representatives of our country, and that we will gladly cooperate in driving them from their unholy traffic. 3. A formal treaty agreement should be instituted with Japan and China under which the high contracting parties should agree to use their respective police powers to detect and punish those who seek to send girls or women from one country to the other for immoral purposes. The yellow slave traffic in America, more shameful still. Second, yellow slave traffic in America. Deplorable and disgraceful as is the white slave traffic in the Orient, the yellow slave traffic in our own country is infinitely more disgraceful. We call ourselves a Christian nation. The Chinese and Japanese are classed as heathen, but I am compelled to believe that the heathen slaves imprisoned in the pens of California are in a much worse plight under Christian rule than are their unfortunate sisters in Chinese and Japanese cities under heathen rule. I am informed that five years ago very few Oriental women were imported for immoral purposes. A small number of Chinese women were kept in certain houses for the accommodation of Chinese men. Today there is an organized system of commerce in human flesh between China and Japan and this country, and an organized system of slavery in certain of our coast states. After the payment of money for this human property, title is passed just as for real estate, and the alleged property rights are respected by our officials. Is this Christian? Is it decent? Is it American? Is it anything but a vile shame and disgrace, a disgrace to be abolished by the determined action of every lover of decency in our land? Cries of no, no. I am not making these statements on the basis of newspaper, stories, or travelers' gossip. Let me quote from a report of our investigator. Speaking in one city in California, he says, quote, The crib system, which means the keeping of many girls in small rooms in large buildings, sometimes under lock and key, sometimes at liberty to come and go, is adopted to a limited degree among Japanese girls. Across the river, these girls are kept in the Chinese quarter. They are owned by wealthy Japanese and Chinese men. The property thus used for saloon, gambling, and for a slave market for girls is said to belong to an estate controlled by a high official of the state. End quote. Of another city, our investigator says, quote, In conversation with a very intelligent Chinese woman, the direct question was asked, Are the Chinese and Japanese women actual prisoners owned and controlled by their keepers? She said that such was practically the case, and that none of these girls were allowed to leave their rooms without being escorted by older people, whose presence with them would ensure their return. It is remarkable that the authorities of Oakland seem to regard this crib slavery of young girls as part of the legitimate business of the city. End quote. Of a third city, he says, quote, There is a district in blank covering five blocks, a crib district, where the floating population gathers by the hundreds. The girls here number from one hundred to six hundred. One other similar section of blank is owned by some very prominent and wealthy citizens who pay taxes on the property. Their names are known. In the suburbs is a field containing the nameless graves of 451 unknown girls. End quote. Many cases are on record of the attempts of missionary workers some successful and some unsuccessful, to snatch these victims from their owners. One missionary told of an instance where she had been informed that one of five girls confined in a certain room in a house of ill repute desired to escape. With the help of an honest policeman and two assistants, the missionary forced her way into the room. When she found the five girls, she was at a loss to determine what to do, because she could not recognize which one wished to escape. She had been informed that the girl she sought would be afraid to indicate her wish. After hesitation, the missionary selected one girl and told the detective to seize her. The girl screamed, kicked, scratched, and fought her rescuers with the greatest energy, but was carried into the street and into the mission house. As soon as she was inside the house, she fell at the feet of the teacher and said, "'Teacher, you know I didn't mean what I said. I did not dare to show any desire to go, for fear I might be taken back.' It happened that the missionary got the girl whom she sought, and who desired her liberty." Other attempts at rescue have been less successful. 
On one occasion a rescue party sought a Chinese girl, whom it was agreed should hold to her mouth a white handkerchief as a signal that she was the one to be taken. When the rescue party entered the place they saw the girl with the handkerchief to her face at the soliciting window. Unfortunately, in the excitement of the moment, the girl lost her presence of mind, and waving her handkerchief cried out, "'Oh, teacher!' But a locked door still separated her from her rescuers, and her keepers, suspecting the truth, dragged her back, and she was lost in the house before the door could be forced. Other girls who escaped from the den afterwards told her fate. Her enraged owner kicked her to death in one of the rooms of her slave prison, where there was none to defend her. No one was ever punished for this crime. Horrible as these incidents were, they are but the regular accompaniments of slavery. They have been paralleled in all ages and in all countries where slavery has existed. The shame of it is that in America, in the twentieth century, such slavery should still be tolerated. Ought we not to give active support to our government in its fulfillment of its treaty agreement with the nations of Europe? And should not our example in the Orient and our conduct in our own country be more worthy of our national moral standards? If so, then such an association as this has a more than local service to render. Placed in this important centre, it must reach out, both to the east and to the west, awaken interest, give warning, and help to provide a chain of national protective agencies to combat and destroy the closely linked chain of purveyors of vice. End of section 15, read by Sandra, near Montreal, 2023. Chapter 16 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls, or War on the White Slave Trade, by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 16 The Yellow Slave Trade. During the administration of President Hayes, the United States Consul General at Shanghai, Mr. D. H. Bailey made a report to the President relating to slavery in China and the menace to our country from that cause. He enclosed with his report a translation of the laws governing slaves, some of which are as follows. If a female slave deserts her master's house, she shall be punished with eighty blows. Whoever harbors a fugitive wife or slave, knowing them to be fugitives, shall participate equally in their punishment. A slave guilty of addressing abusive language to his master shall suffer death by being strangled. The master, or the relatives of a master, of a guilty slave, may chastise such a slave in any degree short of death without being liable to any punishment. All slaves who are guilty of designedly striking their masters shall without making any distinction between principles and accessories, be beheaded. If accidentally they kill their master, they shall suffer death by being strangled. In China, and wherever Chinese live, slave girls and women are subject to two forms of slavery, domestic slavery and brothel slavery. Every respectable Chinese family has one or two house slaves. The brothel slave is a literal slave, bought and sold like a sheep or cow. Traffic in Chinese girls for wicked uses extended to Hong Kong as soon as the island became prosperous and populous after being ceded to Great Britain in 1841. From Hong Kong, the horrid trade reached to California and to Singapore and other places. Commissioners appointed by the governor of Hong Kong made a report in 1880 from which the following accounts are taken. Young girls virgins of 13 or 14 years of age, are brought from Canton or elsewhere and deflowered according to bargain and as a regular business for large sums of money which go to their owners. The regular earnings of the girls go to the same quarters and the unfortunate creatures obviously form subjects of speculation to regular traders in this kind of business who reside beyond our jurisdiction. Mr. Lister speaks of the brothel keepers as a horrible race of cruel women, cruel to the last degree, who use an ingenious form of torture which they call prevention of sleep, which he describes in detail. Two girls were brought before the Registrar General, both of whom pleaded for protection against their owner, 
stating that she intended to sell them to go to California. One of these had been bought by this woman for eighty dollars. The girl saw the price paid for her. The other said her mother was very poor and sold her for twenty dollars. The inspector said, There has been, at times, a number of women residing in the house, and I do not know what has become of them. I believe that they have been sent to California by the defendant. The poor slave girls, as shown by court proceedings at Hong Kong, had the same terror of being sold into California that the Negro slaves in this country had of being sold down the river. One of the girls testified that she had seen several women sent away to California. She had been present when the bargains were made, the price varying. In Hong Kong, the price was from fifty to one hundred and fifty dollars. They would bring, in California, from two hundred and fifty to three hundred and fifty dollars. Owing to the restriction of Chinese immigration and the penal laws against importing women for evil uses, the value of a slave girl on the Pacific coast has greatly increased. It is now three thousand dollars. The system of Chinese brothel slavery differs from the white slave trade in that the Chinese brothel slaves are not weak or wicked women who have fallen into the clutches of traffickers. As so many of our European and American white slaves unquestionably are, but are good girls, who have been sold by their actual owners into a life of shame for money, sometimes sold by their own parents. Some are not sold outright, but are mortgaged to pay off a loan. So much is credited each month until the debt is cancelled. Unless fresh debts, real or fictitious, keep the victim indefinitely, as with the white slaves. On the marked differences between the white slave and the yellow slave, the commissioners previously quoted say, Prostitutes in Europe are, as a general rule, fallen women, the victims of seduction, or possibly of innate vice. Being the outcasts of society, and having little, if any, prospect of being admitted again into decent and respectable circles of life, deprived also of their own self-respect, as well as the regards of their relatives, occasionally even troubled with qualms of conscience, they mostly dread thinking of their future, and seek oblivion in excesses of boisterous dissipation. The Chinese prostitutes of Hong Kong are an entirely different set of people. Very few of them can be called fallen women. Scarcely any of them are the victims of seduction in the English sense of the term, refined or unrefined. The great majority of them are owned by professional brothel keepers, or traders in women in Canton or Macau, have been brought up for that life and trained in various accomplishments suited to it. They frequently know neither father nor mother, except what they call a pocket mother, that is, the woman who bought them from others. There are 18,000 such slaves in Hong Kong, if the estimates accepted by the commissioners are correct. In China, the yellow slave has hope of escape from her bondage. If she is pretty and accomplished, some rich man may buy her for his first, second, third, or fourth wife. If she is homely, some honest working man may take her. Or she may sing or play an instrument, and thereby add to her earnings, until she can buy her own freedom, if dissipation and disease have not killed her first. The mortgage girls are often such as have sacrificed their own to their family's honor, according to the Chinese and Japanese notion of filial piety. The money thus advanced by the keeper is thought necessary to rescue the girl's family or some member of it from calamity or ruin. One Japanese man is quoted as saying that such sacrifice, on a girl's part, is Christ-like. He should hear the voice of Christ, saying of all these sins, which things I also hate. Revelation 2.6 Yellow Slaves in America the terrible system of Chinese and Japanese brothel slavery has been imported into San Francisco, Oakland, and other cities of California. Americans and Europeans have invested money and devoted business ability to this enormous iniquity because it pays well. Apart from the horrors of Chinatown, 1,000 Japanese women are held in this form of slavery in California. The San Francisco Chronicle said of this statement, there is not the slightest doubt of the truth of the assertion, disreputable as it may seem. The police will generally say, after investigating, that these women are willing to remain in their present condition. Doubtless this is true of most of them, but they are slaves, nonetheless, literal and actual slaves, 
bought and paid for and acknowledging the ownership. In a letter of Abraham Lincoln, written before the war, he tells of a company of Negro slaves that he saw in a boat on the Ohio, and he never saw such a happy company of people in his life. When John Brown made his raid into Virginia and captured 200,000 stands of arms at Harper's Ferry, he hoped that the thousands of Negro slaves in that region would join him and fight for their freedom. He could only get six or eight Negroes to join him and those at the point of the bayonet. One was shot rather than seek his liberty. At the beginning of the abolition movement, a petition from slaves was sent to Congress in favor of slavery. Women terrorized by such laws, as are quoted at the beginning of this chapter, and further terrorized by all the brutal treatment and threats of the slave traders, are not likely to say to the police that they desire liberty. But it is our duty to give them liberty, and to punish their owners, who cannot legally own them, but do practically own them under the stars and stripes. The following cases illustrate the traffic in the work of missionaries. These three girls were in the Methodist Home for Chinese Girls, located since the earthquake at Berkeley. One says, I am twelve years old, born in Canton, father a laborer, mother a nurse, parents very poor. Mother fell sick and in her need of money sold me to a woman three years ago in Hong Kong. The woman promised my mother to make me her own daughter. My mother cried when she left me. I have heard that she is now dead. The big ship, city of Pekin, took me soon out of sight. There was trouble in landing me. The woman had no trouble in landing because she had been in California before. She told me what I was to say. She told me I must swear I was her own daughter. The judge asked me, Is this your own mother? And I said, Yes. This was a lie, but I did not know it was wrong to do as I was told, and I was afraid of my mistress. The judge said, Did this woman give you birth? And I said, Yes. The judge said, Did anybody tell you to say all this? And I said, No, because my mistress had instructed me. She taught me on shipboard what to say if I was taken to court. She beat me with thick sticks of firewood. She beat me with the fire tongs. One day she took a hot flat iron, removed my clothes, and held it on my naked back until I howled with pain. The scab was on her back when she came to the mission. My forehead is all scars caused by her throwing heavy pieces of wood at my head. One cut a large gash, and the blood ran out. She stopped the bleeding and hid me away. I thought I'd better get away before she killed me. When she was having her hair washed and dressed, I ran away. I had heard of the mission and inquired the way and came to it. A white man brought me here. I am very happy now. Another little slave, eleven years old, who was about to be sold from domestic slavery into a brothel, was saved by a Chinaman. She says, A Chinaman living next door... Knowing how I was treated and that I was going to be put into a brothel, when I saw him in the passageway, asked me if I wished to come to the mission, and I said, yes. My mistress had gone out into the next room, leaving her daughter and another slave girl in the room. I said I would go at once, and he brought me. I am very glad to live here and lead a good life. In the following case, the rescuer was a negress. A young girl came from China to San Francisco as a merchant's wife. Missionaries visited her in Chinatown, but she disappeared and explanations were not satisfactory. A year later, the doorbell rang one night at the mission, and when it was opened, a Chinese girl fell in a faint across the threshold, a colored girl holding her by the queue. The colored girl saw her running and, to prevent her from being dragged back by her tormentors, seized her by the queue and helped her run to the mission. It was the merchant's young wife. The wretch had left her, on false pretense, in a den of shame. She was tied to a window by day and to a bed by night, a thoroughly unwilling slave. Three days before her escape, the chief of police and an interpreter had gone through the house, questioning every inmate as to whether they wished to lead a life of shame or not. She was asked the question in the presence of the divekeeper, the madam, and all the girls. She had been told beforehand, if you dare say you want to escape, we will kill you. The chief of police announced in the papers that there were no slaves in Chinatown. 
Though watched day and night, she rushed out at an opportune moment and, with the help of the colored girl, ran to safety. Since the earthquake, immense slave pens have been built at Oakland and in San Francisco. A photograph of one large wooden structure, to hold more than a hundred girls, is before me as I write. The girls are kept in small rooms, nine or ten feet square. Americans and Chinamen are partners in the horrible business. This chapter is a review, in part, of the book Heathen Slaves and Christian Rulers, written by Dr. Catherine Bushnell and Mrs. Elizabeth Andrew. It was my good fortune and delight to meet Dr. Bushnell and Mrs. Andrew in Bombay at the time when Lord Roberts had contradicted their statements about procuring women for British soldiers in India, Queen's women, as they were called. Upon being convinced that Dr. Bushnell and Mrs. Andrew had told the truth, Lord Roberts, then commander-in-chief of the forces in India, said, I apologize to the ladies without reserve. End of chapter 16 Read by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona March 6, 2023Chapter 17 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 17 How Snakes Charm Canaries Methods of Procurers. At the end of May 1907, Rev. Melbourne P. Boynton, pastor of the Lexington Avenue Baptist Church, was requested by the Chicago Examiner to make a tour of the Vice District at 22nd Street and write against its iniquities for the columns of that newspaper. Pastor Boynton stipulated that I should accompany him as a recognized worker in the slums and superintendent of the Midnight Mission. Rev. E. L. Williams, a Methodist pastor, also accompanied us with Detectives Considine and Thomas of the Chicago Police. As we went out, I prayed God to give us a thunderbolt to alarm the people of Chicago. We did not foresee the answer to this prayer, but I have always felt that it was answered very quickly and in the following manner. Shortly after one o'clock, on the morning of May 31, we entered a resort on Dearborn Street, whose former owner had come to me at midnight to tell me that he had not had one happy minute since he took up that terrible business, and that he would quit it, which he did. In this place, among the half-dressed inmates, we noticed a modestly gowned young woman sitting at a small drinking table opposite something that ought to have been a man. The thing's name was Neil Yeager. The girl's name was MacDonald. I asked the girl if she were an inmate or leading a life of that sort, and she said no. She told me her true name and address and lied only about her age, as Jaeger had taught her to say she was twenty, when she was only sixteen, that he might sell her in the white slave market. The keeper of the resort, convinced that she was under age, had refused to deal with him. When I began to question the snake, it hissed, Mind your own business. I replied that this was my business, and asked the detectives to investigate. Discerning quickly what it was that we had discovered, they promptly locked the thing in an iron cage like any other wild beast. The girl was cared for. Her anxiety was expressed in her words, What will my mother say? At the trial of Jaeger before Judge Fake, he himself told brazenly how he had brought this young girl from her own home in an Illinois town, her mother supposing that she was going to work in Rockford. While the girl was giving her testimony, I heard the click of a camera, to my sorrow, for we were doing our utmost to keep the girl secret and to send her quietly to her mother. More than half a million copies of her photograph went out in the great daily papers of Chicago. When the truth was known, other young girls told what they had escaped by the capture and exposure of this reptile, for he was luring several of them to Chicago, one of them only fifteen years old. About half a million pages were published in the Chicago newspapers at this time against the traffic in girls. Such, it seemed to me, was the thunderbolt for which I had prayed. Letters of a Destroyer of Girls In a letter written from Rockton, Illinois, on May 27th, 
the hypocrite Jaeger had said to one of his intended victims, I have learned to love you as I never loved a girl before, and probably never will again. Now, sweetheart, I want you to get away from this town and the life you are leading there, as soon as you possibly can. When you are ready, let me know, and I will send you plenty of money to start out on, and will meet you wherever you say, and then we can be together as much as we please, and can live happy ever afterward. That is, of course, if you like me that well, and I certainly hope you do. Be a good girl, and God bless you and keep you from harm. Lovingly, Neil M. Yeager. In another letter he wrote, From our last conversation, I feel determined not to give you up, but to do all in my power to aid you to free yourself from the bondage that undermines your health and temper, and open to you a life free from care and strife, where you can go where, when, and with whom you please, without being kept like a girl in a convent. Your natural vivacious and carefree nature rebels against the shackles which fate has placed upon you, and I am willing to give you physical, mental, moral, and financial support to give you a life where none of the troubles which now harass you will be manifest, but instead will be a life where love will rule supreme. I will further try to prove myself worthy of your esteem if you will allow me to do something in a financial way. I am a man of character, honesty, and uprightness, possess an estate valued at $50,000, own an automobile and a private yacht, have an income of some $2,500 a year, and am thoroughly independent. I come from one of the best families in the West. I am willing to take you to Chicago, support you, and if you desire, secure employment for you at Marshall Field and Companies, besides taking you to dances, theaters, automobiling, and yachting. Surely anything would be better than the life you are leading there. Denying rumors of his evil character, he wrote, I did not go to Davis to see another girl. I went to sign up some policies which I wrote up there a couple of weeks ago. And if you heard anything I said about you, it was some lie those kids made up, like the one about the girl in Davis. I never spoke to the girl in my life and probably wouldn't know her if I met her on the street. I do care very much for you, and I love you more than I profess, and I don't run after other girls. I would like to take you with me, but since you say that was impossible, I will be true to you. If you ever want to come to me, I will send you the money and will take as good care of you as if you were my own sister. In another letter, the wretch complains, Say, why did you tell Effie about my writing to you and wanting you to come to Chicago? Please keep these things to yourself if you value love. Needless to say, the scoundrel had no wealth, and when Judge Fake fined him two hundred dollars, all the punishment our backward laws provided at that time, he had to go to prison until his father could send the money from his home in the state of Washington. The letters quoted above were obtained by Miss Niblo, a missionary, from the intended victims, and were published by the editor of the Freeport Evening Standard, July 31, 1907. A very young girl, who just escaped this tiger's claws, wrote this letter of inquiry and gratitude. Street, Illinois, August 8, 1907. Reverend Ernest Bell. Dear Sir, could you tell me if Neil Yeager is in the Bridewell yet, or has he been released? I am a girl that he tried to persuade to go away with him, but he did not succeed in getting me to go. You have my heartfelt congratulations for capturing such a wretch. Yours truly. There are hundreds of such smooth scoundrels occupied all the time in replenishing the dens of shame in Chicago. They travel, to our positive knowledge, as far as Ohio and Tennessee, and in all the nearer states. Fathers and mothers and brothers of girls, and the girls themselves, should be ceaselessly vigilant against these murderous deceivers. They always profess to be in some legitimate business and are apt to transact some honest deals as a blind. Every city that keeps up a red-light district breeds these destroyers of girls. Every dive-keeper employs such agents, and the principal is worse than the employee. Mrs. Charlton Edholm, in her book Traffic in Girls, writes the following confession made to her by a converted bartender. Mrs. Edholm I believe I am a converted man now, and that the Lord Jesus Christ has accepted me, and I will dwell with him forever. 
but when I realize how many girls I have sent to houses of shame, I wonder if God ever can forgive me, and I would give my life if I could undo it. When I was a bartender for years in a saloon with wine rooms, these procurers used to come there, and often I've seen one of these men bring a beautiful girl to the ladies' entrance, and, of course, he would try to get her to drink wine or beer, but oftentimes, having been brought up in a Christian home, or having signed the total abstinence pledge in the Sunday school, for you WCTU women have done so much for the children by having temperance taught in the day schools and Sunday schools, and she would refuse to touch the wine or beer, then he would wink at me, and I knew that meant an extra dollar for me, and I would drop a little drug into whatever the girl had to eat or drink, and in a few moments she would be unconscious, and that fellow would have a carriage drive to the door, that girl would be placed in it, and driven straight to a haunt of shame. He would receive his twenty-five or fifty dollars, and that girl would be as surely lost as if the earth had opened and swallowed her. Hundreds of times I've done this, and, Mrs. Edholm, do you think God can forgive me? Young men and older men, who patronize houses of shame, should be made to see and feel that all this hellish traffic goes on at their instance, and at their expense. The keepers and procurers are the paid agents of the men who foot the bill. Every dollar, with the burning name of God upon it, that any man spends there, makes him a stockholder in the white slave market and a partner in the traffic in girls. The men who support the hideous business are the ultimate white slave traders, and when their hired men, the dive keepers and procurers, come to judgment and condemnation, the men who supported them in crime will be arraigned beside them and punished with them. Peril of Stage-Struck Girls The corruption of the present-day theater is generally admitted. Archbishop Farley, in a sermon at St. Patrick's Cathedral, New York, on Sunday, February 7, 1909, said that the stage is worse today than it was in the days of paganism. He added, We see today men and women, old men and old women, who ought to know better, bringing the young to these orgies of obscenity. Instead of that, they should be exercising a supervision over the young and should look carefully after their companionship. Actresses of character are among the foremost to warn young women of the perils of the modern stage. Shakespeare and the older dramatists taught virtue, often with the spirit and energy of a prophet. Multitudes of present-day plays are of such moral character and tendency that no one can defend or excuse them. President Taft recently walked out of a theater to express his disapproval of the play. Low theaters exist merely to inflame those who visit them. They go to the awful length of naming the vice district as part of the merriment of the performances. Other so-called theaters are a part of the combined saloon and den of shame. I have conversed personally, many times, with girls who were deceived into going to such places, thinking they were going on the reputable stage. Mr. Arthur Burridge Farwell, Chicago's well-known reformer, here tells briefly the story of two young girls, whom I have often met in his office, who were lured by a false theatrical agency to go to a vile resort. The agency of a wicked woman, or two of them, will be noted in this case, along with the base deeds of an unscrupulous man. The keen eyes and wise head of a good-hearted Scotchwoman save the girls from a terrible doom. Mr. Farwell writes as follows. About December 1, 1907, I received a special delivery letter from the managing editor of one of the oldest daily papers in Springfield, Illinois, informing me that two girls had been sent back to Chicago and suggesting that the police department be informed of the facts. I immediately communicated with the Assistant General Superintendent of Police, Honorable Herman F. Schutler, and the girls were located. The theatrical agent who had sent them from Chicago was arrested and work was started against some of the evil practices of false theatrical agents. Taking the story from the girls and from their testimony in court, it is as follows. These two girls worked in a large department store in the city of Chicago. One of them was approached one day by a well-dressed woman who requested the judgment of this young lady upon some material to be used in theatrical work. The result was that this woman gave the name of a theatrical agent 
and told the girl that she could make twenty-five dollars a week by going on the stage, as she had a good voice, etc., etc. This girl spoke to another friend, working in the same store, and together they called upon this theatrical agent, whose name was given them by the woman. After being taken to a saloon, an attempt being made to compromise them, they were given tickets to the city where they were supposed to go upon the stage. They reached the city and providentially were guided to a boarding house of a Scotch woman who lived next door to the alleged theater, which proved to be a saloon in the front and a vaudeville in the rear, and upstairs a most awful place. The proprietor of the alleged theater declined to employ the young ladies unless they would stay in the rooms over the saloon or theater. On the advice of the Scotch woman, they declined to stay over the theater, and the woman furnished them tickets and they returned to Chicago. The preliminary hearing of the People versus was held in the Municipal Court of Chicago before Judge Wells, January 14, 1908, and lasted about five days, and 27 witnesses were heard, the testimony covering 373 pages. The theatrical agent was held to the grand jury. His license to operate a theatrical agency was revoked by the state. The sworn testimony showed a condition of affairs that would be a disgrace to the most ignorant, vicious, and debased people. That such things are allowed, in a republic where the people rule, as were allowed in Springfield and in other cities, is a sad commentary upon the average indifference of the authorities and the people, which should be called criminal indifference. The theatrical agent and one of the owners of the property in Springfield were indicted for conspiracy, but in the criminal court these charges were not sustained. The two girls were living with a woman, and one day, when they were needed as witnesses, it was found they were not there. A letter with no signature was received by the president of the Chicago Law and Order League, informing him that the two girls were living under assumed names in Milwaukee, and immediately, representatives of the Chicago Law and Order League and of the state of Illinois went to Milwaukee and found the girls and brought them back. The men who were responsible for sending these state's witnesses away were indicted and were found guilty, and the woman re-indicted. The expense in this one case to the Chicago Law and Order League and the state of Illinois was probably not less than $2,000. If the young girls who are seeking a living upon the stage could know of the pitfalls that are in their way, I believe many of them would seek other employment. One of the girls is now married and living very happily. Arthur Burridge Farwell, President, Chicago Law and Order League. End of chapter 17. Read by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona, March 11, 2023. Chapter 18 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell Chapter 18 Procuresses and the Confessions of One by Ernest A. Bell Here is a story from the London Times which might easily be repeated in the New York Herald or the Chicago Tribune. I was standing on a railway platform at, with a friend, waiting for a train, when two ladies came into the station. I was acquainted with one of them, the younger, well. She told me she was going to London, having been fortunate enough to get a liberal engagement as a governess in the family of the lady under whose charge she then was, and who had even taken the trouble to come into the country to see her and her friends, to ascertain that she was likely in all respects to suit. The train coming in sight, the fares were paid, the elder lady paying both. I saw them into the car, and the door being closed, I bowed to them and rejoined my friend, who happened to be a London man about town. "'Well, I will say,' said he, "'you country gentlemen are pretty independent of public opinion. 
you are not ashamed of your little transactions being known. What do you mean? I ask. Why? I mean you're talking to that girl and her duenna on an open platform. Why, that is, miss, an intimate friend of ours. Well, then, I can tell you, said the Londoner to me coolly, her friend is madam, one of the most noted procuresses in London, and she has got hold of a new victim, if she is a victim, and no mistake. I saw there was not a minute to lose. I rushed to the guard of the train and got him to wait a moment. I then hurried to the car door where the ladies were. Miss, you must get out. That person is an unfit companion for you. Madam, we know who you are. That one victim was rescued, but how many are lost? With prisoner number 503, whose story follows, I have conversed personally, and I have not the slightest doubt that her story is true. It surprised me to hear her say that she was and is a member of a Baptist church, with an implication in her words and manner that members of other churches are not quite so safe as members of her denomination. Her story was published January the 28th, 1909. She was brought to justice by the Chicago Law and Order League. By prisoner number 503. I am writing this message to the readers of the National Prohibitionist and to the world, from behind the bars in that gloomy pile of buildings alongside the drainage canal, where Chicago, every year, spends some millions of dollars to protect herself from the criminal classes, which she constantly creates and breeds. It may shock the respectable people who read these lines to find that their author is an imprisoned criminal. I lay emphasis on the word imprisoned because my not very long experience with the world has taught me that violation of the law is not particularly offensive to the mass of the world's inhabitants so long as it is not attended with the pains and penalties that are prescribed for the law's violation. I may as well shock my readers still more at once by the frank confession that I am in prison convicted of being what is commonly known as a white slave trader, and I was justly convicted and was guilty of the offence charged. And having made this confession, let me introduce myself. Behold me, a very common sort of a woman, twenty-nine years old, an ex-school teacher, born and piously brought up in the good state of Arkansas, fairly well educated, and, until within the last few months, almost wholly inexperienced in the ways of the wicked world. Six years ago, in my Arkansas home, I married a man whom I believed to be in every way worthy of the respect and love that I gave him, and bidding good-bye to my mother and my childhood friends in the old home, went with him to St. Louis. I wonder if the good men who let the saloons flourish in all our cities, and excuse themselves with the assertion that if a man will drink it is his own business, and if he makes a fool of himself, he is the only one that suffers. I wonder if those men really know what they are doing for thousands of women who do not drink, but who suffer. Years ago, somewhere, I read an article about the saloons written by some great minister or bishop, whose name I have forgotten, and indeed I have forgotten most of what he said but I remember he did say that the victims of the saloon are willing victims. Great God! I have been a victim, and God knows that I never was willing. I found that my husband was a drunkard, a railroad man with a good job, able to earn a comfortable living for himself and me. He never, for a day, 
could be depended upon. Many a morning did he kiss me goodbye, leaving me the impression that he had gone to his work, when it would be three days, a week, a month, sometimes three months, before I saw or heard from him again, though I might be in the sorest straits for the necessities of life. Three times he did this when he knew that I was soon to become a mother. Once, after three months' absence, I heard from him in a hospital in another city. I went to him, nursed him, brought him home, and when he was able to work, gave him, out of my own earnings, money to pay his board until payday, for his work would oblige him to board in another town. And he went away, and I never saw him again for months. Forced to work for a living, I came to Chicago, finding a position in a legitimate business, although unfortunately it was the sort of a business that brought me into contact with many people of bad morals, and tended to deteriorate my own moral ideals. Here in Chicago, while I was buying a railroad ticket one day, in a ticket broker's office, I was introduced by the clerk to a man who appeared to be a gentleman, with a suggestion that he would be willing to do for me a slight service which I needed at the moment regarding my baggage. A few weeks after, this man, whom I had no reason to suspect of any evil motive, sought me with the offer of a good place to work. He promised me a good salary, and the offer was specially attractive in view of the fact that I was then without work, and I accepted the place in perfect good faith. I want to emphasise what I now say for the benefit of those who may read these lines, who are parents of young girls. I suppose I may claim to be a reasonably intelligent woman, with a fair education, some years of observation of the world, and a little opportunity to know of the world's wickedness. But I was at that time absolutely ignorant of the existence of such a thing as a business in vice. I had never heard that girls were bought and sold. I did not know the character of what are called disorderly houses. It seems to me that good people, pious fathers and mothers, who let their girls grow up and go out into the world without a word of real instruction that will protect them in such crisis which may come in life to any woman, are not wholly innocent. I am tempted to say are frightfully guilty of the destruction of their own daughters. To make a long story short, and to tell a hideous tale in a few very plain words, I accepted the proposition, and found myself installed in one of the protected vice dens of Chicago, as housekeeper and special personal slave of this man, whom I now found to be a slave trader, the practical owner of other women and girls in various dives, as well as the driver of gangs of procurers. This man almost owned me. My salary, such small parts of it as I got, went into his pocket upon one excuse and another, while I was subject to his brutal will constantly. I will not shock my readers by telling the details of my horrid life in that place, but I must give them some facts that ought to be in possession of the unsuspecting, decent people who sit quietly and virtuously in their own homes, while a slaughter more terrible than Herod ever dreamed of goes on unceasingly. I am asked to say whether the unfortunate girls in these places are slaves in the sense that they cannot get away. My answer to that must depend upon your interpretation of cannot. In my own case, there never was a time when I could not have walked out of the building, had I chosen to do so. But my promised salary was always in arrears, and I was penniless, with nowhere to go and no friends. To walk out on a winter's day into the streets of Chicago, with nothing with which to buy a meal 
and no shelter and no friend under the wide, pitiless sky, is an heroic course to which some resolute Spartan matron might be driven in protection of her virtue. But it's a course which can hardly be expected from a mistreated, deluded, ignorant, disgraced, modern American girl. And it must be understood that my situation was very different from that of the girls. I was in a position of a superintendent. They were under me. What would have been possible for me was practically impossible for them. To begin with, no inmate of these vice dens is allowed to have clothing with which she could appear on the street. It is taken away from her by fraud or by force as soon as she arrives, and is locked up. She never sees it again until she is regarded as thoroughly trustworthy, and sure to come back if she does get out. Then, too, she is in debt. As soon as she arrives at the house, an account is opened with her, although perhaps she never sees the books. She is charged with the railroad fare that has been paid to bring her to the city. She is charged with the price that was paid for her to the thief who betrayed and stole her. She is charged for the alleged garments that are given her in exchange for her clothing, charged four times the price that they cost. Of course, the police will tell you nowadays that the old debt system has been abolished and that girls are not allowed to be in debt to the house where they are kept, and it may be that a sort of fiction is maintained, by which, if an investigation were forced, the dive-keeper would pretend to be an agent for the storekeeper that sells the supplies. But the condition of debt is none the less real, although, as always, it be fraudulent. The dive-keeper, the storekeeper, and the police are all partnership in it. Of course, it is not lawful to keep a girl prisoner because she happens to be in debt, but she is made to believe that it is. She is told strange stories about laws that are enacted for the government of her class, and she recognises all too plainly the power of the arm of the police, always outstretched in behalf of the dive-keeper. Police officers come and go in the dive. They register all inmates upon arrival and give formal, though of course unlawful, sanction to the business. If a girl becomes refractory and the dive-keeper threatens her with the vengeance of the police, she has every reason to believe that the threat is well-founded, whether it is or not. If, in spite of all this, a girl should be brave enough or rash enough to try to make her way out of the dive and escape, almost nude as she is kept, into the street, perhaps she would be allowed to go. Perhaps, too, the police might not bring her back, but they certainly would not assist her escape. And if they did not force her back into the den from which she had escaped, they would certainly send her to prison. I have seen dozens of girls who wanted to get out from these dives, wanted to leave the life they were living, but who, under the conditions that I have enumerated, did not, I think I may fairly say, could not do it. I had been in my position as housekeeper but a little while, when my owner discovered that I could be profitably employed in another line, that is, in importing slaves from other cities. Some months before, the firm for which I was then working had sent me to Milwaukee to sell toilet preparations, and this business had brought me into contact with a considerable number of foolish young women. I knew that some of them were anxious to come to Chicago, and I was sent to Milwaukee to induce them to come and bring them with me. I made several such journeys to Milwaukee and other cities, bringing a number of victims for Chicago's slave market. I attempt no defence for this infamous work. I ask for no moderation of judgment against me. But I feel that I have a right to call the attention of the public 
to the glaring injustice of the situation that puts me behind these bars, with long months of imprisonment before me, and leaves others who were equally guilty with me, and who are equally well known in their guilt, to go on with their wicked work. I know that ignorance of law is no excuse for its violation, but I was certainly ignorant that I was breaking any law. I never dreamed of it, until just before my arrest, the proprietress of one of the houses from which a girl whom I had brought to the city had run away, told me of my danger. I asked her why she was not also in danger, and she replied that it was because she carefully followed the instructions of the police, and maintained an ignorance concerning the sources from which the girls were brought who came to her house. I may or may not be believed, but I state the truth when I say that I never brought to this slavery a girl whom I believed to be an innocent girl. I brought only girls whom I found in bad surroundings, usually in disorderly saloons, and girls who claimed to be, and appeared to be, beyond the protection of that extremely virtuous law which our wise lawmakers have given us, known as the age of consent law. How any sane person must hate such cursed nonsense as such a law! Now let me ask why. Why, when I was sent as a mere agent of others, when I brought girls from well-known dens where they had been ruined, brought them into a recognised slave market, delivered them to well-known slave owners, where they were used to enrich their owners and the police, why, while the slave market goes on, while the slave owners drive their new gangs, and while the police keep up their system of protection and graft, why am I locked up here alone? Now let me make it perfectly clear on just what grounds I have been sentenced to prison. I was convicted under what is known as the Pandering Act, which makes it an offence to secure an inmate for a disorderly resort in the state of Illinois. I was guilty, and the protest I make is the protest of a convict. But I cry out to the good people to know why, if I must be behind prison walls for procuring an inmate for such a place, they walk free and grow rich and hold offices who allow such places to be. If it be a crime worthy of the prison to procure an inmate for a vice resort, is it a sure proof of public and private virtue that vice resorts cover square miles of this city and the city government regulates them? Ten long months hence, when broken, disgraced, without a cent, without a friend, they turn me out into Chicago's cold November storms. Will justice have been vindicated? Will some great and good ends have been attained by the punishment of me, a tool, a cat's paw, while seven thousand saloons and square miles of houses of prostitution have gone on in their bloody, damning work under sanction of the government run by you pious men. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls, or War on the White Slave Trade, by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 19. Wanted, Fathers and Mothers. After conversing with many thousands of fallen women and misguided girls, I believe that the principal causes of their downfall are the following, in the order named. 1. Parental Inefficiency through lack of character, knowledge, or vigilance. 2. 
amusements that pander to passion, such as many theaters, some of the amusement parks, cafes, and dance halls with drinking attachments, some Chinese restaurants, some Greek and other fruit and candy stores, and some pleasure boats that run at night. 3. Unsafe hours and unreasonable liberty. Walks, drives, and automobile rides, unattended, especially at night. 4. Betrayal of girls and desertion by husbands. 5. Willfulness and love of ease and finery. 6. Insufficient wages in stores and factories. 7. Poverty, especially where children or parents are dependent. One girl sent to pay her mother's funeral expenses. 8. A few are depraved from choice or heredity. Doubtless other observers would add other causes, and yet others would put these eight causes here named in different order. But no one will dispute that these eight are constant and fruitful causes of the ruin of girls. These eight, and the greatest of these, is the first, parental inefficiency. Sixteen-year-old girls go wrong. Within the last six days, it is August 10, 1909 today, the courts of Chicago have had to deal with two girls of only sixteen years, who were placed in immoral resorts by young men, one of them only a boy of sixteen years. A girl named McConnell, only 16 years old, and a girl named Schubert, three years older, were taken by two Jews, Brodsky and Jacobson, to a resort kept by one Weinstein in South Chicago. The girls were lured from an amusement park in the suburb of Forest Park, where they were unattended by parents or friends, fair game for the white slaver. Judge Walker, in pronouncing sentence upon Brodsky, who was fined $300, and sent six months to the House of Correction, said that Brodsky's wife and child and his confession of his crime stood between him and the extreme penalty of the new law of Illinois against pandering. Pandering, said the judge to the prisoner, is a most abhorrent crime. A man of your attainments has sunk to the lowest steps when he hangs about parks, seeking to betray innocent girls. A murder may be forgotten, or the grief lessened, but the living death to which you sought to lead these girls is far worse than for their friends to have placed them in a black box and hauled them to the cemetery. No words of judge or moralist are too strong to condemn the procurer and his master, the dive-keeper. But what must be the feelings of the father and mother who thoughtlessly leave their young daughters exposed to these serpents? A mother bird is more watchful of her chicks or a cat her kittens. Only last Sunday afternoon, Charles Kaufman, 16 years old, of Milwaukee, was arrested by Detectives Magner and Dolan in Chicago for placing a 16-year-old Chicago girl named Schwartz in a resort in Milwaukee. He had lured her from her home, where he had been entertained for several days. Miss Molly Schwartz, sister of the girl, said that Kaufman had beaten and threatened to kill her sister before he took her to Milwaukee and put her in the den of the white slaver. Kaufman freely admitted having lured the girl. How terrible a story this is, involving two families, two cities, two states. What exposure could be more horrible than that a boy of sixteen, scarcely more than a child, takes a child of sixteen to another city and receives money for leaving her in a place of infamy? But what must the father and mother of such a boy and the father and mother of such a girl Think of themselves and the way they have discharged their duty in bringing up their children. And what must our cities think of themselves while they maintain red-light districts to promote such crimes? In winter, the dance halls, and in summer, the amusement parks, and all the year-long theaters and drinking resorts of all kinds, are very dangerous for young girls. At one time, the superintendent of the Illinois Training School for Girls at Geneva found that 87% of her girls attributed their first wrong steps to temptations such as these. Every good man and woman must do his or her whole duty against the hideous traffic in girlhood. Preachers, editors, teachers, physicians, and rulers, being natural leaders of the people, have very great responsibility. But all else will follow if this end be gained. Parental Efficiency we close this chapter with the splendid editorial of Forrest Chrissy in Woman's World for August 1909. Summer, the Silly Season
Did you ever notice that, as the heat of midsummer opens up the pores, the youthful human seems to become exposed to curious and violent attacks of sentimentality? It's a fact. All the world recognizes that the summer girl is especially a prey to this insidious complaint, that no matter how modest, reserved, and circumspect she may be as a winter girl, when she breaks her summer chrysalis, all the butterfly nature within her is given wing, inward and outward restraints drop from her almost as inevitably as her cold-weather clothing, and she lets herself dance along on the soft breeze of sentiment with the lightness and freedom of a bit of thistledown. This odd summer bewitchment might be immensely funny, were it not for the fact that its consequences, in thousands of cases, are serious, not to say tragic. The comic papers depend upon this dog-day epidemic of silliness as an unfailing source of excruciatingly amusing jokes and pictures. Summer resort and seashore flirtations. What would the comics do without them when the mercury creeps high in the slender tube of the thermometer? In the language of the sportsman, the summer is everywhere recognized as the open season for the hunting of hearts and the pursuit of romance. The girl, who is her own chaperone and protector, allows herself a latitude of unconventionally in the period of summer outings, of vacations and excursions, of moonshine and frolic, which she would not think of permitting herself at another season. Romance is in the air, and even the careful and well-reared girl finds herself under its spell. What is the result? Thousands of half-baked romances, ending in Gretna Green marriages, are the invariable harvest of this season of summer silliness. Marriages which bring suffering and bitter repentance and a tragic climax in the divorce courts, if they do not come to a worse ending. Wherever the prow of an excursion boat pushes its way through the waters, wherever crowds of young people mingle in the pursuit of pleasure, there are hatched the romances which spell heartbreak and unhappiness. Every summer furnishes thousands upon thousands of these cases. They are down in the books, one entry in the books at the Gretna Green, the runaway marriage headquarters, and the other in the divorce courts. But there is another and a darker side to this matter of summer silliness. Not long ago, in the woman's world, Mrs. Ophelia L. Amig, superintendent of the Illinois State Training School for Girls at Geneva, Illinois, warned our readers that the runaway marriage is a favorite trick of the white slaver. Mrs. Amig knows what she is talking about when she says this. The white slaver haunts the excursion boat, makes love to the girl whose head is turned with silly notions about romantic courtships and marriages. He takes her to a justice of the peace, or a marrying parson of the excursion resort type, and a ceremony is performed. Then they go to the big city, and she is sold into a slavery worse than death. This sounds sensational but it has happened so many times that it is a tame and threadbare tale to those who know the dark things of metropolitan life, the black and ugly secrets of the underworld. Mothers should wake up to the fact that, of all times, daughters most need their strongest warnings and their most devoted care during the season of summer silliness, of vacations and excursions, of unconventional meetings with young men under the easy familiarity of fun and frolic, and a general good time. Hand to the girl who has no mother at hand, thus to warn her. Take it from us, that as your own chaperone, you must recognize the silly season as your period of special peril, as the time when it is insidiously easy to relax your vigilance, to let down the protecting bars of strict social conventionality, and to give yourself a little latitude in the matter of harmless flirtation. The only safe way is to be just a little more particular about the acquaintances you form during the silly season than at any other time. End of chapter 19 Read by Nancy Cochran Gergen, Gilbert, Arizona January 27, 2023all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ted Leinhart. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade 
by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 20, Chicago's White Slave Market, The Levy, by Ernest A. Bell. It is no pleasure to me to impeach my city, but it is false patriotism to allow the crimes of one's own country to go without rebuke. We are responsible for the evil that we have power to abolish. It is the duty of a patriotic preacher to lash the sins of his people till they are lashed out of existence. One afternoon last summer, Captain Wood of the 22nd Street Police Station, who has always taken splendid care of our missionaries, told me that Jesus did not try to destroy the levy in Jerusalem, but forgave the repentant woman who washed his feet with her tears. That evening, a Jew who was born and brought up in Jerusalem came to help us in our street meeting. I asked him publicly if there is any levy, that is, a vice district, in Jerusalem. He said that the Arabs would not tolerate one such house of shame, but would burn it down before morning. Mr. Archibald Forder, for 17 years a pioneer missionary in the interior of Arabia, says that among the Arabs this vice is unknown, and a great big unknown it is. Reverend Dr. Spencer Lewis, for many years a missionary in China, said when he preached with us in Midnight Chicago that even heathen China, which is very impure, does not obtrude vice as does Chicago. In New York City, Mayor Lowe broke up the tenderloin some years ago, and though vice is shamefully abundant and flagrant in that metropolis, the city government no longer gives the white slave traders a practical license to commit their crimes by setting apart a portion of the city where they may operate with impunity. In Philadelphia, when three of us conferred with Mr. Gaboni, Secretary of the Law and Order Society, concerning a proposed exploration of a questionable district, one of the questions immediately raised was how we might gain our liberty if arrested in a raid on an immoral resort which we might be investigating. This was a vital and serious question in Philadelphia. There, vice is a thousand times too abundant, but it is contemptible, suspicious, secluded, and afraid. In Chicago, our politicians have set apart several districts for the traffickers and slaves. The traders and girls are public, bold, defiant, They feel clean, almost virtuous, after the city hall and a deluded preacher or two have given them an immunity bath, provided only the fiction of segregation is preserved. Mayor a Coward Mr. Gaboni called the former mayor of Philadelphia a coward because the mayor expressed his desire to segregate vicious resorts, but not in his own neighborhood, but among the poor and helpless. Let the advocates of segregation in Chicago propose to put these resorts on Michigan Avenue and Prairie Avenue, where certain advocates of this shameful policy live, or in the vicinity of Mayor Buss's residence, then we can at least believe in their sincerity and manliness. But as it is, they curse the children of the poor by protecting these resorts in districts where the poor must live. Former State's Attorney Healy asked former Mayor Dunn why the Italian, Jewish, and Negro children near 22nd Street have not the same right to a decent environment as Mayor Dunn's own children in Edgewater. Why have not the little children on Archer Avenue the same right to grow up in a decent neighborhood that the little girl has who puts her arms around Mayor Buss's neck and calls him Uncle Fred? A Frightened Girl I have seen with my own eyes a young girl under 17 years of age, a member of Emmanuel Baptist Church, running like a frightened gazelle to her home near 22nd Street to avoid insult on the public streets from the thousands of young men who were encouraged to throng that district for immoral purposes. She ran to her home for this reason for three or four years. I lifted my hat in reverence to such a girl. But, oh, how I felt the shame of the city and of the churches near her home that permitted conditions that put a good girl to tests like this. 
I afterward talked face to face with her mother. Graft inevitable. Segregation is practiced, colonizes and fosters vice, maintains a white slave market under executive protection, and provides an overwhelming temptation and facility for graft. Bribeless government cannot exist for any considerable time where these facilities for corruption are so assiduously maintained. It is not in politicians or anybody else to resist temptation when the temptation itself is protected and cherished. Nothing is said by our officials or by the high priests of segregation about corralling immoral men into segregation districts. It is therefore not segregation of vice, but only an attempted or pretended and never a complete or successful cornering of depraved women. There are wide open resorts on more than 20 streets outside of the big levee. Segregation as practiced is not a restriction of vice so much as it is a practical license to lawbreakers to wreck human lives and blight the homes of the people by corrupting husbands and sons and taking captive wives and daughters. You would be astounded to learn how many ruined women are wives who have been allured to sin a maelstrom for young men. Into the red light districts, so long as they remain, men and youths from the whole city and the whole world are irresistibly drawn, if only by curiosity. The levee, blazing with electric lights and floating in liquor, is regarded by thousands of visitors as one of the chief sights of Chicago. When the Shriners, a Masonic order, held a convention here, their red fezes and Arabian symbols were seen by hundreds in the levee towards midnight. Not all, perhaps not very many of them, were there for a vile purpose. They were simply inspecting one of Chicago's pet institutions, not the cattle market at the stockyards, but the white slave market in the levee. Cattlemen from Texas and Montana come with their carloads of cattle to Chicago, and having disposed of their stock, and received their money, many of these men hurry to the levee, of whose attractions they have heard a thousand miles away. Thus the immorality and diseases of the levee are spread over the land. So far from being an efficient restriction of vice, a red light district is the greatest advertisement the horrible trade can have, and is just what it desires. Every dive keeper and madam in Chicago and every other city delights in segregation as practiced by our rulers, who have sworn to the Almighty and contracted with the people to enforce the laws and draw their salaries upon this contract and this oath. Give us a district to ourselves, say all the dives with one mind, and our obliging executives forthwith bow down to them and do as they say giving these detestable criminals permission to trample the laws in the sewers. To hell with the laws, some of the dive keepers have said to our missionaries. Why not give murderers, thugs, thieves, gamblers, forgers a district where they may break the laws after an immunity bath at City Hall, as well as to the filthy offenders who promote even the crimes of Sodom and Gomorrah and invite upon Chicago the doom of those cities of the plain. A dive keeper recently paid his first fine in 20 years. For 20 years this man had carried on his murderous trade without ever being made to feel even once that he is a criminal. What astounding privilege in a city where many men have been arrested and fined for spitting on the sidewalk. The French and Japanese importers of women have been amazingly exempt from punishment at the hands of our local authorities. The federal government has done its duty, as all the world knows. The work of Mr. Sims and his assistants at Chicago is affecting the whole nation and Canada for good. But why are the wild beasts who trade in girls immune from punishment at the hands of our city and state authorities? We ought to say, and do say very heartily, that our authorities in Chicago are beginning to listen to the cry of the white slaves, native and foreign. Something has been done to punish procurers and such-like reptilia 
who do not count in politics, but the dive keepers, the buyers and holders of women have not been seriously disturbed except by the national government. Segregation makes a slave market. It is impossible to abolish brothel slavery and to license, either formally or practically, the slave market, the red light district, while the dive keeper enjoys the indulgence of the mayor and the police and of their masters, the citizens, he will keep his dive, and his dive must be restocked with new victims to make money for him all the time. These victims will be obtained, as heretofore, by procurers who travel city and country to trap them, and they will be imported from Europe and Asia, as heretofore. To maintain a segregation district is to maintain a slave market, as things are. Unless we make energetic and successful war upon the red light districts and all that pertains to them, we shall have oriental brothel slavery thrust upon us from China and Japan, and Parisian white slavery, with all its unnatural and abominable practices, established among us by the French traders. Jew traders, too, will people our levies with Polish Jewesses and any others who will make money for them. Shall we defend our American civilization or lower our flag to the most despicable foreigners, French, Irish, Italians, Jews, and Mongolians? We do not speak against them for their nationality, but for their crimes. American traders of equal infamy, to the shame of the American name, have stocked Asiatic cities with American girls. On the Pacific coast, Eternal vigilance alone can save us from a flood of Asiaticism with its weak womanhood, its men of scant chivalry, its polluting vices, and its brothel slavery. Bubonic plague in San Francisco and Seattle was alarming. Mongolian brothel slavery, the black death in morals, is more alarming. On both coasts and throughout all our cities, only an awakening of the whole Christian conscience and intelligence can save us from the importation of Parisian and Polish pollution, which is already corrupting the manhood and youth of every large city in this nation. Money and vice. There is money and vice so long as the public conscience sleeps and officials are chloroformed with bribes or otherwise persuaded to make it easy for lawbreakers Frenchmen, Japanese, and Jews know what a good, rich market America is, and they are exploiting it with enterprise. They will continue to do so more and more if pulpit and press are ignorant or cowardly, and sworn officers of the law make void the law. Both native and foreign exploiters of vice immediately improve the facilities afforded by every wicked or deluded executive who proclaims a segregation district, these shrewd, diabolical men quickly stock the red light districts with their victims. The traders are organized, capitalized, ready to pay for their privileges to trample on our statute books, our flag, our Bibles, our homes. Worse than Paris. All Europe, except Turkey, is organized against the traffic in womanhood. Many criminals of this sort have been driven out of Paris, only to find a cordial welcome in the open arms of our deluded, if not debauched, officials who provide for them segregation districts in this and other American cities. Thus, our American cities become dumps for the outcast filth of Paris. In our levy at 22nd Street, 14 resorts had Paris or Parisian as part of their signs until Chief Shippey ordered the signs removed six months ago. Numerous other resorts have French managers and French inmates. Patriotic Americans would do well to reflect upon Sedan and the French lilies that withered there after trainloads of women had rolled out of Paris to the French camp while the Germans sang, A mighty fortress is our God and the watch on the Rhine. We remember Lafayette and French service for American liberty but from organized, capitalized, cunning, brazen Parisian licentiousness in addition to that of Native Americans, good Lord deliver us. About a score of resorts in the same levy, all of them extremely flagrant, 
are managed by Jews. Two or three places are managed by Italian men, though there are few Italian prostitutes in Chicago. One resort is controlled and occupied by Japanese, four American men, and several places contain American girls for Chinese men. I know of no resorts controlled by English, Scotch, German, or Scandinavian men. In one respect, our American red light districts are worse than Paris. In Paris, if Dr. Sanger is right in his standard work, A History of Prostitution, men are not permitted to manage the resorts. The unspeakable dive keeper, why do the American people tolerate such a viper as this? Courts are unstained. The laws in the courts are uniformly against vice and against the men who exploit vice for a lazy living or despicable gain. The Supreme Court of California is representative of all courts when it said in the case of Pond against Whitman in July 1905, quote, under the penal code of this state, keeping or knowingly letting any tenement for the purposes of prostitution keeping a house of ill fame resorted to for the purposes of prostitution or lewdness, or residing therein, are criminal offenses, and every person who lives in or about such houses and any common prostitute is a vagrant. Penal Code, Sections 315, 316, 647. Ordinance Number 1587 of the Board of Supervisors of the City and County of San Francisco also makes it a public offense to maintain such houses or become an inmate thereof or visitor thereto or in any manner contribute to their support. These laws have for their object the prohibition and suppression of prostitution, and that duty devolves within the city and county of San Francisco upon its police department. These houses are common or public nuisances, Their maintenance directly tends to corrupt and debase public morals, to promote vice, and to encourage dissolute and idle habits, and the suppression of nuisances of this character and having this tendency is one of the important duties of government. The suppression of such houses, as evidenced by the stringent laws concerning them, is a public policy of the state. End quote. California reports, Volume 147, page 292. California and New York have splendid modern laws against white slavery and the traffic in women in its various forms. Nine states have enacted new laws against these evils this year. We rejoice in these laws, but they will never fully accomplish their purpose while the executive officers of our cities illegally make void the law by proclaiming or recognizing red light districts where traders are illegally exempted from the laws and their penalties. Since the laws are good and the courts everywhere faithful, for the most part, to the laws, why are the executive officers of our cities so far from fulfilling the purposes of the laws as interpreted by the courts? Many of our officials clearly, from their conduct, consider it, quote, one of the important duties of government, end quote, not to suppress, but to protect, favor, and encourage these hideous haunts of vice and crime. Why? Tons of graft. Doubtless tons of graft have been taken from the red light districts, and doubtless more tons will be taken by perjurers and traitors in public office. No one knows this better than honest officials. For there are many such, men who keep their oath of office and conscientiously guard the great public interests of which they are trustees and not traitors. But the evil lies deeper than corrupt officials and cannot be eradicated by the most faithful officials only, even if all were such. Under our form of government, officials are the people's agents and must do what their masters, the sovereign people, require them to do. The responsibility is therefore the people's. Why do the sovereign people of our American cities love to have it so? Why do they approve the red light districts, the white slave market, the traffic in women and girls, or disapprove too mildly to abolish them? The Lie in the People's Minds Lecky, the historian of European morals, 
lent his great name to a great delusion when he attempted in a passage too well known to garland the prostitute as the protectress of pure women. Edwin Arnold, the paganizing English poet, put Lecky's folly into verse, writing a sonnet in praise of the harlot as the purest of all women, a sort of devil's compliment to our wives and mothers. This immoral and repulsive idea has a considerable place among educated men and among the plain people. I was grieved to hear a physician quote Lecky's false and immoral statement before the Physicians Club of Chicago. The managing editor of one of our decent and moral morning papers quoted Lecky in a short talk I had with him. When the educated and moral are so deceived, what can we expect of the ignorant and immoral? The devil's dogma that prostitution is a protection to virtue is thrust upon us continually by the vilest men and women and by those who create, promote, and exploit vice. This creed is assiduously preached by dive keepers and madams throughout the world. Thereby they have their wealth, for thereby honest people are deceived into tolerating these enemies of the human race, destroyers of youths and maidens, of innocent wives and guilty husbands, of cities, civilizations, and nations. Sin is not a blessing. The prostitute will be a blessing to good women when Satan is actually transformed into a holy angel, but not till then, while the hideous caricature of womanhood is responsible by her diseases for one-fourth or more of the surgical operations upon innocent wives, operations made necessary by disease which their husbands bought of the prostitute, perhaps years before marriage, we cannot regard her and her criminal male partners as anything less than the red-handed slayers of good women. While the eye doctors attribute one-fourth of blindness, particularly of helpless babies, to the same source, we cannot quote except to condemn this sophistry that makes the worse appear the better cause and garlands the woman whose pursuit is death itself, suicide and murder in one. While this perverted or enslaved creature that Lecky and Arnold would glorify drives herself and her criminal patrons to suffer locomotor ataxia, necrosis of bone and brain, or incurable insanity at public expense in our asylums, we will give her no garland except apple blossoms of the apples of Sodom. Good women are not protected by bad nor do hundreds of brothels illegally legalized in a city protect virtuous women, maidens, and little girls from bestial assault. On the contrary, good women are a thousand times safer where no such hells exist to manufacture degenerates. The men who consort with vile women lose their respect for all women and by their base fellowship inflame infernal fires which are the utmost menace to all good women. We have had in Chicago numerous recent illustrations of the way in which police protected houses of infamy save good women and girls. A few weeks before the murder of Mrs. Gentry, Constantine applied at the rooming agency of the Young Men's Christian Association for a room. The secretary marked on his application sporty and did not send him to any good woman's home to room but to a lodging house of men only. By some means, he came to room at the gentry home and repaid hospitality by murdering his hostess. The sporty man, associating with harlots, loses his respect for good women and may murder them if they resist his wicked will. In September, one block from our outrageous levee where 1,050 ruined women are constantly at the service of ten thousands of vile men, one block from these protectresses of good women and young girls, more than a thousand protectresses. A 13-year-old girl was lured to a room and brutally assaulted. The police officer, Lieutenant White, who arrested the criminal and was himself roughly handled in the discharge of his duty, confirmed this report when I inquired of him face to face. Captain McCann told me he arrested a dive keeper for assaulting his own stepdaughter. 
Do the dives protect women and girls from crimes like these? Do they not rather manufacture the degenerates who commit these crimes? Worst Enemies of the Human Race Harlots and their patrons are the worst enemies in every way that good women can have. If there were any virtue and vice, if black were white or even speckled, doubtless the supreme book of morals, the guide of the race, would have some word in praise of moral rottenness, some few lines in prose or verse in laudation of lewd women. But the whole Bible keeps the distinction sharp and clear between black and white, between virtue and sin. Until the public intelligence and conscience are trained to abhor vice as a destroyer of families and nations, more insidious and more ruinous than even the liquor traffic, a soft, foolish, wicked indulgence will be granted to the red light districts and the white slave markets which they constitute and are. We must call most urgently upon all guides and rulers of the people to make incessant war upon the loathsome criminals who prey upon young women and young men. They are the worst enemies of the human race. They drink the heart's blood of mothers and eat the flesh of their daughters. They people hospitals, almshouses, lunatic asylums, and dissecting rooms. They blast innocent wives and blind helpless babies. They enslave by force, threats, or craft thousands of weak women and innocent young girls. Their horrible flesh market and slave pen is the Red Lake District, where they are illegally exempted from the criminal prosecutions that their crimes deserve. This favor to criminals is itself criminal. The men who have lifted up their hands to God upon taking the oath of office have an appalling responsibility when they exempt the most odious criminals from the laws which they are sworn and paid to enforce. The sovereign people who indulge these officials in their palpable neglect of duty and malfeasance in office have a fearful accountability. Property owners and their agents, who rent buildings for immoral use, are perhaps guiltiest of all, having no motive but greed. In Los Angeles, the aroused citizens put the Italian millionaire who owned the crib district and was exploiting girls therein on the chain gang and abolished the crib district. On the other hand, in Chicago, we have seen property of Yale University become the vilest of dives to the grief of President Hadley and the shame of his agents in this city. The old Roman senator, who believed that Rome and Carthage could not both be great, kept crying, Delenda est Carthago, until Carthage was blotted out. So let us keep crying, the levy must go, until the police-protected white slave market is destroyed. Above all, in our struggle against this most infamous slavery, let us never forget the very early flag of the revolution, the pine tree flag now preserved in Independence Hall, with its deathless motto, We Appeal to God, E.A.B. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21 of Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Fighting the Traffic in Young Girls or War on the White Slave Trade by Ernest A. Bell. Chapter 21 The Failure and Shame of the Regulation of Vice. When the law fails to regulate sin and not to take it utterly away, it necessarily confirms and establishes sin. John Milton. The law ought to make virtue easy and vice difficult. William E. Gladstone. They enslave their children's children who make compromise with sin. James Russell Lowell. The Young Man's View. A ruined young man in one of Chicago's segregated districts for advertising and encouraging vice asked this question as they stood on the curbstone in one of our midnight gospel meetings. If the wise men who are set up over us to rule us want it this way, what can you expect of us? Such is the inevitable reasoning of young men. They commonly believe that the city licenses the criminal resorts, which its police protect, 
and they are not conscious of bad citizenship in supporting resorts which are in such favor with the city government. Long ago, Archdeacon Paley wrote in his moral philosophy, the avowed toleration, and in some countries, the licensing, taxing, and regulation of public brothels, has appeared to the people an authorizing of fornication. The legislators ought to have foreseen this effect. Lawgivers are inexorable. The greatest of lawgivers, Moses, made no compromise with vice. He is inexorable. There shall not be a harlot of the daughters of Israel. The daughter of a priest who profaned herself was to be burnt to death. The Old Testament is hot with warnings against patronizing strange women, that is, foreign prostitutes who had invaded the Holy Land, like the imported white slaves of the French traders here today. Manu, the ancient lawgiver of India, provided that the adulterer should be burnt to death on an iron bed and the adulteress devoured by dogs in a public place. Buddha speaks with loathing of immoral conduct. The Son of God, that his mercy towards repentant women who washed his feet with their tears might not be taken as softness towards sin, came back from heaven to say in the book of Revelation that he will cast into great tribulation and kill with death wanton women and the men who visit them. Of these iniquities, the compassionate Redeemer says, which things I also hate. Rulers cannot claim any consent or condonement of their regulation of vice from the head of all human government, the King of Kings, to whom they must answer for their rule or misrule. Fallen governments and a fallen church. So scandalously far can a fallen government and a fallen church depart from the head of the church and the head of human government that we have seen kings, even the pious king of France, St. Louis, giving a royal permit to harlots, and the mayor of London, William Walworth, in 1381, managing the brothels at Southwark for the Bishop of Winchester, who owned, licensed, and regulated those abominable places. The Reformation Party prevailed upon Henry VIII, in the thirty-seventh year of his reign, to end this infamy, and this row of stews in Southwark was put down by the king's commandment, which was proclaimed by sound of trumpet. Thus, as Dr. Fuller wrote, this regiment of sinners was totally and finally routed, a warning to other vice districts, and an example of how to deal with them. From that date, 1545 to 1864, England gave no official endorsement to vice. Then a wicked government, after calling the medical head of the system of regulation in Paris to visit London, and getting the Parisian chief of police to write a book for their information, thrust upon the unsuspecting English nation the odious French system of legalized vice, restricting its application at first to certain garrison towns, but cunningly extending it to the whole country, the crown colonies, and Canada and India. After a heroic crusade of twenty-two years, led by Mrs. Josephine Butler, the aroused conscience of Great Britain compelled Parliament, in 1886, to repeal the Loathsome Contagious Diseases Act. Illinois rejects the Parisian system. The statutes of Illinois show that in the year 1874, certain city officials in the state were about to license houses of ill fame and to provide for enforced medical inspection of their inmates, according to the detestable methods established a century ago in Paris a system which made the blood of Frances Willard turn to flame when she saw its workings in Paris and made her resolve that American womanhood should never be subjected to it. The outrageous French system of giving legal standing to vice and attempting to assure men that they can violate the moral law and escape the physical penalty is utterly repugnant to the Anglo-Saxon conscience. As President Roosevelt cabled to the Philippines, when he was urged to take measures for reducing disease in the army. The way to reduce the disease is to reduce the vice. Lord Herbert, when Minister of War, by improving the habits of the men, reduced the disease of the British Army 40% in six years, 1860-1866. Under Lord Kitchener's command, in India today, every soldier finds a tract in his knapsack telling him plainly the consequences of vice and urging him to lead a manly and honorable life. The tract was prepared jointly by Lord Kitchener and the Bishop of Lahore. 
the attempt to license infamy in cities of illinois was thwarted by an emergency act approved and enforced march twenty seventh eighteen seventy four see revised statutes chapter twenty four section two forty five page three fifty two article five of the cities and villages act provides in section sixty two item forty five that the city council shall have power not to regulate but to suppress houses of ill-fame within the limits of the city and within three miles of the outer boundaries of the city page three hundred and eighteen it is not by authority of the people of illinois that segregated districts are proclaimed whereby a white slave market is established and the most loathsome criminals of the world are invited to make commerce of american and alien girls an unpardonable sin plato taught us that the unpardonable sin is to betray a great public trust what public trust is so great as the health and morals of the people the old roman law had at its foundation this motto the safety of the people is the supreme law the supreme court of the united states has declared more than once no legislature can bargain away the public health or the public morals the people themselves cannot do it much less their servants stone v mississippi one o one u s rep eight fourteen eight nineteen a great lawyer has written even if the legislature does attempt to give sanction and confer its authority upon any enterprise which is immoral in its nature or which results in immorality then the governor and the judge have each an oath registered in heaven to declare such legislation void. Moral Law and Civil Law, page 90. Supreme Courts are unstained. It is the settled doctrine of the highest courts, as voiced by the Supreme Court of California in the case of Pond v. Whitman in July 1905, that these houses are common or public nuisances. Their maintenance directly tends to corrupt and debase public morals to promote vice and to encourage dissolute and idle habits and the suppression of nuisances of this character and having this tendency is one of the important duties of government but notwithstanding the unequivocal declarations of supreme courts there are nearly always politicians whose political creed is learned from the white slave trader and the serpentine woman who keeps the glittering vestibule of hell such a mother of harlots clothed in silks and decked in diamonds, can state the argument for regulation much more logically and eloquently than any policeman, politician, or rare misguided preacher, lineally descended from the Bishop of Winchester aforementioned, can state it for her benefit and profit. Let us be careful that we be not numbered among those of whom it is written, there were false prophets among the people. The white slave traders and all who willfully or ignorantly aid and abet their abominable commerce in girls are ardent advocates of segregation or some form of regulation whereby they obtain a police status which enables them to exploit the helpless and foolish and ignorant and vicious to dispense alike to guilty men and innocent wives and babies blindness insanity locomotor ataxia abscesses tumors surgical operations and coffins to protect these loathsome resorts is like maintaining a thousand pest houses not for purposes of quarantine but with the sole result of advertising and spreading the pestilence the shame of brussels india and hong kong in brussels where regulation was held to be perfect and a model for other countries english girls were found enslaved and the chief of police resigned after being exposed as a partner with the white slave traders in india regulation went the abhorrent length that an army circular memorandum under authority of sir frederick afterwards lord roberts made the army itself a procurer of prostitutes saying it is necessary to have a sufficient number of women to take care that they are sufficiently attractive and to provide them with proper houses free quarters when Dr. Kate Bushnell and Mrs. Andrew, two American ladies, exposed the frightful conditions existing by authority in India, Lord Roberts at first said that they spoke falsely, but afterwards said, when convicted of the truth, I apologize to the ladies without reserve. In Hong Kong, 
under regulation government money was used by detectives to induce women to sin with them in order to enroll them as public women in india and hong kong alike under the reign of queen victoria of happy memory these registered women were called queen's women under such shameful misrule hong kong became the base for the shipment of chinese slave girls to california by which mongolian brothel slavery was introduced into america a horror worse than the bubonic plague blameless girls ensnared in chicago in this first ward of chicago said to be the most influential and richest ward in the world are nearly two miles of indecent resorts since a district in this ward was thrown open to this most diabolical commerce blameless chicago virgins have been lured to apartments on wabash avenue under the shadow of churches of cathedral importance and then sold into the adjacent white slave market the illegal red light district this was shown in court at harrison street before judge newcomer june one nineteen o seven intoxicating liquor has been sold illegally without a license in hundreds perhaps thousands of resorts in the city against the protest of the chicago law and order league repeatedly addressed to the mayor surely this will not be allowed to continue the virtual payment of a bounty of a thousand dollars a year the price of a saloon license to the keeper of an indecent resort surely the first ward debauch in the coliseum will never be allowed again repeal of regulation now demanded in europe the international bureau for the suppression of the white slave traffic representing every country in europe except turkey has recently written we are anxious to call the attention of our readers to the fact that when we started the work for the suppression of the white slave traffic we maintained that apart altogether from that direct work the respective governments would have their attention drawn to the importance of the question of the repeal of the system of regulation of vice our anticipations are being fully realized in different countries where the national committees are declaring by vote that the white slave traffic is promoted and kept alive by the government regulation of vice and are calling upon their respective governments to abolish this system twenty third annual report of the national vigilance association london page seventeen the only righteous attitude of government toward all crime and vice is eternal antagonism the government should educate the people concerning the frightful effects of vice and never encourage these ruinous practices the responsibility of government in this connection are nothing less than awful position of the clergy the editor of a great chicago daily said to me concerning the readiness of many people to segregate and regulate vice the clergy won't stand for it mr huxley shortly before his death addressing a company of clergymen said that men of science in their search for the truth may find themselves obliged to return to the guardians of divine revelation the ministers of god and that if they did so return he hoped that the clergy would not have betrayed the gates james russell lowell has told us truly that compromise in a matter of fundamental morals that is slavery cost us the civil war in matters of eternal truth and in matters of fundamental morals we must not we will not compromise we will never betray the gates end of chapter twenty one read by nancy cochran gergen gilbert arizona february one two thousand twenty three